morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the beautiful Egmont Palace this morning to the second edition of the European Defence and Security Conference. A warm welcome to all of you here physically with us and to the Minister, and a warm welcome to all of you joining online. My name is Maeve McMahon, I'm a journalist with Euronews based here in Brussels, and I'm delighted to be with you here this morning for this timely conversation about Europe's path to better defend itself. Throughout the day, we'll be hearing from a number of ministers for defence and foreign affairs. We'll have input for a number of members of the European Parliament. We'll also be hearing from representatives from the EU institutions and, of course, from industry. We also want to hear from you, so you'll, of course, be allowed to address your questions using Slido or using social media. The same for our viewers online throughout the day. To get in touch by using Slido, you can just pop the event code into the Slido application, choosing the room corresponding to the session. And to get in there, the event code is eDefense Security Conf. And that is also, ladies and gentlemen, the hashtag. So if you are using social media throughout the day, do use that hashtag. And as I said, this afternoon, we'll be hearing from a number of various speakers. We'll have the Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Preton. But now I would like to invite Joëlle van der Rauwe. She's the managing partner of Business Bridge Europe and, of course, the organizer of this event. The floor is yours. So, thank you, Maeve. Good morning to all of you. I'm really happy to welcome you to the second edition of the European Security and Defense Conference. Thank you for being with us on site and online. So, I have the honor of having beside me the Belgian Minister of Defense, Ludivine de Donder. Good morning. And also Mr. Profumo, the President of the European Aeronautics, Space, Defense and Security uh, Industry. Good morning, Mr. Profumo. Mr. Profumo is also the CEO of Leonardo. Thank you for being with us. The High Representative of the Union External uh, Services, Joseph Borrell, one of the pillars uh, of the organization of these conferences, does us the honor of opening the conference by video message, as he is not in Brussels today, he is outside uh, Belgium. The Commissioner Breton, in charge of the European Industrial Defence uh, Policy, another key, of course, player in our conference today, is retained this morning by the trilogue uh, discussion in the European uh, Parliament, but he will, of course, join us later for a special address at the opening of the afternoon debate at 2.30. Normally, this second edition of the conference was indeed intended to make a state of play of the European Union defense policy and its perspectives. Obviously, the dramatic geopolitical context gives this conference a whole new dimension to our debate. Madame la Ministre, Mr. Profumo, ladies and gentlemen, made I suggest that we listen together now to Mr. Borrell's special address. Thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, on the 24th of February, our world has changed. Our world has changed fundamentally, and our perspective has shifted dramatically. The Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has also reminded us the urgent need to strengthen our cooperation in the field of security and defense. Looking at the title of this opening session, New Threats and War Europe, directions, lessons, and updated judges for European defense and security. This title says everything. So let me briefly unpack these three main elements. First, directions. In March 22, the European Union adopted the Strategic Compass, which is an important milestone for the Union's security and defense policy which provides us with a strategic direction for the next five to ten years. And it will have to be updated because the next five years will be completely different of the years we could have foreseen when we wrote the strategy. It sets out clear goals to increase our capacity to act, to boost our resilience, to deepen our partnership and to invest more in defense. And again, the backdrop of the war our most pressing challenge now is to replenish and restock defense equipment to continue supporting Ukraine, 
to fill critical capability gaps and boost our defense technological and industrial base. And to be successful and efficient, we need to do this together as Europeans. Second, lessons. We must draw lessons from recent crises, from COVID-19, Afghanistan, who remembers Afghanistan, Ukraine. What we have learned is that our unity and solidarity are our best assets, but they are not enough. These are the basis for action, but the action has to come. The global consequences of Russia's war in Ukraine, food security, energy prices, are a case in point. But we need also to learn from our mistakes and adjust our approaches and tools to the evolving reality. And third choices. In the last month, we made many choices that were unimaginable for a long time. Our member states have clearly chosen to pursue a stronger European Union defense. They have chosen more action, solidarity, more defense investment. They have chosen to offer unprecedented support to Ukraine, including through the European Peace Facility, which for the first time has mobilized an important amount of money to arm a country at war. And I think we need to continue on this path. In that sense, I would add a fourth element. I've been calling for it before. Action. Action. In the last year, we have made many statements and taken many commitments to strengthen European Union defense. Now it's time to continue to move from words to deeds. It's time to act. With our values and our security at stake, European defense cooperation is uh, something nice to have. It's not a luxury. It's a must. It's a key to survival. That's what it is. Thank you for your attention. And thank you so much to the High Representative Dr. Joseph Borre with a very loud and clear call for action there, stressing the fact that European defence cooperation is a must. It is the key to survival. And thank you, Joelle, for your opening remarks as well and for introducing our panel this morning. We're joined, of course, by Madame de Donder, the Belgian Minister of Defence. So after this strong political introduction, I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all. I'm delighted to participate in this second European Security and Defence Conference. It is an honour and a privilege to be able to deliver the opening address of this event. This is certainly a very timely and useful discussion, and I would like to thank the organisers of Business Bridge Europe for making this gathering possible. It is also an opportunity to underline the key role of Belgian defence in the European security and defence ecosystem and how European cooperation is a win-win situation. Our world and our societies are currently facing fundamental challenges. Our rules-based international order is under threat, as illustrated, by the flagrant violation of that order by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. In addition, climate change and the energy transition will test the resilience of our societies as never before. All of this reminds us how much we, Europeans, must work for a Europe of defense and a strong European strategic autonomy. In reaction to this complex and uncertain security environment, the Belgian defense response has been swift. We will significantly increase our budget in the coming years. On the one hand, before the war in uh, Ukraine, I was able to obtain a historical growth trajectory that should reach 1.54% of GDP in 2030. 
This increase is related to the government agreement of 2020, in which Belgium committed itself to continue and strengthen its commitment to an effective European defence, in order to contribute to a real European strategy and autonomy, and to strengthen the European pillar within NATO, which remains the cornerstone of Europe's collective defence. On the other hand, this budgetary tra trajectory was further strengthened after the Russian invasion. The budget will indeed continue to grow with the intention of reaching 2% of GDP in 2035. But not only that, for the period 2022-2024, an additional budget of 1 billion euros has been approved to improve the military's readiness and to fill several equipment and capability gaps. By revising its budgetary trajectory, Belgium is also demonstrating that it is fully committed to the current European agreements and that, is, that it is ready to take a step forward towards a genuine European defence. The Versailles Declaration and the Strategic Compass are the best examples. We have committed ourselves to a substantial increase in defence spending, to a significant share of investment, to a focus on strategic shortfalls, and to the collaborative development of defence capabilities within the European Union. Furthermore, Belgium has proven that it is ready to play its role as a reliable partner and to defend multilateralism within the European institutions. The highest common denominator must always prevail over the individual interests of states. Belgium will not fail to recall and implement this during its presidency of the EU in 2024. More concretely, the increase in the defence budget will allow, on the one hand, greater European integration and less fragmentation, and, on the other hand, to strengthen European military capabilities in the medium term by focusing on the major capability shortfalls in five strategic areas of the EU member states' defence. Air capability, land capability, maritime security, space and cyber security. In this respect, Belgium is sparing no effort. Through an updated military programming law, new investment in military capabilities amounts to 10.2 billion euros. Here are some elements. Development of an entirely new cyber component, which is an important step in order to be able to face the current hybrid threats. I am pleased to announce in that way the inauguration of a cyber command within Belgium defence on the 19th of October. Naval cooperation with the Netherlands, cooperation with France in the field of land forces in the framework of the motorised capability programme. A400M Binational Air Transport Unit, Belgium, Luxembourg. In addition, within the European Union, various development programmes are being prepared and supported, including maritime mine countermeasures systems, a future patrol aircraft, a new combat aircraft, and future armored vehicles. But as we often say, the important thing is not to spend more, but to spend better. To a greater European cooperation and integration, both in the capability and operational fields, the approach 
that we must follow and that I want to develop within defense is a proactive one. On the basis of a triple helix approach, defense, industry, academic world partnership, I want to make defense a real player in the field of innovation, research and development, especially in the development of future capabilities and in the investment of priority niches. All these projects that I have just listed offer opportunities for European and Belgium companies. This way of acting with European partners by purchasing and developing programs together will allow better interoperability between our different components and a high return on investment for the Belgium and European industrial sector. In its quest to intensify industrial and fi financial in incentives to invest in a strong European industrial base, the Belgium defense has equipped itself with a unique tool called the DIRS, Defense Industry and Research Strategy. This strategy, which is an integral part of the STAR plan, was recently approved by the Belgian government and officially presented on the 4th of October. It is a guideline for the development and support of the national scientific, technological and industrial potential in the field of security and defense. It defines the final objectives, principles, responsibilities, support vectors and instruments areas of intervention and related objectives. The DIRS indicates which areas of scientific and technological research and which industrial capabilities are relevant to national security. On the one hand, it is directly relevant from the point of view of the capabilities that will be acquired by the Belgian defense in the framework of the STAR plan, or that are linked to the proposed long-term technological priorities of defense. On the other hand, it also concerns the indirect relevance whereby the Belgian defense technological and industrial base can be a credible and reliable technological partner for the capabilities needed to achieve European strategic autonomy in the context of European capability gaps or participation in security and defense cooperation projects. Cooperation in the framework of PESCO EDF, EDA, and NATO is one of the most important pillars. Such an approach will allow defense to become a real economic engine for society by involving our Belgian companies more and choose more European partnerships. The objective is not only to buy capabilities off the shelf, but to include defense and our industrial network in an intelligent research and development strategy, which a maximum return on investment and by positioning ourselves as a real player in the labor market. In conclusion, let me point out that the objectives of the STAR plan and the military programming law are not fixed and will evolve in response to the volatility of the security environment, both internationally and domestically. Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war against Ukraine has created a clear shift in the security paradigm. That is why we have provided for the possibility of a structural update of the military programming law and our strategic vision. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Madame de Randerday, the Belgian Minister of Defence, on what is a very busy week for yourself. And you mentioned the strategic compass, you mentioned your hope for less fragmentation, and not to spend more, but spend better. There'll be points I'll be elaborating a little bit later when I have a sit-down about that strategic compass with representatives of the EU institutions and also with representatives of industry. So thank you so much for that. And now I'd like to bring in Mr. Profumo. You're, of course, the president of the Defence Industry Association. So after these opening political statements, I'd like to give you the floor and ask you how you think we can reinforce altogether our European defence industrial dimension. Thank you so much. <coughs> I greet all the guests and thank Minister De Donde, is correct, De Donde, yes. and uh, High Representative Borrell for their insightful words. Europe and the world after the Russian invasion of Ukraine are no longer what they were before. The partial Russia mobilization nuclear cyber rattling and scam referenda in occupied areas further aggravate the scenario with long-term security consequences. Today, I will address uh, three key points. The reason why our defense industrial policy must change, the current challenges facing the European aerospace and defense industry, and third, lastly, I, I will put forward a concrete proposal for the industry to shift gears and accelerate its transformation to address new European security demands. Touching the first point, in the last decades, the security needs of the European Union and its member states were mainly related to stabilization and peacekeeping mission abroad. Today, we are moving towards a different scenario in which we need to bolster our deterrence to prevent high-intensity peer-to-peer conflicts and in case have the capabilities and technological advantages to win it. We have to adapt it to this new reality. The armed forces are changing their strategic posture. The European Union is doing so with the strategic compass, and NATO did, this, did the same with its new strategic concept. Defense spending in Europe is increasing, albeit in an uncoordinated way. The industrial policy of member states and the European Union needs to adapt. The need to change <coughs> poses new challenges to the European aerospace and defense industry. We could say we find ourselves in a conundrum. On, one, on the one hand, we must meet urgent short-term capability needs. On the other hand, we have to prepare for the medium and long-term ones. All of our current defense system and platforms are and will be used more intensively. The, industri the industry will be required to make its products more readily available, restock and replace them at a faster rate. We will also need to provide more intense training, maintenance activities and spare supplies, as well as upgrades for those systems that are still relevant and not obsolete. At the same time, we must expand our research and development investment, mostly on emerging disruptive technologies to restore and maintain the competitive operational edge required by the armed forces. We, as industry representatives, are ready to do more and take on a larger role from the point of view of logistics and support so as to allow the armed forces to concentrate on their operational task. More tooth and less tail is no longer just a slogan, it is a necessity when mass is required and technological superiority is not enough. We must thus shift gear and move from an industry suited for peacetime to, to an industry fit for times of crisis and larger scale conflicts. In concrete, this means we need to recognize the aerospace and defense industry as a strategically important sector it is, and be ready to prioritize it in terms of access to raw materials, energy, and finance. We cannot afford any initiative being counterproductive towards the overarching goal of the defense industrial ramp-up that is now politically recognized and requested. This also means securing critical supply chain and energy infrastructure we might be target of attacks as we saw. We must develop a shared European approach to manage peak demand and develop new technologies. The defense industry does not work by warehouse. We work by orders. 
We need to stockpile and accelerate long lead items procurement in larger quantities. We need new production lines, active 24 <coughs> hours per day, seven days per week, if needed. Similarly, we need research personnel to work on new technologies. And this need to be sustained over the long term, not as an emergency short-term response. The greater the investment by member states, the greater the need to cooperate in order to avoid duplication and additional fragmentation. We must share the lesson learned from the conflict in Ukraine. Heavy tanks, artillery, and long-term range fire capabilities still withhold significant strategic importance, as well as air defense, fixed and mobile. The days of uncontested air dominance are gone. Heavy land forces represent <clears throat> an area where the West can bring its technological superiority to bear, but we have neglected it for decades. We have to reverse the course. We have to take action now. There is an ongoing crisis which is dictating its own timing. We cannot afford the luxury to wait. We must be bold enough to swiftly agree on our actual needs and secure all the resources necessary to fulfill them. At the EU level, there are the ADF, the DIRPA, the EDIP, which are vital instruments to foster much-needed cooperation. A first step we would, would be to finance these instruments according to the expectation on them. Many thanks to all of you. Many thanks to you. That's a very long to-do list there for, for all those working in European defence. Thank you so much, Mr. Profumo, for that. And thank you so much uh, to the Belgian Minister, De Dunder, for being, and thank you so much as well to Joël for those opening remarks. So that was our opening session this morning here at the European Defence and Security Conference. In just a minute or two, we'll be kicking off with the second part, the second session, which is all about this strategic compass. So just one or two minutes patience while we set up the stage for that. Thank you so much.
Welcome back to the second European Defence and Security Conference coming to you live today from the Egmont Palace here in the city centre of Brussels. A very warm welcome to all those joining us today online for all the sessions regarding European Defence and of course a warm welcome to all those here in the room. This session will be all about the strategic compass, turning a strategic perspective into concrete actions. As everyone in this room is probably aware, the strategic compass was given the green light back on the 24th of March by EU leaders, and it aims to guide the EU security and defence ambitions for the next decade. So to discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by four or five, excuse me, experts in the area. Sitting right next door to me is Charles Fries. He is the Deputy Secretary General of the Common Security and Defence Policy and Crisis Response at the EEAS, a man who's very familiar with the strategic compass. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're also joined by Timo Pisonen, the Director General of DG Defis, that's of course Defence Industry and Space from the European Commission. We're also represented this morning by industry to hear their points of view and get their perspectives on the strategic compass. So I'd like to welcome Eric Branger, the Chief Executive Officer of MBDA, the multinational defence company providing missiles and missile systems to armed forces. So thank you so much for being here. We're also joined by Nicolas Chamossi. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Nexter, the French weapons manufacturer. So good to see you. And also Pierre Roberto Foggiero, the CEO and the General Manager of Fincatieri. That's the Italian shipbuilding company, the largest one in Europe with a big focus on naval. Now this morning, we're also hoping to be joined by Nathalie Loiseau, European Member of Parliament from France and the Chair of the Security and Defence Subcommittee. But she had another pressing engagement and she sends her apologies. She would have loved to have been here today. But thank you all for you, to you for being here and thank you for those for your attention in the room. Charles, I would like to start with yourself because you of course were involved in writing the, the strategic compass that took some 18 months uh, to come up with. So here we are six months since it's been officially endorsed. So where are we now? What concrete st steps have been taken in order to implement it? Well, we are, so first, good morning. Uh, we are progressing well for the implementation on the Compass. Uh, as you know, when it was adopted last March, that was a few weeks after the beginning of the Russian invasion. And to a certain extent, uh, it can be seen as one of the EU's answers uh, to this uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, this document, of course, is uh, as a much uh, as a broader ambition because it covers the whole uh, security and defence agenda of the European Union. Uh, it covers a period from now until 2030, and uh, it's a, and it's uh, above all a guide for action, and with the objective of making Europe uh, a more efficient and a stronger uh, security provider. And I think. If we try to take some examples uh, to be as concrete as possible, we can see that uh, in the framework of the Compass and in relationship with the war in Ukraine, I would like to give you some, some illustrations. First, the Compass said that we should use the full potential of the European Peace Facility, this new instrument which was launched last year. And in fact, that's what we have done, because for the first time in the history of the European Union, uh, we have um, decided to finance the delivery of weapons uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. And uh, you, uh, I would like to say that when we launched this instrument last year, uh, we would never have imagined that uh, we, we would use this instrument uh, to help a country at war on European soil. So we have, been, uh, we have already uh, committed 2.5 billion euros uh, yesterday, High Representative Borrell uh, has uh, transmitted to member states uh, a new proposal to, to add a new tranche of 500 billion euros. So to, we, I can say that it's, and, and, this, and this EPF instrument has been a strong um, incentive to, um, in, to, to, for, for member states to um, uh, deliver more weapons to, to Ukraine. And the problem is that, to a certain extent, this European peace facility is today a victim of its own success. Because if you had what we have uh, promised to Ukraine, and, if we had, and, and, and also what we want to finance in the rest of the world, we have already allocated two-thirds of the global envelope of this EPF 
uh, after the second year of his existence. And uh, this instrument is for seven years. So uh, I think we will need to replenish this instrument uh, if we want to preserve the level of ambition as, as defined in the strategic compass, because we don't want to act only for Ukraine. We want to act for uh, Africa, for the outside, southern, eastern neighborhood, and also for the Western Balkans. So com the compass said we need to be more efficient when we want to support our partners, and I think EPF is a good, uh, is a good uh, illustration for that. Uh, a second illustration, uh, the compass, uh, strategic compass said we want uh, the CSDP missions uh, to be um, created more rapidly and also to be more flexible. And I think it's what we are doing right now with uh, the work done uh, for, to create a new military assistance mission for Ukraine. Uh, this decision is, to gain, is, is going to be adopted next week by the Foreign Affairs Ministers. Uh, this mission uh, will be deployed on European, uh, on EU, um, in the EU member states, not in Ukraine, but we are going to train uh, the Ukrainian army uh, and, for, and as, as a first step we hope that 15,000 Ukrainian uh, trainees will be uh, trained uh, um, in the coming months, so during winter. And I think this um, new mission can bring a real added value to the ongoing uh, training initiatives which have already been decided by, by, by some member states and also by our, uh, uh, by our NATO partners. I have in mind here uh, the UK, US and Canada. So we are, I think the compass here again sets the framework and after the EPF, the creation of this mission shows that we are delivering. A third illustration, very important in the compass, is a dimension concerning resilience. The compass makes a strong call to strengthen our resilience. And we have seen with a, a strike, um, anti-satellite strike uh, done last year by Russia, more recently the cyber attacks and, and, of, and a few days ago uh, what happened in the um, in the Baltic Sea with uh, North Stream, we see that uh, to secure uh, uh, our, uh, to, se to, se to secure Europe uh, is a, of course a key work strand for all of us. And we have we have progressed in this area with uh, uh, what we call the hybrid toolbox, which is a, an instrument in order for us to be more efficient when we need to face hybrid threats. We have been also progressing in the fight against this information. Uh, next month, with the Commission, we are going to propose a new cyber defense strategy. And early next year, we will put forward a space strategy for security and defense. So all these work strands are very important because it's an implementation of the Compass. Another illustration, it's what we want to do with our partners. You know, we, we want, and the Belgian minister said that very clearly this morning, we want to develop our strategic autonomy. But strategic autonomy, that means that we want to act with our partners each time it's possible and to be ready to act alone when we don't have the choice. But when, when we can act with our partners, it's always, of course, uh, efficient. And that's what we have been doing with NATO since the first day of the invasion. Um, this cooperation has been very efficient and, uh, and you will see probably in the coming weeks that the two organizations are going to adopt a new joint statement between EU and NATO and that would be a new illustration of this strong partnership. Last point, final remark about the investment uh, dimension of the Compass. It's obvious that the Compass has shown that uh, member states have underinvested in defense over the last 20 years. And in addition, when they spent, they did that inefficiently. That means in a fragmented manner. And as you know, last year, only 8% of our defense procurement uh, was, invest, was invested in a collaborative manner. And that's, that's far below the 35% benchmark defined uh, by the uh, European Defense Agency. So that means fragmentation. That means waste of resources. That means uh, lack of economies of scale. And, that's why, and, and the war in Ukraine has been an accelerator of this awareness and of this urgency. And that's why we need now to revise, we need now not only to revise our military doctrines uh, with the return of high intensity conflict in Europe, but most, but, but most importantly, we need to refill our stocks depleted by the massive transfers of military equipment, of ammunition to Ukraine. And to do this right, we have to buy together. 
as we did with the vaccines and as we would like to do with the gas. So we need, and that was also the message of the high representative, we need to spend more, but above all, to spend better. And that's why, with the Commission, we have created um, this uh, a task force um, in June, uh, bringing together the Commission, the ES and the EDA, in order to bring together the demands, the needs coming from member states, and to engage with European uh, industry, European defence industry, for supplying the needs uh, and, and, and also um, um, asking the, uh, the, the industry to, to increase its production capacity. And in parallel, as you know, the Commission has presented a proposal to incentivize joint procurement in order to fill the capability gaps and, and, and with an envelope of 500 million euros, but Timo is going to, to speak about that in one second. So finally, uh, you can see that we have been we have been uh, working a lot on, on this issue, on uh, invest investment, uh, defence investment gaps, with concrete proposals. And uh, now we see that NATO and also what we call the uh, Ukraine Contact Group are also working on the same issue. It's positive, it's good. Uh, what is important is to keep a good coordination between these different formats, between the EU, between NATO, between the Rammstein format, uh, in order to avoid duplication. But this, it's obvious that this priority to replenish the stocks, uh, it, it's, it's key because we want to continue supporting Ukraine, but we want also at the same time to boost and to strengthen the competitiveness of our European defence industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the conundrum that we heard about earlier this morning in those opening speeches. Thank you so much for that. We'll be back to you a little bit later to elaborate on the astonishing amount of money that could be saved if there was more cooperation among the 27. It is unfortunate we don't have our MEP to, to hear more on the political will when it comes to the EU member states. But now let's move on to Mr. Timo Pisanen, Director General of DG Defis, and get his take on the strategic compass, whether or not it is a game changer. And I'd also like to ask you, how can the EU be a credible international actor if it's so dependent on, and if it can be blackmailed by hostile actors when it comes to its energy supply? Thank you, and thanks, Charles, for, in a way, already giving the frame of the strategic compass and our good cooperation. I would like to start by saying two, two dates, September 11, February 24. I'm sure that all of you remember where you were on September 11, and all remember where you were on 24th in the morning when the news came on the Putin attacking a sovereign, independent European state. It's a game changer. It's a real game changer, and that's why I think we are here. What we have been doing for years already has been striped by the political will and the industry steer also to strengthen the European technology, technology and, and industrial base in defense. That's for sure. We have been talking about defense union since the previous Commission President Juncker and the Madame van der Leyen strengthening the message together with High Rep. Ward Borrell. Day after day, week after week, month after month, there have been various initiative launched. European Defence Fund, with its precursor programmes, more than one billion a year, which is less than what the Commission proposed, but that was we were given by the budgetary authority. Which it is, you, you may call it a small, small money or big money, depending where you look from where you look at. It's the first time we are using EU budget money for defence uh, research and development projects, very concretely. And these gentlemen on my left are the key strivers for the concrete projects. You mentioned strategic compass. We st started talk about it a few years ago already, and it was a bit abstract in the beginning. And I'm, a, I'm an atypical bureaucrat, so I'm not always a big fan of documents and, and strategies as such, but the compass itself proved to be, and it is, extremely valuable tool. Because it puts together the various let's say, lines of action, as Charles rightly, rightly put it together. And for me and my team, of course, the defense innovation and investment is the key, the core, the core content, as well as military mobility. We need to continue improving the capability of our armed forces to move. It's clear, I mean, and, and, and in the case of Ukraine, I mean, how can we get the help to Ukraine in the front, how we can uh, get the material there, uh, it is, of course, of utmost importance, and we continue that, and there will be a new military mobility action plan coming. You mentioned hybrid threats and cyber. 
And the Belgian minister, she uh, uh, underlined the, how much Belgium is, is investing on, on, on cyber with their new uh, cap cap capabilities and capacities. But I think both on cyber and hybrid, my, my, my point is that uh, after February 24th and even before, I think it's not only in, enough that we detect the threats, we prepare, and we may react, but we also need to build up our deterrence. Anyone who wishes to attack the European infrastructures, as you mentioned, be it in, in, in transport, in energy, or, 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 or let's say in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, internet connections, need to know that Europe can do the same if we attack. It's a very simple logic. But does Putin understand anything else than a simple logic? No, he doesn't. My summer house is 25 kilometers from the Russian border. That border is peaceful. It's always been since 44, when the, the Second World War stopped, uh, stopped in Finland. It's still peaceful. I'm not, people are not in panic. I was there in summer. Life continues. But of course, the atmosphere is different. Mm. Atmosphere is different. And that border, 1,300 kilometers, will be the longest border between the NATO and Russia as soon as Erdogan agrees uh, Finland and Sweden to join, join NATO. So this, I'm saying that after the February 24th, the whole security structure in Europe is changing fundamentally. Uh, I don't know when, uh, when these uh, implications will, will uh, cross up to Ireland. I don't know, but at least Finland and Sweden draw the conclusions uh, after Putin's attack. Then a few words on what we are doing now after February 24th, Charles already said, we are working together to, uh, we already put together an analysis on the investment caps, in the field of defense, budgetary caps, uh, in, in investment caps, and also industrial caps. I have discussed with colleagues here on my left on these issues a uh, few times. Of course, the replacing, replen, replen, replenishing the, the, the stocks is number one priority. Because at the same time, when our right hand is giving ammunition, and rightly so, to Ukraine, our left hand should be filling our own stocks. Because we want to continue supporting Ukraine, but also we need to prepare ourselves. We need to be, the, the situation has changed. The threat of conventional war in Europe is back. <clears throat> and this, this is clear, something which is the, one of the, let's say, conclusions of the, of the February 24th. So what we want to do, to make member states, as the Belgian minister also said, investing together on, on, on defense uh, capabilities, investing better, i.e. the right priorities, smart investments, also to disruptive technologies, as uh, Mr. Profil Kuma earlier said, and also invest in a European way, supporting our strategic autonomy, our technological uh, independence, because we need to look beyond the immediate short-term needs, also building in the mid and longer term our European capabilities in the field of defense. And of course, we need to get rid of the Soviet-type legacy armaments, which are in, in several member states still in place, because there is the, the, the line of, uh, of spare parts gone, you know, the, the, that dependence we have to cut, and we are doing it. So those weapons need to be, needs to re be replaced, artillery, uh, um, uh, uh, in particular, uh, tanks and so forth. And reinforcing air missile and defense systems. The President Biden reacted immediately after the Putin's latest attack, saying that the US will, will continue supporting and will strengthen its support on air, air and missile defense. So need the European, we need to step up, step up on that. So we have, we have several instruments going on together with Charles. So I, my message to industry is that you can count on us we want to be very practical and efficient in our cooperation and cut the red tape from our side in order to, to be able to, to meet the challenges in the world post February 24th. Okay, Timo Pusunman, thank you so much for that very comprehensive introductory remark. And you mentioned, of course, how crucial you said industry, the role they will play in all this. And I would like now to hear from them. We'll start with yourself on, on your take on the strategic compass and the role that you'll be playing vis-a-vis -vis European security and defense. Thank, thank you very much and good morning everybody. 
Uh, yesterday again, with this strike of 75 missiles, we were indeed remembered uh, very harshly that, uh, that war is at our doorsteps. And um, uh, Europe, of course, is very active uh, in reaction to all what is happening. The strategic compass is a very important uh, tool for this, which started before the Ukrainian uh, conflict, by the way, and which I think is giving us uh, something very important is giving us vision, long-term, uh, and an ambition. Uh, but there's been also some other actions, and in particular in the Versailles summit, uh, there was uh, uh, this trigger of the analysis of the European defense uh, gaps. And if I take a look at the immediate consequences for, uh, for industry, uh, I would I would say that it's really, indeed, a change of paradigm, as uh, you were both uh, saying. And the immediate consequence for us is that we are asked to do more, to, do, to work faster, to deliver at a higher pace, and we are asked to do all of this now. Uh, and what it means, I think, uh, it means three topics. Uh, when you look at what is happening. It's a point on which we need to be extremely vigilant. There's, a, there's no peace, there's no security without a defense industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric Branger there, the Chief Executive Officer of MBDA. And I, in fact, noticed on all your websites, you're all recruiting, so human resources is an important topic for you all. And that leads us nicely now on to get the perspective from Nicolas Chamoussi, the Chief Executive Officer of Nexter. And I'd like to ask you, sir, how can the EU's defence uh, technological industrial, industrial base meet the short-term post-Ukraine industrial challenge of increasing production to deliver capabilities for the armed forces? Thank you, Maeve. Uh, if you allow me, just one small correction. You introduced me as a CEO of the French weapon manufacturer next year, which is factually true. As a matter of fact, we are, as MBDAs, part of a European company. Uh, I think it's Let's shown somewhere on the logo uh, just behind the uh, Pier Franco. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are part of uh, KNDS as yeah. a European company. I think it, it makes sense in this, uh, in this uh, noble assembly. Yeah, um, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> so um, the, the new geopolitical context in which we are we are living following the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has created indeed a very new environment for all of us, for all industry representatives in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this room and in Europe. We need now to answer a dramatic increase demand for, from member states in terms of military equipment, both for uh, stocks or inventory recompletion and for uh, capability increase with in extremely important volumes uh, needed in short time frames. I think it was mentioned by Eric, we need mass and technology. I think I quoted uh, uh, what, what, what you just said. Whereas at the same time, four years, four years, the issue in Europe was uh, that small demand that led to production capabilities which were exactly designed for peacetime. We have industrial capabilities in Europe which are designed for peacetime uh, with li limited expected demand. There was a limited request for quantity, there was a limited request for high pace that stemmed simply from a constant decrease in the member states' defense budget. So as of today, KNDS slash Nexter, as is the case uh, for, for MBD and probably for, for, for Fink and Thierry also, we are absolutely fully mobilized to cope uh, with this major challenge. We deploy absolutely considerable efforts to increase our production, to invest uh, in facilities to stockpile raw material, to stockpile uh, electronic equipment, to stockpile semi-finished uh, goods uh, for key critical supplies and to support, at the same time, the existing uh, equipment which are in the field. Uh, yet, there is a kind of a paradoxical risk for these uh, EU member states' military capability decrease. If we are not vigilant enough, as it was said before, to be detrimental to Europe's strategic autonomy and in the DITB case, in case it leads to non-European procurement. I think we have to be extremely vigilant. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the industrial refragmentation. I think the word fragmentation was used 
by you, uh, Charles, and by you, Eric, probably by Tim also was not uh, uh, accurate enough. Uh, I think it's very important to avoid the refragmentation at national level driven by this uh, hectic en environment. Uh, this risk is even more increased, if I may say so, by the lack of an actual common military need at EU level. Um, on the contrary, I think this challenge must be met at European level, densifying and recompleting our military capabilities while fostering better and more efficient cooperation. And I think the EU, uh, and uh, Timo, you said it uh, uh, absolutely right to the point, this e the EU can play a key role in this regard. You have proposed, the European Commission has proposed the IDIRPA. I think it's a new important instrument. It's not a given yet. There's still a, 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 let's say, a long way home or long way home, at least to make it, to make it work and operational. I think it's very much welcomed by the industry. Eric, you said it a few seconds ago. But it has to be implemented quickly, efficiently. Yes, there are eligibility questions, but they have to be, to be solved and move forward to benefit the, both European military capabilities and the European defense industry that we are representing today. For example, I think you, you, you mentioned it also, Timo, there is a very important demand for artillery capabilities, for systems and for the related uh, ammunitions in Europe. And EDIRPA can be a, a key instrument to incentivize member states to cooperate to purchase European systems. To be efficient, provided the limited amount of money, it has to be concentrated on very key focused area, artillery and munition is one, uh, to make a difference at European level. That would be my short answer to your question. Lovely. Short and sweet. Thank you so much. And we move on then to last but not least, um, the perspective from Fincantieri to, the C for the, to hear from the CEO, Pierre Roberto Folgero. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we can add after such, uh, I would say, uh, important uh, um, speakers before me, we can add the angle of the importance of cross-fertilization. Because the beauty of uh, Fincantieri at this table is that we act in a dual sector, uh, which is very interesting in terms of technology, because you know, historically, the defense technology used to fertilize the civilian technology, but you know, from time to time, it's also the other way around. So the IoT starting uh, outside is cross-fertilizing -fertil also the defense sector, in particular on the platform management, on the ship management. And you know, we are envisaging a future in which ship management system and convent management system has to uh, join forces and merge more and more. So oh, this is the first added value of cross-fertilization. The, the other added value of cross-fertilization is to manage the supply chain. So we extensively today analyze the importance of uh, having a resilient and healthy supply chain in order to the miracle we are requested to do, demanded to do. Because we have very clearly specified that we need to be short time minded and long time minded at the same time. We need to work on the defragmentation on, the, on one end, but on the other end we have to also to nurture the uh, innovation for the long term, i.e., uh, you know, pushing forward SMEs and pushing forward startups. So how can we be big and resilient and small and agile at the same time? How, how can we be short term minded and long term minded at the same time? How can we work for warehouses and without orders at the same time? So all this dilemma has to be addressed through the supply chain. So in my view, the, the way to do this miracle is to proper, proper, properly read our supply chain and uh, orchestrate our supply chain accordingly. So I take 100% the point that uh, we are integrators of solutions. Uh, integrator of solutions, meaning we can do something today because we know what is mature, but integrator of solution means also that we can assess uh, that part of innovation that is possible to be commercialized and industrialized. So that's the way we can act uh, as integrator in being long-term and short-term at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you know, supply chain has also to do with the local procurement perspective. 
so we can procure that the rest of the ecosystem is progressively occupying more and more space. And you know how much the, uh, uh, the, the, the consequences on the, uh, on the uh, occupation, the consequences on how we feed the local companies, it's a way to explain to taxpayers that these extra investments are worthwhile to incur. Uh, yes, we are in front of a game changer. Yes, the public opinion is mobilized, like never before, but there is still the issue of ESG. So we need to uh, learn more and more how to communicate this new world in which defense is key. It's key even for the, <laughs> I would say, sustainability, in a sense. So uh, supply chain involvement, uh, um, explain very well the cross-fertilization. It's a way to me to help this communication exercise and to procure that the public opinion and the taxpayers are uh, sincerely and genuinely in favor of this huge investment program that is by no chance uh, very important to, to incur. So that's my angle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting perspective there from Finca Thierry. And it's interesting what you say there about spreading the word and communicating to Europeans when there was no mention of defence really in Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President's State of the Union speech earlier this year in Strasbourg. Perhaps there's a reason for that? <laughs> well, I, anyway. <laughs> well, I, I, think the, I think the answer is that, I mean, we are doing so much on a daily basis and she launched the initiative together with Borrell earlier this year, so there was like a, no need to repeat what we have already mm. launched and what we are doing. But the question of convincing the taxpayers is, is, yeah. is definitely an interesting one and a, lo a role for people like myself, perhaps. Yeah. Can I comment something journalist? on, you on can, whoops, Mr. Bernard? You can react, Eric, of course, to Eric the CEOs, said, yeah, Timo? I mean, I mean, what you said about, you know, the young engineers, I think that's the one of the core, core issues we have. And the skills. I mean, I have discussed with you also, I mm. mean, about the skills you explained to me, I mean, uh, how sophisticated the skills, you know, your industry needs, and that where, where do you can get, you know, the, the skilled labor. We have shortage of labor in, in everywhere in the industry. And if the image of defense industry, as Pierre Robert also said, is like at risk in the eyes of the public, I think we need to make a joint effort together to, to, to uh, let's say, to, uh, to, to deviate that, because that's really the issue. I mean, uh, I mean where, where is the most sophisticated skills in, in, in defense and in space? image of space industry is, is better to a certain extent because it's like, a, you know, because of the American billionaires and Star Wars and Star Trek and everything like that. But the industry and space industry are, are intertwined. I mean, they are, they are two, two sides of the same coin. So I think there is a kind of a look for good ideas also from you and your colleagues to what we could do together, Charles, also to, to, to promote, I mean, what we are doing. You go for no, a follow-up and then yourself you can react to what we've heard so far, uh, yeah? Just really to follow up on what uh, uh, Timo said, mm -hmm. um, we are in sharp need of uh, resources and in uh, specialized resources, human resources. Mm -hmm. So there are several ways that we are probably all of us uh, looking at um, using early retired people who have just left the company, who are still uh, knowledgeable mm -hmm. that we can use. Also tapping into other companies in dual, dual industries where we have uh, resources which could be useful for, 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 industri for industrial purposes in defense sector. And something that we are trying to put in place, uh, I don't know if it will go any further, is using defense reserve to serve uh, industry in case of uh, needs. Mm. Reserve is used to feed regiments and, and, and headquarters. Uh, it could be also used to feed industry to help us in case of urgent needs. This needs to be prepared. It's not something which should come overnight. But if rightly prepared, we'll have a reservoir of people who, who, who would be working in the civilian life but still be used and trained and usable for, for defense purposes in case of needs. This is something maybe to be considered uh, uh, at European level. Charles, your reaction to what you've heard already? Good idea. Yes, uh, I think that uh, um, since the 24th of February, we have seen, uh, for, it's for us, it has been for us a brutal wake-up call for Europe. Uh, 
Mm. Um, uh, the EU leaders have uh, spoken of a tectonic shift in the European security and defense landscape. Uh, I think uh, that's why all what has been said this morning is very important now to implement. Uh, we have underinvested in our defense, and now you, we, we don't have the choice. We, we need to, to cooperate more together. We need uh, that famous uh, catchphrase, we need to spend more, but above all, we need to spend better. That's what we try to push uh, with the Commission, uh, with these new instruments. Now, uh, of course, the European defense industry has a key role to play. The member states also have a key role to play to, 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 to take this opportunity, uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, all this, uh, we, 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 we have considered that there are more than uh, 200 billion euros which are now going to be spent in defense. If we continue what we have done over the last 20 years, that would be a dramatic mistake. And so when, when we see that Finland and um, Sweden want to join NATO, when we see that Denmark uh, has decided to join CSDP, when you see that Germany uh, has decided to invest, you know, 100 billion euros. All these extraordinary uh, changes, we need also to implement them at the industrial level. We need, the responsibility of the EU is to offer a framework for the EU member states and for the uh, comp uh, defense, uh, um, for the European defense industry, uh, in order to now to cooperate more because uh, once again we need to reduce this fragmentation which is one of our uh, main shortfalls and uh, handicaps I would say. Okay, it's just 10.30 so I would like to start opening the floor as well. If there's anyone here physically in the room who would like to address a question to our panelists up here, we will take the microphone over to you right now. If you'd just like to introduce yourself first before you speak, and try and keep your question tight so we can take as many as we can from the room and also from our online audience via Slido. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. <clears throat> can you hear me? Perfectly, uh, yeah. I'm Frederick Moreau. I'm a lawyer and a researcher. Uh, amongst many other big surprises, the war in Ukraine has brought up two strategic surprises. The first one is the underperformance of the Russian army which is a big surprise and we have to draw the lessons of that. But the other one is uh, a, 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 a big new use of the nuclear weapons. It's, it, the, the Russians are using the nuclear weapons not to deter, but to attack. And this is a dramatic change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a little bit surprised that uh, in a conference called European Defense and Security, the word nuclear has not been uttered, with the exception notable of Monsieur uh, le Président Béranger. Uh, but my question is, when will we Europeans be able to talk nuclear? Because if there is a way to defend Europe, the first one is nuclear. So we have to grow up and not to see the world as, as, as we would like it to be. Talking conventional uh, weapons is very nice and fair and we have to do it but we offer also to talk nuclear. Thank you so much for your question. Who would like to react to that? It was definitely a question on my list, sir. <laughs> Timo? Well, I mean, on the, on, the, on the Russian military underperformance, surprise, yes, to a certain extent, but not total. Ukrainian people are fighting for their freedom. They know who attacks and why, and they protect themselves, their homes, and their families. The Russian soldiers sent across the border on February 24th didn't really know why, why we are doing this. So it's not only about the, the technological, let's say, uh, underperformance, or bad command, or logistics, which is always the problem with, uh, with the, be it the Soviet or Russian army, but also the will of the, of, the, of the people and the soldiers. On the nuclear, I refer to Charles because the European Commission is not uh, <laughs> dealing with nuclear issues. <laughs> of course, we have, a, as, as uh, Mr. Berenstein rightly said, there is a member state with a nuclear deterrence, uh, but the European uh, nuclear is not in, in my agenda. Mm. 
the, it's true that uh, we have not uh, mentioned this morning uh, this uh, nuclear issue. Uh, we, we don't want, in fact, to, to banalize uh, this uh, possible use uh, of nuclear weapons because, of course, in our doctrine, we have always said that it must be only deterrence and, of course, uh, never used. That's uh, the position. Uh, we, we cannot... Uh, the, I mean, the G7 leaders have uh, uh, adopted many statements on this issue. Uh, so we, we will see what Russia wants to do, but uh, that would be... We have not talked... Uh, we have not spoken of, um, about this issue at the, um, at the level of the 27 uh, member states. Uh, perhaps for you, I, I understand that for you it's a bit strange not to mention this, uh, but for instance that was not a subject uh, discussed uh, in the strategic compass. Um, we will see in the future if we, you know, the IREP mentioned uh, that we, we, this document uh, is in constant is a, is a constant process. There will be, at the end of the year, a, um, a new uh, a revised threat analysis. Uh, probably in this document, we will uh, take into account the the threat uh, used by by Russia and the fact that they want to uh, to 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 um, put more pressure on us on this. But at at this moment, I have to say that we are not we are not talking about this issue at the level of the 27. And from our CEOs, any advice um, to our representatives here from the institution when talking about this issue or when drafting the second edition of the Strategic Compass? No? Okay, well then I'd like to invite our next speaker. Just pl please introduce yourself. Yes, Thank Antoine you. Bouvier, uh, Airbus. So the question was not to me, Frédéric, but uh, since uh, it was not really uh, answer to, I will take the liberty to try to give some elements. I think this was actually... Uh, addressed for the EU-NATO cooperation. Mm. Mm. Because what uh, we should keep in mind is first, the EU has declared that uh, NATO is at the core of collective defense, and NATO is uh, positioning itself as, uh, as a nuclear alliance with three countries, the US, the UK, France being nuclear countries, with five countries being part of the nuclear sharing uh, activity, uh, Germany, Italy, Turkey, Netherlands, Belgium, and with all the countries except France uh, being part of the nuclear planning group. So uh, indirectly, and I think this is something which is a sort of uh, elephant in the lobby, indirectly the nuclear deterrence debate in Europe is directly linked to NATO acting as a nuclear alliance and the cooperation between NATO and the EU for security. And this is certainly a topic but I think we should not say it is not addressed. It's addressed through this NATO angle. Thank you so much. We have one more question, a lady there in the back. Thank you so much for that. And yes, just stay in there. You may up. Um, um, Christine Norquin from Brea. I wanted to ask a question that I put on Slido, by the way, so forget about this one. Um, to Timo, um, you spoke uh, very rightly on the fact that we have an increase in cyber attacks uh, to our infrastructures, and this is really a higher risk today that we have to counter. And beyond EDF and beyond the strategic compass, are there extra additional measures that the Commission is envisaging to reinforce cyber defense and to you know, form the skills to resist to those attacks and, as you mentioned, in turn to attack ourselves if we are in danger. Thank you. Very important question. Thank you. I mean, Charles already mentioned that we are working on a cyber strategy, cyber defense strategy mm -hmm. in the Commission and we will uh, uh, publish it in, uh, in three, four weeks' time. So uh, that will be kind of a guide for our enhanced uh, cyber defense uh, activities. You also, Charles, you mentioned, you know, the space defense and security strategy which we are working together. So early next year, during next year, we will come with a strategy on space defense because of course space is vulnerable. Our, our satellites are vulnerable. We need to protect them. We need to secure them. And also at the same time, our both uh, Galileo navigation and Copernicus observation, they also are useful tools in protecting our strategic infrastructure. I mean, detecting uh, and, and, and let's say share, sharing the information and data about the possible risks of infrastructure also. So I think we have a, here a very concrete space and defense uh, uh, cooperation.
And anything you can tell us to look out for in that that's coming Sorry? out? That document you said is coming out in a couple of weeks? Like on 9th of November or something like 9th that. 9th of November? Okay, we will keep an eye out on that. Um, we have a question for yourself, uh, Mr. Fulgero, a question that came in to us from, from Slido, so thank you so much for that. What would your recommendations be to the European Commission as regards improving the European supply chain? Uh, uh, I believe it's... Uh, uh First of all, I believe we should uh, uh, procure that the existing programs are well implemented. So I believe in this concept of uh, being short-term and long-term. Let's start from uh, uh, existing programs. So we have a couple of programs that are already there. For example, the EPC, the European Patrol Corvette, it's a program in which uh, uh, we should get into implementation. And, uh, you know, if we don't implement well existing programs, future programs will be more difficult to do. So my first point is, let's start uh, with what we have in, on, on, on the desk. And let's procure that we uh, get into this new collaboration mood, uh, starting from, from what we have uh, in front. Okay, I'm just looking around the room to see, do we have anything else? If not, I have a question for yourself, Timo Pesonen, that I wanted to put to you about um, the European Commission and the European Defence Agency putting together analysis recently of defence investment deficits. I think it was in May. Can you just tell us what analysis was revealed then? Well, it, it really, I mean, um, Charles was also working, we were working uh, together. I mean, it's really also, we knew that there are, of course, these gaps. I mean, it is, it's not rocket science. I mean, it was visible already before, but of course, the, the, the February 24th underlined the urgency to, to be more specific. And I think what I, what I mentioned already, that we need more ammunition, we need, we need man pads, we need bazookas, we need, you know, grenades, so it's clear what we need. And air defense, uh, air missile defense also. And if you look at the, what was invested in defense during the 21st years of this millennium, the European defense investments grew something like 20, 22%. US, 66. Russia, 292, and China, 592 person. So this gives the, the scale of, of the, the, the magnitude of the, of the investments in defense in, in these, let's say, global, global, global players. And unfortunately, after the, the euro area debt crisis, where I, I was uh, unfortunately had to work before in my life, in my career, of course, it was a moment when the European EU member states cut their defense spending. And that we should not repeat that mistake now. And, the, and the one of the enemies what we are facing, and I think Pierre Roberto was at least indirectly addressing that, is a kind of a war fatigue in Europe. He's also a high representative in Prague in the Defense Minister's Council. He referred to that. And that we have to fight against together. I mean, there is a war in the European continent. And Putin reminds us on his daily strikes or with missiles, there is a battle at the border still, and, and I think this is something we are defending ourselves. We are defending our way of love, life, our values, the, the European member states. Our, so I think we, we, we kind of need to keep on talking what we are doing and why we are doing it in order to have the public support with uh, which uh, Pierre Roberto uh, referred to. I think this is, this is important. And a war on European soil that came as a surprise and as a shock to yourself and to your colleagues at the External Action Service. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine the hope is now with the strategic compass that there would never be such shock again, that you'd be better prepared. I hope that's what we, we try to do. Uh, you know, the strategic compass, it's a list of around uh, 80 actions, very concrete, with timelines, uh, with a follow-up mechanism. Uh, 50 of them have to be delivered until the end of the year. We will have a first debate on the implementation of the strategic compass at the level of uh, defence and foreign affairs ministers next March, that was, uh, on the basis of a first report presented by the HRBP. Uh, it's, it's really our roadmap now for, for, for the next years, uh, and we are ready to adjust this document if, if needed on the basis of the evolving threats that we have been talking about this morning. Uh, and, um, 
And uh, now what we need is action, not only to concentrate our energy on elaborating new documents. I think uh, the strategic compass, it, it was a negotiation of almost 18 months, so now we have to, to implement it. And I would not, uh, I think it would not be a good idea to, to try to reinvent the wheel. What we need to do now is to implement what we have decided. And, and, and to put in place all these instruments, for instance, EDIRPA, uh, I mentioned the EP, European Peace Facility that needs to be replenished. We had a, a lot of things to do, uh, and I, 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 I think it's better to do this instead of, uh, once again, um, um, elaborating new, new documents. But there, there will be a, 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 a mid-term review uh, in some years, and so we will see at, at, at that moment. Okay, so not the time for documents, the time for implementation. Yes, exactly. Proof, of course, is always in the pudding. If there are no more comments from the room or questions or any more comments from our CEOs here in the panel? No? Yeah. Everyone's ready for a coffee? Yeah. Yeah? Maybe one, one, to, one add, more two, comment to what Charles yeah. said. No more documents, but I think there are still two which are of importance for the defense industry, the Raw Material Act and the yeah. CHIPS Act. Yes, I think they are... I don't know exactly, in preparation or in the, in the course of being prepared, I think the, the defense implication is, is of importance for, for us, I suspect, and it has to be taken into account. And on those acts, we might hear a little bit later on when Thierry Breton, the European Commission for Industry, is in the room. Um, Timo Pessona, final word, yeah? I received an SMS from my Irish colleagues asking that, did I propose Ireland to join NATO? No, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> That's I want Ireland to be active on the European Defence Fund, more active and so forth. I made no reference to that, just so to, to, be, to be sure. There you go. On that, on that note, a debate, an ongoing debate, of course, in my home country of Ireland. Thank you so much to all our panellists. You've been fantastic. Thank you so much to our audience, you too. And thank you for all those who've been watching online. Enjoy the rest of the day. You have a short coffee break now, and 11 o'clock we'll resume here with my colleague, Torsten. Really? Enjoy. Very good. Thank you. In the world of defense and security, leading the innovation means contributing to a safer tomorrow. Indra has been working for a hundred years at the service of its clients. With world-class references in the five defense domains, land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. An extensive portfolio of complete and integrated solutions. We develop systems for air, naval, and land platforms. We design integrated command and control systems for complex operations. We create technologies to anticipate and face all kinds of threats. We apply the use of space technologies to military operations. We cover all types of simulations for military and civilian training. We design models adapted to new conflict scenarios and apply digital concepts in our solutions. We are global leaders in defense technology systems, acting as a driving force for the national industry with unique capabilities for system design and integration level and key participation in the main international cooperation programs and a leading position building the new Europe of Defence. We are the national coordinator of the largest European military technology program. We will continue protecting and driving the future, a future full of challenges where anticipating is as important as knowing how to react.
So, hello back. Hello, uh, everyone. Apologize for this unplanned coffee break uh, that gave a bit of, bit of confusion. Um, now we have two hours or two one hour sessions back to back, and then you will have the well deserved lunch. So, stay with us. Before we start, I'm asked to encourage you also to connect on slido.com and use the code EU Defense Security Conf also for Twitter. And as it states, hashtag EU Defense Security Conf, what is pretty self explaining. We have heard in the first panel about the strategic compass and its implementation aiming at strengthening the EU's strategic autonomy, reducing dependencies and fragmentation. Let's build on that. So welcome, distinguished guests, your excellencies, dear audience here in Brussels and on the screens to the second session today towards a European Defense Union ensuring efficient joint programming and procurement. We will address the ways to, increase, uh, to decrease fragmentation and duplication of capabilities with a specific highlight on the work undertaken by the EU's Defence Joint Procurement Task Force and a view towards current and future initiatives such as the European Defence Fund, the short-term instrument and the extended European Defence Investment Programme regulation. My name is Thorsten Kreening, and I'm the publisher of spacewatch.global and your moderator for this and the next session. How fragmented are we in Euro when it comes to defense programs and procurements? What are the most pressing capability gaps? All that I will try to discuss with my distinguished panel in this very short one hour. From the EU institutions, I'm delighted to welcome Christian Silvio Bouchoy, the chair of the ITRA committee at the European Parliament, François Abo, the director of Defence Industry, DG Davis, at the European Commission, and Stefano Kons, the director of Capability, Armament and Planning at the European Defence Agency. As we would like to foster the dialogue between the institutions and the industry, I welcome from the industry Antoine Bovier, the Head of Strategy, Mergers and Acquisition and Public Affairs of, at Airbus, Ignacio Maté, the Chief Executive Officer of Indra, and last but not least, Pascal Rogues, the Managing Director of RIA Group Cybersecurity Division and Chief Strategy Officer at the RIA Group. So welcome, gentlemen, here on stage. As we have a full panel and not endless time, I'm asking all of you to stay in the time limit. I will point later to you while asking the questions. On 18th May, we saw the publication of the joint communication on the defense investment gaps analysis and the way forward, recommending a set of key measures to strengthen the European defense technological and industrial base, as well as to pave the way for an EU framework dedicated to European Defence Joint Procurement. This has been put in motion with the European Defence Industry Reinforcement through the Common Procurement Act. In June, a 500 million euro short-term EU instrument designated to address the most urgent and critical defence product needs resulting from the Russians' aggression against Ukraine and to allow for EU uh, a joint EU procurement. So, let's start with the first round here. Um, and I'm addressing the question to Mr. Bouchoy. So, how far is the European defense industrial landscape affected by the EU initiatives and programs? For three minutes, please. And I know that can go for an hour, but we don't have the time. Mr. Bouchoy. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, and I'm very honored to be part uh, uh, of yet another European Defence and Security Conference in a such uh, distinguished uh, uh, company with uh, such distinguished audience. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a moment where uh, clearly a lot of opportunities are open for European defence industry. Unfortunately, uh, it, we needed, let's say like that, uh, a legal aggression uh, against Ukraine by Russia in order to understand uh, something that uh, uh, the defense industry and some policymakers tried to explain during the years, 
Uh, we need to invest more in our defense uh, industrial base. We need to coordinate more. You talked about uh, uh, fragmentation. We are still fragmented. We are still uh, seeing the application. We are still competing uh, against each other um, inside European Union and outside European Union. And this is something that maybe will change with this boost now and with a strong political will to support uh, defense, European defense uh, industry. What has changed? Of course, uh, after many years of uh, lack of investment, lack of political interest, uh, and uh, uh, only some national initiatives in some member states, uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that most of uh, EU countries uh, were very active in NATO and participated to uh, different uh, international operations, we had a very good initiative of European Commission the European Defense Fund, uh, with its precursors, I will not go into details, we had the chance to discuss uh, last year about this and the impact of uh, European Defense Fund. Uh, and uh, this was just the, be the beginning to put together uh, our uh, expertise, uh, our will, and uh, to work jointly uh, in uh, projects that maybe are not on a massive scale, but they are very important in order to to start our uh, uh, increased uh, cooperation. And now we have uh, another very good initiative of European Commission, <coughs> and I congratulated uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton and the whole team uh, from European Commission, and we try to go as fast as possible. We are still uh, fighting for competencies inside European Parliament, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, we'll find a, a common ground with the other committees, ITRE committee, the committee that I'm chairing, will be a responsible committee, but we work together jointly with budget, with IMCO and SED also, the subcommittee for security and defense. We have uh, uh, DIRPA, extremely important also, to as a first building block for EU Defense Union, because uh, we strongly believe, and you'll see the uh, large majority in the European Parliament to support, to improve, but also to support this initiative, uh, it's the first block for cooperative uh, procurement uh, uh, jointly conducted uh, by a minimum number of member states. And uh, we, we try to create not only a defense union, but also a EU co cohesion on defense. So progresses were made in the last years, and, are, and now we are speeding up a lot in order to respond to the difficult times that we are living in. Uh, clearly, uh, Maybe you are not fully prepared for the needs that we have now. More than 230 billion uh, were announced by the European member states as investment in the coming years. Of course, uh, we saw our main strategic partner, United States, also very interested in cooperating with us. Other uh, uh, important uh, countries in the world, like South Korea, but we need to use this momentum to strengthen as much as possible the European defense industry. Thank you very much for your statement. So, money and speed. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think at that moment we could stop money, it. Money, speed but and uh, strong come. political will. Coming after the Versailles Declaration, uh, I'm Great. confident that this will stay, the political will, at the highest level. Staying on the political will, Mr. Obo, the main challenge seems to be build a truly capable European defense, as we all are here. How do you address the fragmentation and the increasing technological complexity which demands, and we say it, high and higher investment? Well, I think everything has been said already about the security context, uh, the new situation, and also the fragmentation, both on the demand side and supply side, so I browse quickly on that. Uh, I think at the risk of repeating ourselves, but I think uh, communication is about repetition, we know that no one, not one single member state, not one single defense company is able to be up to the challenge on a standard basis. This is over. There is no way this can happen. So we have to be stronger only by getting together. The EU is seen as a block also in, a, in, in security terms. Uh, so we have to react as a block. And for that, we need a single, a more integrated uh, EU defense industrial base. So indeed, and the fragmentation stand is the way. So how can we do that? Um, I would like to, to cut across the different policy documents and instruments that, that 
are well known to the audience, uh, just to, to keep basically three keywords which for me are absolutely essential. The first one is convergence. We need greater convergence in terms of deciding together on the priorities in terms of defense systems, capabilities, uh, technologies that we need. So convergence on that means that member states have to speak together much more than they used to do. Of course, there are exercises like the, 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 you know, the capability uh, plans. The, I mean, there are a number of forums, but what, for instance, uh, the EDF brings as novelty is that member states are kind of forced or nudged into discussing together the priorities which translate into calls for proposals. So that's already a, a great thing. Convergence also by industry. Uh, we want industry to actually form consortia to <coughs> respond to our calls, and this is what it takes to integrate in a, in a, let's say, in a positive manner through the will of those who want to come together to get the funding that, that we are proposing. Convergence means also a focus. So it's not only that cooperation has to be by design the, the approach, but we need to focus on the key priorities. What is it that we see as even more important than, than other ones? So, um, so this is all about con convergence, and convergence also in deciding to go together, not only to actually research and develop, but also in terms of programming and in terms of acquiring the results of the, the R&D. So convergence. Second, synchronization. And I think this is very often, uh, well, it's still too much overlooked by the, the, the agenda. We need to further synchronize the different cycles. Because of the fragmentation, because of history, we have desynchronized investment cycles, which means that whatever we do in the EDF, we can bring our billions. If member states uh, are not up to providing the co-funding that we need, we are missing out on the target. So we need to progress in terms of synchronizing these cycles. It's a bit like, you know, like on the Eurozone when you try to synchronize also the economic cycles. So we need to do that. Uh, it's a long-term ambition, obviously. Uh, the, 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 the communication of the 18th of May uh, signaled that ambition, the long-term ambition to get to an EU joint strategic programming and procurement function. We're working on that, but that will be the long term. M much more concretely, for instance, in the European Defence Fund, we need to also synchronize the, uh, the programmation of the topics. That's what we do with the multi-annual programming. We need to synchronize again the co-funding of the essence, and this also uh, of the essence when it comes to uh, the joint procurement. We need to, to align the, the procurement of what we need uh, together. And third, third key element, commitment. We, 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 we need to see more commitment uh, in different respects, in, uh, in the consistency of the effort, the continuity of the effort that we're consenting from the programming to the researching, the development, and then the acquisition. We need also commitment in terms of funding. Uh, what we see today, let's call a spade a spade, is that uh, we are not sufficiently, uh, let's say, uh, clear on the firm commitment that member states take vis-à-vis -vis the support and the co-funding, therefore, of, the, of the, 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 the topics that are put to, uh, to research and development in a, in, under the EDF. And then once the results are there, we need also to see the commitment of member states materializing in terms of acquiring together the, the, the results, the equipment, possibly maintaining, co-owning possibly the equipment. So uh, this is absolutely key. So I think these three elements, further convergence, further synchronization, and firmer commitment of all the parts. This is what it takes to make, let's say, the different instruments and policy uh, documents really uh, tangibly successful. Thank you very much. Uh, I know how hard it is to get this message within this three-minute time frame, but um, I really appreciate your, your discipline on that. And I also like that you mentioned the, the rule number one in communication or in journalism, repeat your message again and again and again. So, to... Let's go to uh, Mr. Kond. To what extent do you consider the competition is needed to foster the EU defense industry competitiveness? Can you briefly explain to us and to the public <coughs> which one is uh, EDA's role and mission in that? Well, I, I will not be uh, too much different in terms of uh, hand state to what Francois said, but I will look from a different perspective, the perspective of the customer, the armed forces, you know, yeah. the, the guys that have to use the equipment that is prepared. So let me say, first of all, that competition is essential, both for uh, to have uh, a healthy defense industry and effective armed forces. And uh, if we are not uh, having competition, 
what we run into the problem is that uh, we could have an, an, an industrial technology base that in time will be less and less uh, able to satisfy our armed force evolving uh, uh, operational need. And second, um, we could diminish the industrial overall competitiveness uh, on the global market. That will mean uh, that uh, we will have a reduced possibility to affirm our industry on the export and uh, probably force the armed forces to look outside European boundaries to satisfy their operational requirement. And that's a risk that we have to avoid. How to avoid that? Well, there are two different lines of action that we are looking at. Well, the first one, Francois already pointed, is just to have both incentives at uh, financial and regulatory levels that can foster, you know, uh, the joint uh, research and technology, research and development, and joint development of the systems. And then, in turn, even joint acquisition. But we have even uh, to reinforce uh, the EU uh, European Union entities uh, in uh, uh, the rule of preparing the ground for this activity. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, cooperation is, we, we don't just declare cooperation. You have to build cooperation. And it takes at least a, a few elements in terms of harmonizing requirement, operational requirement among different member states. Harmonizing the member state financial and operational planning. If we don't do that, uh, we will not be in the position to have a, a harmonized or joint uh, industry program. Um, we need to finally implement even best, uh, best practices at our level uh, to support member states in their action to cooperate and, and collaborate together. We deny, obviously, on industry. We, we cannot create a world that is totally uh, foreign to to defense industry. We need to keep that in mind. Uh, so um, the bottom line uh, is that we need an integrated systems, kind of a, a blueprint for action at European level. Um, I would say less uh, process oriented. Uh, and much more objective oriented. So to fix objective and to be able to reach them in a given time, you know, to uh, kind of give the pace of the advancement. But the most important point for us that a clear focus has to be on operational requirement. What I mean is uh, the focus has to be on the customer need and the customer desires. Because if we can produce exactly what the customer uh, want, obviously with, a, with an eye on innovation, innovative systems, uh, introducing uh, new concept, uh, new ideas, we will even support the industry in developing innovative products. And uh, uh, in this way, industry will be more competitive. That's thank, it. Thank you very much. Let's ask industry how they respond or how your statements resonate with them. Let's start with Mr. Bouvier. How does the European Defence Fund uh, impact the demand and offer regarding military equipment on the EU defence market? I mean, you are one of the big players in this field. So, may I share some further views about the competition before I answer your question, trying to keep in my three minutes uh, slot. Uh, competition is not an objective in itself. Competition is, is a way to achieve a target. And this target is affordability, competitiveness, innovation, and proximity, intimacy with, with the customer. And so these are the objectives of uh, any competition. And to reach these uh, objectives, there are different ways which could be combined or which could be to a certain extent uh, contradicting or opposing each other. There is uh, the necessity to have the critical mass. If uh, you don't have the critical mass in terms of technology, in terms of industrial capabilities, whatever the competition you put in place, you don't have the right product. You need also to have the objective which is well shared among us of cooperation. And cooperation and competition are not easy to manage and to, to combine because cooperation takes a long time, maybe too much a long time, long time to, uh, to, be, uh, 
to be organized uh, with, the, uh, with the customers and uh, with the industry. So I think uh, the question of competition, critical mass, innovation, affordability, competitiveness is a very complex question, uh, which has to be, in my view, addressed uh, case by case. In some, uh, some activities, we need to have the critical mass, and critical mass could be achieved through a certain competition. In, in other situations, it is not the case. So this was uh, on my uh, three-minute slot. Uh, EDF. So I think we all agree that uh, we need a political vision. We all agree we need a budget. But there is something that uh, I would like to, to share with you, which is, I would say, a very... Uh, pragmatic and operational experience about the process. And then maybe it will be seen a bit as a paradox that the industry is uh, really uh, explaining and sharing what is the value of the process itself. So I'm not uh, here to claim for additional budgets, but uh, to share how this process has been extremely efficient. And I will take uh, the example of uh, FMCT, so the uh, mid-sized uh, cargo, tactical uh, cargo which uh, used to be, in the previous uh, sequence, a PESCO project. Now we have a call. It's an uh, EDF uh, project. So what have we done? Uh, we meaning uh, different countries, the armed forces, the national armament directors, the industry, small uh, companies, larger, uh, larger companies. What we have done? We have started, uh, at the beginning, it was just a sort of brainstorm with our countries, when it was at the PESCO stage. We are starting to think about what could be a product, what could be the operational requirement, what could be the right trade-off between a performance and affordability. And then we have had a lot of discussion between our air forces, which obviously are pushing for something more affordable, short-term, less risk, and uh, our armament directorates, which normally are pushing for more technology, more sophistication. And then we have uh, used this uh, PESCO first uh, stage to trigger this debate. Then we have uh, had the second stage and the call uh, that uh, we'll respond to end of, uh, end of November. And uh, I would like really to highlight how much this process has delivered value as a process itself. We have a deadline. Uh, in difference, uh, it's not so frequent to have a deadline. When we uh, sell commercial aircraft, there is a deadline. In defense, is not obvious. Uh, we know how long it takes for national uh, uh, countries to uh, member states to, uh, to get a maturity of requirements and to also to set up a budget and to discuss the budget. So we have a deadline, a deadline for the first phase, but the deadline. Uh, and uh, the value of a deadline is that everybody is aligned. And uh, I like the term you have used, which is synchronization. A deadline is the best way to synchronize all the players. And we have uh, also something that... Uh, I have to confess, at the beginning when uh, I was uh, with the MBDA, uh, this is my... <laughs> okay, so, give me, give me 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I remember when I was MBDA, at the beginning, I have to confess, uh, we, we need to have a very large European team. It's, uh, it's very difficult, it's not uh, efficient. It was a sort of, uh, of obligation. And then, step by step, we have understood uh, that we need to... Uh, make a necessity, virtue out of necessity, and this was seen as an advantage, as an advantage. And so when we have been working between the PESCO and the EDF for this call on the FMTC, the NGRT is exactly the same. Uh, we have seen the virtue of synchronization deadline, we have seen the benefits of uh, being obliged, and then this was an advantage to build up a very large European team. And the process itself has a value, and this is what I wanted to share with you this morning. Thank you very much. So, um, we are still on the industry side. Um, Mr. Matei, um, do we need more European cooperation at both government and industry level, avoiding the high opportunity costs? And you as a rather small player in the, in the market, it would be interesting to hear your views. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I think that uh, if uh, we are going to succeed uh, with repetition, probably we are going to repeat, and, 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 and this time we will succeed. Um, I think yes, I mean, I could say yes and stop, but <laughs> let me elaborate a little bit. Um, first of all, um, uh, I mean, 
there's been a dramatic change uh, in the past months uh, towards mm -hmm. uh, uh, Europeans' defense and security, and that's uh, extremely positive. I think an uh, increase of uh, spending uh, of, the, of the different uh, member states um, will define how is the shape of the industry in the future, and that's very important. If clients are important in general for corporations, in defense, that's even more important. So how we spend the money uh, that we are going to invest in the in the in, in these future years will define the sovereignty of Europe and also the shape of our industry. Very clear, as as the panel said, uh, uh, we cannot do it alone. So each uh, uh, member state cannot do it alone, and for that we need clear joint programming at member state and cooperation between the industry. Uh, and I think I think we need to strengthen the cooperation. Cooperation started maybe in many programs uh, 20 years ago, uh, programs we all know across Europe. But I think we need a second level of more profound cooperation between the member states and also the corporations uh, to be able to achieve what we will need to achieve, uh, uh, I mean, to have this sovereignty. I think also this cooperation uh, needs, needs to be strengthened because um, well, the, the products and the programs of today have uh, much more uh, uh, R&D expenditure than we could see in the past. So the procurement, uh, the procurement cost, because of the complexity of the products we are going to see in the future, mean higher R&D, and that means that we need to involve uh, more people, more countries, and more talent, and we should not forget that because uh, I mean, talent, talent is a scarcity today, and we, if we don't spread more, we will not get enough talent to, the, to develop uh, the products, and that's cooperation. I think uh, that we, are, uh, um, we have several tools in Europe for that, uh, very clearly, the European Defense Fund and some other tools that need to be strengthened uh, to reinforce the cooperation, also to reinforce competitiveness. We need to take into account that the number of units we do at the European level are not the number of units that other of our competitors do, so unit cost is something that we, we all, always need to challenge, but we need to, to be aware of that. And I think uh, the situation which we, we, we are today is, is an opportunity uh, for, for the member states uh, to have uh, joint, uh, um, I mean, for joint uh, programming, uh, for, for joint needs and the industries uh, to have uh, also the capability to have uh, from the design of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the new programs the possibility to cooperate together. So I think, yes, I think we have the momentum is there. Uh, the investment will shape the industry. And I think we need the cooperation because uh, we are not prepared, <coughs> because probably of lack of investments in the past uh, years in Europe, we are not prepared if we, do, uh, we, if we don't cooperate. And for that, obviously, the Commission and all the, the, um, the instruments that uh, are being uh, in place and are reinforced are, are, are key. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I'm sitting here biting my nails, not just for the time, but you all say so many interesting things that I would like as a journalist to dig into it, but I'm bound to this panel here, so I apologize for that. So last but not least here on the first round, um, Pascal. Creating a unified and efficient cooperation within Europe on defense is a challenge, as we know it, as we heard it. Where do you and Ria see the largest challenges today? And I'm quite sure you want to repeat something what was said already. Well, instead of repeating and, and, and agreeing on everything what I said, there is a point where I would like to insist is the, the timing aspect, the, the time to execution. Uh, because we, I mean, from an industry perspective, we have enjoyed, all the industries here in the room, we have enjoyed uh, excellent support from EU in the past for endorsing a lot of innovation, uh, getting ready for being operational and respond to needs uh, that the community and the European uh, defense would, would require. But now we are in a situation of urgency, and uh, so we need to get to the point uh, funds are there, uh, the willingness is there uh, to, to motivate uh, a common objective and a common procurement uh, towards a defense uh, objective at European level, 
Uh, I really believe that the, the industries of this world and, uh, and in Europe are ready to, to, to take the step, uh, but we need to really uh, simplify and, and have a, a rapid decision-making. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about efficient processes. Uh, they could be even more uh, efficient, uh, I believe. And we are in a time now that, um, from a society perspective, the companies do not turn themselves as a supplier anymore. I mean, it's time for them to become a partner to the European defense and act as a partner uh, in order to roll out a common defense, uh, defense plan uh, and be ready to act rapidly, uh, implement the innovation which have been endorsed uh, through the, the, the research and development project that, that, that you mentioned, but which are now mature enough uh, to get to an operational point. We don't need research anymore at this stage. We need it for the long term, but we have an operational need, which is now, and we need uh, fast decision making and implementation now. And this is something that, uh, from a real perspective, but I think from a, an industry perspective, we really need to 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 see uh, moving. And we would very welcome that, and we welcome, of course, all the initiatives which are taken, which obviously go into that direction. Uh, with the short-term uh, funding mechanism which have been putting mm -hmm. in place, which is really a reflection of that urgency to, to act. Thank you. I'm not sure that I heard before the wording efficient processes. I heard successful processes, but efficient was missing, so I'm not sure. I have to check the recording if, you, <laughs> if, if that was right. said. Hmm. However, hmm. Um, we are moving on to the second round, and that is around the EDA report. The Commission and the European Defence Agency have analysed the defence investment gaps, and it was said earlier on as well. In that context, um, the EDA has presented the, to the Member States an analysis of investment gaps to be filled in the short, medium and long term, along these three lines of actions. First, to be prepared. Second, to augment existing forces and capabilities. And third, to re reinforce and modernize capabilities based on EU agreed capability priorities and informed by CARD. So, most urgent capabilities gaps, repl replenish stockpiles, replace, and reinforce. So, how can you deliver what is needed? Let's start with you, Ignacio. So, how. Uh... I think, uh, coming back to my points, uh, uh, we need uh, a, a strong uh, investment plan. I mean, uh, taking into account that uh, CAPEX has not been uh, something we've been doing in the, in the past years. Coming back to your words, R&D is, uh, is uh, I think we have the tools, we have the instruments. Uh, we need it, it will be the future, but uh, we need to, to look into the short-term needs uh, we need uh, to invest in capabilities today to deliver, uh, and uh, so capex investment short term to be able to uh, to deliver is what we need to do. I mean, uh, uh, linking to that, um, I mean to have a fragmented industry. Coming back to the point I make, with uh, a small number of units, looking into uh, mainly local needs rather than uh, more cross-border European needs. Um, which is natural because it's the way we've been acting for, for many years. Is something that we need to have a second thought and look above that. And, and, uh, and we need also to think that we cannot afford to have so many programs. We need to concentrate because we don't have the capability to deliver so many programs because we need many more people and many more capacity that, that we have. Uh, in, in. So when I drill it down, the money is there. I mean, there's these uh, 1.2 billion uh, euros on, on the table. Um, you would have the capacity if there wouldn't be the shortage of talents. Is that summarized correctly? Well, I think, uh, uh, I mean, to uh, shortage of talents clearly, but also we need to invest more to have the capacity. Okay. And also, uh, uh, I mean, supply chain is an issue which uh, we, we all need to try to address because uh, we, we, we shouldn't underestimate uh, uh, the constraints of the supply chain. Companies, 
uh, smaller companies, even that smaller than us, as we, we, you said you are small, but on, are smaller than us, that don't have no the talent, no the capability to invest, which uh, have not invested in, in, in the past years, so, so they need to come back and speed investments. I'm, I'm aware that there are many companies much smaller than you. I mean, talking about a three billion euro company at significant size. So, Pascal, let's talk about reinforce in but, that context. Yeah, but to, to, for us, the, the, the main gap that we, that we see today, uh, and, and Timo Pesonen talked about that in the previous session, is really about the cybersecurity capability in terms of defense. Um, so, th there are initiatives, good initiatives taken in different countries uh, in order to create uh, cyber armed forces. Um, we really need now to go to the next step, make sure that at European level we have a unified and consistent uh, cyber capability, which is not only about defense, uh, which which also be uh, included and encompassing the, the capability, of, capability of cyber intelligence, cyber assessment, uh, cyber awareness of the people and the society at, uh, at, uh, at European level, cyber surveillance, but also cyber attack capabilities. Because if we, want, if we don't want to be attacked, we have to be able to counter attack if we are facing uh, uh, those kind of situations. Uh, so this is clearly as, as part of the objective of, of several nations in Europe, uh, but there is a challenge and a gap uh, which is there to encompass a unified capability from a European standpoint in cybersecurity because the guys out there act as a big nation as well and have a critical mass that today we don't have from an a, from a aggregated perspective. Um, and so from, from a real at perspective, we have kind of anticipated that. Uh, we have created and investing, invested into a, a cybersecurity center of excellence for Europe at the service of Europe, which will be installed in, in Belgium, which is being built as we speak, uh, and that we intend to position and to make the step and walk the talk to put it at the service of, of Europe and, and uh, the interest of the European uh, defense. So this is a, a proactive action that we have taken, uh, and we hope that this will foster the collaboration with other cyber industries and cyber armed forces for the best of uh, the, the interest of, of Europe, also stimulating the innovation uh, that has been addressed by different European initiatives, uh, from the cybersecurity of today, but the cybersecurity of tomorrow as well, like the quantum technology, uh, same thing. We have to make it operational now. Uh, the time of research has passed. We, are not, we cannot afford to still be there. We have to make it operational from all the axes that, uh, that I mentioned. And this is really the, the, the late motive of this <coughs> initiative. And this is the, the, the direction that uh, we will take uh, at the REA Group for stimulating a, a European interest. As we are both ex-SAS, uh, I think you are pleased as I am to see the signature of Eagle One as a quantum satellite, so we are on the right way. But as a good European, what really has a bit, bitter taste for me is when you talk about cyber surveillance. Maybe it's just me, but it does not resonate well with me. Moving on, um, Mr. Bouvier, um, how can you, how can Airbus deliver what is needed? in this three minutes, of course. <laughs> so, uh, I don't think I have said that the EDF process is the most efficient. I'm sure there are some room <coughs> for improvement. My point was to say that the process has a huge value in itself. Uh, so, how to deliver? First, to deliver, we need uh, technology. We are investing in technology, but what we need even more important, because this is uh, just our strength, this is our value, this is the technology of tomorrow. What uh, we need is to attract human resources. Mm. We need to attract the best engineers. We need to uh, attract uh, the ones who are not necessarily motivated to join uh, the defense uh, industry. And this is a discussion we have started uh, this, uh, this morning, which is not a new discussion, but which is at the core of the uh, long-term uh, success of the uh, defense industry in, uh, in Europe. But uh, we are not uh, just regaining attractivity, but uh, we are regaining legitimacy. And legitimacy is not just 
to fight against ideas like Ecolabel to say, no, we are not true, you are going too far, but to rebuild the legitimacy. And to rebuild the legitimacy is more, uh, say, long-term vision than just to be defensive on a number of initiatives that, uh, unfortunately, we have seen developing in, uh, here in, uh, in Brussels. And to rebuild the legitimacy is to rebuild the purpose of the defense industry. And the purpose of the defense industry is so close to the purpose of defense itself that it cannot be disconnected. So when you attack the defense industry, you attack defense. When you attack the defense, you also attack the defense industry, which is the most uh, obvious short-term target. And this is why we need to, to understand that uh, uh, we should not uh, disconnect uh, the long-term strategy, the uh, defense posture of uh, Europe, the defense strategy of our different countries, and the defense industry, which is a critical contribution to the defense strategy. And once this is understood, once this is communicated and shared at the highest political level and shared with our public opinions, with an S, public opinions in the different countries, then we rebuild the legitimacy. This is what we need to do. So the so time is now. I mean, we have all the ingredients on the table. Even a bit of you, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Moving on to um, the colleagues from the institution. So how can EU security's most, most urgent needed capabilities. So, Mr. Bouchoy, um, do you see other steps to be taken to ensure greater integration and cooperation in the defense domain at the EU level, given all the um, great programs that were mentioned before? Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, the logic of these initiatives is to foster cooperation, to improve the cooperation, to avoid duplication, to avoid uh, or to reduce fragmentation and to incentivize uh, companies to work uh, together and member states also. This was of the main logic of uh, European Defense Fund. Uh, of course, uh, beside the fact that uh, we want to uh, uh, support uh, innovative ideas, innovative projects, and should do it uh, uh, jointly. Uh, at the EU level, of course, the money available are not comparable with what member states, uh, even until now with the low spending, uh, invested and what th they are prepared to invest. Clearly, the most important part are the budgets of the member states. But with these common projects that could be improved as framework, uh, as Mr. Bouvier mentioned, but of course they are extremely welcomed, uh, we could uh, at least uh, trigger this uh, joint uh, cooperation. Now we have this short-term instrument, of course it's 500 million, it's nothing compared with the big needs, but it's a lot as an initiative uh, in order to uh, uh, organize uh, our uh, in industries to, uh, to work together and also to look to the most urgent uh, issues. And what we are waiting now, and the uh, European Commission uh, uh, committed to this, is to see the regulation for European Defense Investment Program. This will be the logic uh, following of this short-term instrument. Of course, uh, this, I believe, will uh, remain limited if we compare with the needs, the big needs, but uh, this will be the anchor for uh, uh, joint procurement and develop projects of high interest for the security of uh, European Union. And I understand uh, uh, we should concentrate on those areas and those projects where no, members, no single member state could uh, work alone or could deliver alone. And this will be a step in the right direction in order to, to, to increase uh, uh, cooperation. And with this cooperation, of course, uh, uh, better innovation will uh, arise, better coordination and uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, as I'm seeing now uh, uh, the mood in the European Parliament and the interest and the support, f at least from the European Parliament, the political support will be, will be maximum. What uh, we have now is a big challenge, as I understand, from uh, the companies and from the uh, extraordinary experts that you gather today here, uh, high-level uh, representative of uh, uh, extraordinary European companies, 
now the challenge is not anymore the political will, it's not anymore the financing uh, from the member states level or even from European level. But now we have the challenge of uh, being ready to do it, having the right human resources, uh, being protected from the cybersecurity uh, part, and how we can uh, fast uh, expand our uh, industrial and capability base, because we need uh, uh, the right human resources, as I said, and of course the, uh, the right technologies in order to, to deliver the expectations. Uh, and of course, let's see with the, maybe the economic crisis that uh, we'll have to face in the coming two, three years, if uh, what was now committed uh, as projects for investment will remain at this level. But I'm afraid uh, the tragic events in Ukraine will continue. We see an exacerbation these days, so member states uh, will be ready to invest to protect uh, our democracies, our uh, principles, and for this we need uh, our uh, European industry, defense industry. Thank you very much. Um, I was, was just about to say, it sounds for me all nice and all positive uh, until your last statement. So, but thanks for getting us back on the ground, um, what we can expect the next year. Mr. Abosi, EDIRPA, whoever comes up with this abbreviation. <laughs> However, <laughs> it's paving the way for the European Defense Investment Program regulation. What can be expected from this new regulation? And will the EDIP regulation set a framework for long procurement, on the, uh, for joint procurement on the long term? Yeah. So uh, many things have been said which we could discuss for hours, but to, to keep it very short, uh, first I'd like to rebound on a couple of things that uh, Antoine said. It's all about process, absolutely clear. Uh, this is about, I mean, of course we have to produce tangible results, we have to, you know, use taxpayers' money rightly, but it's all about creating that habit of cooperation at uh, MOD level, at member states level, and we see this happening. We see, you know, member states speaking over the phone, calling each other when it comes to defining the specific, you know, the, the, the functional requirements that we translate into course proposals. Uh, so that process is precious. It, it will take time. It's not in a perfect process. There, there will be setbacks, but this is about creating that habit of cooperating and speaking to, to each other. But timing, of course, is of the essence. And, uh, and I think we need to combine and to manage different time horizons. We have to look at really the horizon, so the, the programming function in the long run. We have to actually uh, set, I mean, create, plant the seeds of technologies and systems that we will have you know, available tomorrow for acquisition, but not, not uh, the, the, in the next two months, that's the EDF. But we also have this sense of urgency in, in, in the light of uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine. And that's uh, EDIRPA, the, the famous and pronounceable EDIRPA. This is, I think, the, the tangible proof that we can also act very swiftly. There was the European Council request in, on March to actually evaluate the defense gaps, uh, coming up with uh, worrying uh, results when it comes to the analysis produced by the Commission in May. In July, we uh, adopted that, that proposal for regulation enabling the urgent procurement of uh, whatever member state needs to replenish their stocks. Uh, this is now discussed in Council. In council. Uh, soon in Parliament, we are very much uh, indeed uh, calling up all the, I mean, the quality status to, to really uh, go as fast as can be, yeah. because we need that now. And so, so, you know, in four months, we are basically uh, from the diagnosis to the instruments, and, and as we speak, and, and Stefano knows that very well because we are basically working on that every day together, we are now really into, uh, let's say, collecting and, and uh, putting together the, the most urgent needs of the member states in terms of uh, you know, what they need to replenish the stocks. And hopefully, uh, this will create you know, um, an emulation for member states to jointly purchase what they need um, to, uh, to replenish the stocks and also to acquire the, the capabilities or even you know, ammunition that, that they need to be up to the, to the challenge. So um, process is, uh, is the, the real thing, but time is of the essence. And again, the EDIRPA <coughs> is only meant to be, let's say, well, first, uh, one of very, uh, very useful instrument to actually help to replenish the stocks in a concerted manner, because again, if we are dispersing the effort, it, there is simply no point. Some member states, possibly the most exposed, will not be served, so it's about deconflicting the needs. 
seeing uh, how the industry can actually ramp up its effort. So we are trying to, 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 to match make a bit, um, of course, with our projects to the procurement rules. But these are the needs that member states have. Mm -hmm. This is the way they can express them together. And this is how we can actually incentivize for the industry to respond to those needs. European industry, because if we want to be consistent in time, we have to use that opportunity to reinforce the EU industrial base so that we are mitigating dependencies of, of, of the long run. But I stop here. I've spoken too much already. Thank you very, very much. And um, my takeaway already is process is good. Process in the defense sector is good. And I see this um, consensus between the industry and, and, the, um, and the commission. So, um, Stefano, um, Mr. Kond, so your directorate uh, also led the work on the review of the capability development plan. So, and I would like to stress one word uh, which we haven't heard, are the efficient joint programming and procurement. What would be an efficient joint programming and procurement look like? And you can use process again, so that's fine with me. <laughs> no, uh, you can have an efficient system when you reach the target and uh, following a process. So, I mean, uh, we have to have both efficiency and efficacy. Uh, in the past, especially because we were at the beginning of developing some tools that we had, like uh, the, the card, the payscope, you know, these are unbelievably valuable uh, tools that we have. Uh, they give us the possibility to assess the landscape of defense at European level. We know we have a basket of knowledge about what is the needs, what are the plans of all the member states, you know, uh, that is uh, very wide and very deep in terms of knowledge. Uh, with the NIP, we have even the, 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 the National Implementation Plan for the PESCO. We do have even an outlook of what the member states are doing. And we keep this process continuously updated. So uh, let me say that uh, the, the basket of knowledge is very wide as agency. And we did that for the first two cycles after the, the, the creation of these tools to create this knowledge and this competence uh, because you need to understand you know, what are the needs, the requirement, and everything else. Um, we, we extended this work in the short term within the, the Joint Defense uh, Task Force for the procurement in the short term. And we were able even to acquire the short term requirement, assess, uh, organize, streamline, put the member state interested together to discuss about that, what it was possible, not possible. So let me say that uh, right now we have a, a very sound foundation to move on um, in the task force with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, let's say, probing industries in terms of what they can be on the supply side, uh, the, the response. Or in our term, how to set up the instruments that are needed to do really joint procurement. Because joint procurement doesn't happen by itself. Uh, like cooperation, <coughs> it comes because uh, it, it comes after a process. And the first process is uh, to transform cooperative opportunities that we have seen in, in the exercise so far into real projects. Mm. And that is a time-consuming process because every nation has different legislation. Uh, every nation has different limits. Every nation has obviously their own interest. And you have to listen, compound, and prepare the ground to be able to aggregate those countries together into a joint project to achieve, uh, you know, something. Uh, the second element uh, is uh, what kind of entities have to do this joint procurement, you know? Uh, well, uh, at European level, I mean, full European Union uh, entities, we don't have too many entities possible. Yes, there is OCAR, but it's not really a full European Union entities, but it still have potential to evolve. Uh, obviously, we don't want to, or we can use even an, an SPA, but it's a NATO agency, so, you know, it does have other rules and other possibilities, still is a possibility. We were even exploring the possibility to have member state uh, 
national armament directorates to take charge of this doing this procurement. Uh, but we have seen that many countries have leg legislation that does not allow that. They need to go with an international organization. And finally, may say, uh, I mean, there is even EDA, they can do the job. Uh, but uh, probably does not have the size of full, full joint procurement of uh, long term or big items. But it can be very much uh, uh, useful for the short term procurement because most of the time we're talking about replenishment of stocks. And replenishment of stocks is, uh, is, quite, is quite faster and, or uh, simpler in terms of requirement. And we can even offer some. Uh, uh, possibility of facilitating uh, an incentives like, for example, the VAT exemption that we can have uh, through our CUTB programs with industry. So it's something very, very much important. And this is for the short term. Uh, let me conclude telling what are the most important relevant elements if you want to have an effective joint procurement in the long term. And is the necessity to harmonize with member state requirements financial perspective because member states can have the money allocated in different time frames and that doesn't work very well in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, collaborative programs or collaborative joint projects. And especially uh, IOC and FOC operational requirement. What I mean is timing. Because if you need something in two years, you cannot join a program that uh, deliver in 10 years. Or if you need something in 20 years, you cannot join a program that deliver in five years. So there is a need even for timing. These three elements are, uh, are very much important. On the contrary, on practicalities, you're not going to achieve anything. So let me say that if you want to have really joint procurement, sooner or later, we will have to find a, a way to have joint programming at European level. And I will close there. That's wonderful. So we see on the screen here already the next session is um, announced, but hey, I'm the session head, so we take the liberty here. For one question from the audience, if there is a burning one over there, Yes, I have two burning questions. Brooks Tigner, <laughs> Jane's Defense Weekly. And I'm going to read very carefully here from my computer. I've crafted these questions. Industry claims that they are supply chain integrators. Um, yes, that's true, but these chains are overwhelmingly national. They have a few non-national, but not nearly enough. So industry to you, how is this going to change in the future? Winners and losers. Second question for our policymakers. Uh, same question on joint procurement. NATO has sponsored that for years among the allies with absolutely no impact on the DTIB, mainly because this stuff is purchased American, thus no possibility for infighting among the Europeans. So question, will Iderpa award joint procurement contracts to single suppliers, thus creating losers, or will you have to inefficiently spread the largesse of each contract among the member states, a little for Germany, a little for France, etc., thus having no impact on the DTIB. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Couple of questions, um, and we, I leave it to you to take a short element out of it. Who wants to give it an attempt to answer this very complex one? Also. Maybe on, on Ediapa and how the drone procurement is meant to, to happen. We are not prescriptors here. I mean, I want to be very clear. And of course, this is without prejudice to the final shape of the, of the instrument because it is being negotiated by, by the co-legislators. But what we want is to incentivize the approach. Joint procurement makes sense in, in also respects, deconflicting the needs, uh, getting more indeed smart, uh, to, smarter together. But we are not saying you need to buy the, I mean, we're not prescripting prescribing either what to be purchased. We're not prescribing who should purchase on behalf of whom. We are just saying, guys, if you think it is a good idea and we think it is to actually get together to procure the most urgent thing so that industry has more um, also predictability in terms, in terms of what is coming, in terms of ramping up you know, the, the manufacturing capacity, then go for it. Then it's for you to decide what to buy, it's for you to decide who will be the procurement agent, but if you go for it, if you present us a plan that we are able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to actually validate, then we will actually compensate, and even, I would dare say, overcompensate the cost of 
uh, the cooperation because it, it, it is costly to cooperate, to go together, but it's smarter. So we want to compensate for the cost. And let's see uh, what, what comes out of that pilot. And then, of course, the, the, um, the real objective, the steady state objective, is the famous EDIP, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bouchard re referred to it, where we want to be even more ambitious, but we will learn from, uh, from the first, let's say, lessons of the EDIRPA, and that's why we are staggering the approach. Let's see where we land on EDIRPA, and once this is clear, then we will actually propose the, the EDIP, the more steady state, more ambitious instrument. Thank you very much. Um, and I see a consensus here on the, on the panel, what is uh, very nice to see. I don't want to close the session without giving you the chance for the last famous 30 second, 60 second, even we are still over time, um, 60 seconds that you want to address to our audience, to our listeners or online. Stefano, would you like to start? I will be very, very brief. You know, my final consideration is really a message. Uh, we know that we are all in a hurry to procure what is needed in the short term. So many countries go in uh, uh, to buy off the shelf whatever they have because the, the, the pressure of the situation, international security, is a very big concern. So my, my, my only message is uh, let's not lose uh, the long-term perspective. Yeah. What we are doing in the next uh, six months, uh, one year, it will have an impact in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Both in terms of the system we are going to achieve, sometimes what is available is not probably, is a compromise due to the situation, it's not probably optimized to what you really need. And second, it will uh, impede in a certain way the possibility to uh, collaborative opportunity be developed in terms of uh, uh, putting together to develop something for the next generation. So my, my suggestion, I know that uh, there is a, a, an urgency, but don't lose the long-term perspective uh, for the defense acquisition. Wise words. Mr. Bouchoy. We are facing now uh, extremely challenging, uh, difficult, tragic, <clears throat> times clearly, but in the same time uh, we have the opportunity first to strengthen visibly, significantly our uh, uh, defense industry base in Europe, to incentivize uh, our companies, uh, big uh, players, big companies, uh, reputed companies, but also SMEs, they are also extremely important for European Parliament and European Commission to become more innovative, to collaborate together, to work better together, to be more competitive even worldwide. So let's not lose this momentum. Thank you very much. Mr. Abou. Well, I mean, what we aimed at is competitiveness in the long run. So, I mean, it was said a number of times, we need a long-term vision and ambition. We need a course, but we need to get, to, we need to get there through competition because we want the, the, the best players to be the, the ones delivering the solutions. And this is a huge challenge. Let's not, you know, ignore that. Uh, the, 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 uh, the ambition to combine the continuity of the effort on a given course with the competition and with the competition that actually informs, you know, many of the tools that, that we are deploying at EU level, getting to that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit squaring the circle. And we have to face that. It will be very uh, challenging to get to that uh, fine balance and this is, I think, the core of what we need to achieve. Not an easy task, but precisely that's why it's not an easy task that we need to, uh, to actually uh, deliver it. Thank you. So now the uh, last what, word just, or just remark maybe a, from, a the, from the industry. From, Pascal, from, yeah, please. Yeah, from an ind industry perspective, I think, uh, of course, and it's a very important point, we will always combine the short term and the, and the, and, and the long term in terms of keeping the pace for innovation. Uh, the message I gave at the beginning is that now, I think now industries are ready to put strengths together in order to face the, the urgency uh, that, we are, that we are dealing with now. In terms of joint procurement, there are best practices which are all there, which have been already proven in the space industry, for example. Joint procurement has been, has been done in, at European Space Agency, for example, for, for years. We have techniques to encompass these uh, requirements there. Uh, so maybe we can leverage uh, from, from there as well uh, on the best practices and, and extrapolate that in a defense, in a defense area. Learning from other sectors. That sounds interesting. We should look into that. 
Mr. Vauvier. May I come back one second on competition? <laughs> so the question is, which is uh, the relevant market? Not just the European market. We are competing against uh, the US, Israeli, a number of uh, uh, defense uh, companies on export markets. So I think the, the question of competition is not just within our uh, EU perimeter, it's also to be uh, addressed through the global market. And global market is, uh, once again, critical mass. And when we compete against the US uh, outside of Europe, we have to deliver affordability, we have to deliver innovation, we have to deliver performance. <coughs> Then this question of competition, in my view, has to be a bit, uh, a bit enlarged. So a recommendation, I think we have to stick to the uh, investment uh, gap analysis, which has been done. All the principles, the good principles are in this, uh, in this communication. The right balance between uh, short term and long term, and not just the balance short term, long term, but the continuum short term, medium term, long term, and to have a roadmap This is extremely important. Uh, to understand that uh, anything which is, uh, could be seen just as a procurement actually is also an industrial policy. There is no procurement policy without an uh, industrial policy, and the two have to be managed uh, together. And uh, the third point that uh, we have seen on, the, on this communication is the uh, uh, importance of duality. So defense, what is just as a core of defense, sovereignty and the importance of, uh, of duality. And I think we have all the ingredients in this uh, investment uh, gap analysis. So, thank you very much. Last words from, from your end. Two seconds. Uh, don't for, I think we should not forget that we are behind on technology. And the programs we, learn, we launch today uh, on technology will, uh, will be the future of, uh, of Europe. And we, th we should speed on those, on those programs, on launching those programs. And we should not forget that we have in the pipeline technology programs and cooperation programs, like, like for example, ESCAF, that uh, are there to be launched. So we should speed on that. Thank you very much. As the producers are getting nervous here and showing me a time out, please uh, um, welcome, uh, uh, no, uh, join me here in a round of applause for this fantastic panel. Thank you very much for your time. Portugal is a country of dreamers whose dreams never cease, of explorers who aspire to reach further. Ferdinand Magellan's circumnavigation is matched by man's arrival on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Portugal was at the forefront of the evolution of astronomy and navigation instruments, connecting us deeper to the planet we inhabit. Today, space is what motivates us, and exploring it gives us technology that we use daily in schools, agriculture, civil protection services, and many others. Space is in our aspirations. Space is what unites us, and at the Portuguese Space Agency, we want to make Portugal an actor of change, promote space as the home we all belong to, one we must protect. The oceans, 70% of our planet Earth, are a precious resource that now, more than ever, we must take care of. The Atlantic Constellation will allow us to comprehend, preserve and enjoy the Atlantic, promoting sustainability and knowledge, bringing Portugal closer to many other nations with their roots in the sea. The Digital Planet supports the creation of a multi-platform of Earth observation data. Creating an ecosystem of connectivity through quantum technology will complement global growth by contributing to the development of the Atlantic and the outermost regions. We want to lead innovation using projects such as the Santa Maria Spaceport and Space Rider in Azores. We promote a scientific culture based on technology, research and development among young people. In 2020, we challenged university students to launch rockets in Portugal in the first European competition of its kind, the European Rocketry Challenge, EUROC, a competition with a future in Europe and the world. Since 2000, we have participated in missions of the European Space Agency, where we are increasingly present. Our contribution involves the sustainability of space operations, 
the cleaning up of our planet and of space, the knowledge of the universe we live in. There are several Portuguese involved in these missions. With our eyes set on space, we contribute to the country's development, creating jobs and strengthening diplomatic ties. As explorers, we have new goals. By exploring other galaxies, we try to reach the sun. This is only the beginning. Our work and commitment will not stop. On the contrary, Portugal Space wants to reduce the space between us for the benefit of all. We create bridges, promote scientific research, innovation, technological advances. We unite sectors. We bring worlds closer together. We recover the spirit of the explorers, sharpen curiosity and the impetus to go beyond. We make space your space, our space, in a shared dream.
Hello, Mr. Conde, could you hear me? Yes, um, I'm the, the sound engineer here for the event. Uh, I may have a little test with you. Could you speak? Yeah, it's very good. You have a, you seem to have a very good connection, so it should be working fine. Thanks. And you hear the event in the Zoom, right? Since the beginning. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Welcome back. Okay, I get the sign that you can hear me now. Um, please come in or take your seat for our third session here today. The EU space strategy for security and defense. The challenges of a crucial operational domain. And again, before we start, I'm asked Again, to encourage you to connect on slido.com and use the code EU Defense Security Conf. Also for Twitter, if you want to tweet about the session, use the hashtag EU Defense Security Conf. Good. In that session, it's quiet in the room. I have your attention. That is wonderful. In this session, we will explore the ever growing link between the space and defense domain. From a strategic and operational standpoint, while also focusing on dedicated applications, this session will also be an opportunity to take stock of the ongoing work on the EU space strategy for security and defense. My name is still Torsten Kreening, and I'm the publisher of Spacewatch.global and your host for this session that stands now between now and the lunch. So, Russia's anti-satellite missile test that took place last year in November 21. 
which has increased the risk of dangerous collisions in space by generating debris in various orbital shells. That shows very clearly space became, became the fifth warfighting domain declared even by NATO in November 2019, two years before that. Since 24th of February, talking about space in a military context in the space arena has become possible. The understanding for dual-use technologies from on-orbit maneuver capabilities to hyperspectral small satellite was growing. Space safety and security arrived on the highest political and corporate levels, as we can see here in this conference. We will try to learn about the status and the demands for the EU space strategy for defense and security. And from the EU institution, I welcome here Christoph Grudler, the vice chair of the Sky and Space Intergroup at the European Parliament, and Catherine Cavada, the director for innovation and outreach at DG Davis European, at the European Commission, and our, as a last minute replacement, uh, Patrick Sh Shatar Moulin, I hope it was correctly spelled, the deputy head of the Div Division Security Space and Defense at the European External Action Services. As we would like to um, see this dialogue between the institutions, the agency, and the industry, I also welcome here on the screen uh, Ricardo Conde, the president of the PT Space, the Portugal Space Agency. On the air, uh, Ricardo. And um, Alain, Alain Boris, the senior vice president, business development and political affairs, and member of the executive committee of OHBSE. So, in this case, I can say, lady and gentlemen, are a pleasure <laughs> to have you here. And we go online um, with our first question. So, Christoph, for a long time, the EU was more seen as a civil actor, not sector, as a civil actor in the space field. Is this predominance of the civilian sector still relevant today? Or are we just naive? <laughs> Sorry. It's a parallax mistake. No, no problem, not, not right. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for having um, invited me to today uh, as a member of the industry committee uh, and of the security and defense committee in the European Parliament. Uh, I really appreciate uh, this panel where we uh, will mix the two subjects, space, uh, and defense, because indeed for, for a long time uh, we didn't mix enough the, the two topics uh, at the EU level. Uh, our space program were mostly about civilian uses. For example, for air uh, observation with Copernicus, meteor meteorology uh, with uh, Emetsat, or positioning with, with Galileo. Uh, with that classic sentence, this program is under civilian control. And even when we try to incorporate uh, even the smallest dual use system, uh, like the Galileo PRS, for example, it was difficult to, to make it uh, accept. Uh, of course, uh, all of that uh, changed, unfortunately. Uh, because uh, aside the, the great uh, scientific possibilities offered by space, the strategic value of space activity should not be uh, neglected. Uh, and by uh, not taking into account uh, early, early enough the, the, the security and defense dimension, the EU didn't prepare for what we have today, a, a battle of technologies and information from space to help uh, our Ukrainian friends and protect our un union. Because to, to whom the Ukrainian asked for intelligence on space data, on, on satellite data, uh, the United States, not the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, let's be frank, we don't have today the, the capacities. Uh, so I'm convinced uh, that we, we should be more vocal on the security and defense dimension of the EU space policy. 
and it's getting better. Uh, 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 first with European Defence Fund, which invests in, in defence technologies with a space dimension. Uh, we also have Galileo's uh, PRS, I, I talked before, which is a great success. One of the best things we did for our EU strategic autonomy in space in the last uh, 15 years. We also have, of course, the EU Secure Connectivity Program, for which I'm the rapporteur for the European Parliament, and we will we'll vote on it uh, in our committee uh, on Thursday. Uh, for me, it is very important that this program reinforce the satellite capacities of the Union and its member states for governmental communications, but also for other non-communication uh, services like positioning, situation awareness, uh, or earth observation. And even in the limits of the current treaties, I am certain that we can go further in the defense dimension of the EU space policy. We need it uh, for today and tomorrow uh, challenges. I would maybe like to, to conclude uh, with a word on, on our strategic autonomy, uh, and in particular on our cooper cooperation. Of course, for our European defense, the EU should, should continue to work closely uh, in, in close cooperation with, uh, with NATO. But we should, do, uh, we should do that by building a real European pillar of NATO, I can say, uh, which is built uh, around a real European defense policy. And that should be true uh, as well for space defense. We should not only rely on the military space capacities of our NATO ally allies, uh, as we do it uh, very often today. Uh, Trump still exists, uh, and uh, the risk of his return uh, to power is not negligible. So it's time to get more serious about our EU security and defense in space. Thank you very much. Um, Patrick, space becomes an op operational military environment like, like uh, air, land, and sea, as we mentioned before. Does this mean that in the future we will see more permanent def de defense presence in orbit, operating in, in space space operations as well? And just to mention it also for, for you here on this panel, so please stick within the three-minute answer. That would be sure. wonderful. Otherwise, I have to use my high-tech here yeah, on my it. finger. Yeah, yeah, so. No, um, just in a... In a in a nutshell, we, are not, uh, we don't want that. The EU keeps promoting the, the peaceful use of space, and, and, we, and we try to prevent the weaponization of space. Uh, and we are very active, uh, my colleagues are very active in New York uh, uh, right now to, to participate in the discussion at the UN General Assembly, where the EU has an observer status, and to, and to promote uh, with our member states a common approach to, to, to the open ended working group, for instance, uh, to, prevent, uh, to, to promote uh, norms and rules of responsible behavior in outer space. So we, we through the diplomatic angle, we try to prevent this arm race to happen. At the same time, we are not naive, and we see the situation in our space. We see the risks, and we, and we, and we evolve our perception of space um, quite differently. It's not just a matter of competitiveness. It's not just a matter of promoting space services. It's also uh, us as victims victims of a denial of uh, space services. Uh, we, we have this example of what happened in, in, uh, with the wind turbines in Germany, where you have an attack, and it's, it, you could argue it's a cyber attack, but not really. It's, it's an attack on a space infrastructure, and it led to a disruption of wind turbines, an energy grid that has nothing to do with the conflict, or with the ongoing, at least it was not a target for, for, the, for, the, Russian, for the Russians. And, and we see that we are very dependent upon uh, space services, and we are not always aware of this dependency. And that is very much what we, we name, uh, why we name space as a new domain. Because we need, it's a new contested domain, as other uh, global commands, other contested domain. The strategic compass highlighted space as a new contested domain. And, 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 and we need to, uh, in, in first place, we need to be aware of our dependency. And it's not only about the space program. We are very proud of our space program that uh, Catherine is managing so well. And, and it's true that it's 
among the few assets that the EU really owns, and they can be victims of different kinds of aggressions. But I think we need to have a wider picture and consider any dependency on any service and try to understand what could be the result of us being under attack and whether we need to create a level playing field in this area. So I think it's very much a spirit of, of the space strategy for security and defense. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it's only a one-way street and we only uh, care about space from the defense perspective. We also very much would like to address uh, the I mean, more traditionally, what we, how space can support security and defense. And here, I mean, we, I would just want to quote one example also to say that we're not totally uh, doing nothing for, for Ukraine. I mean, we just uh, had the 30th anniversary of the EU Satellite Center. And, and uh, well, it's a curse of an intelligence agency, I suppose, but uh, Satsen is doing a lot for Ukraine uh, every day. And we, and we meet the Ukrainians quite often, and they're extremely happy with the type of geospatial intelligence support we do provide through the Satsen. And, and there are a lot of other ways to, to support. So um, we, we are also active, and we want to develop this dimension of how we can better connect, uh, and I think Catherine will say a word about it, how we want to better connect our space program to the security and defense needs. But the real um, challenge of the upcoming strategy for security and defense is how do we respond and how do we deter adversaries from targeting our space infrastructure, from targeting uh, Galileo, from targeting the Copernicus satellites, which are vital for, for monitoring climate change, or including for uh, targeting one of our infrastructure in our member states. We do not uh, establish so well the boundaries between what is the space program and our, what are the national components that are being supportive to the space program. So we need to see it from a slightly different perspective. And here, I see the ring, so I will stop. Uh, and here we, will, we need to, to, to think about the response and a coherent response from the Union as we do in other domains, in the domain of cyber, in the domain of hybrid. We need to, to foresee the mechanism to react in time. I will finish just one, one little example is that the statement from the U27 that we did after the Russian Assad came uh, four days after the event. So it was nice to keep the political momentum, as the US ambassador said, but we should have been more reactive. And that's also one of the challenges of the upcoming strategy, to, to increase our response time when confronted to a, to a threat in our space. Great. Thank you very much. So we call it usually the peaceful use of outer space. Catherine, um, we are here in a defense conference. Usually we meet on a space conference talking a bit about defense and security. Here we switch it. Um, so can you give us an overview of the dimension of space in the current defense and security European landscape? Where are we? Thank you, Torsten. Uh, for, first of for, all, for three I, minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will respect the three minutes. I know that your comments it was more for me. And thanks uh, for the invitation uh, as a space lady to be present uh, in the defense. So uh, after 25 years in this uh, field, uh, I feel honored, uh, proud and happy that finally the uh, European Union recognizes uh, the fact that space is a strategic domain. Uh, the power to navigate with Galileo, civil or PRS, uh, the power to observe with Copernicus, not only the civilian part but also uh, the security service and most probably the resilient one. And last but not least, the power to connect uh, with the secure connectivity. And it's so nice as European Commission to be next to the co-legislator in this uh, event, uh, will really uh, provide two major uh, uh, points uh, for the European Union. First of all, uh, we will enhance uh, our posture in the international arena. And this is more than important in this particular geopolitical uh, environment. And number two, we will provide the European Union with major geopolitical and geostrategic capability in order to become a security provider. Resilience is the key word for us, not only for our citizens, but for a number of our policies. So, uh, if we acknowledge in one second the added value of space in security and defense, what we have to do? First of all, talk less and act more. I know that the paper exercise is something that the European Commission and the institutions, they like, it's part of our DNA, but now, once the strategy will be there, we have to implement it. Then, we said it, it became a motto, but we have to make it a reality. We need to break the silos. 
I'm 25 years in this field. I am really generated to say civil system under civil control, but now I have to bring this civil system under civil control, able to serve in the way that defense people want their defense interest. And this is more than important. And last but not least, time is of essence. We don't have time. I said it several times, space and defense is a sprint. We have to hurry up if we want to be the first. If not, we will lose time, we will lose power. And under these considerations, these needs, and all these time parameters, together with EIS, we are elaborating a strategy, the so-called space strategy for defense and security, which has the ambition to give the contour, the political contour, but also all the activities that we need in order to implement it in four particular uh, fields. I will be very laconic. The first one is, uh, as Patrick said, the resilience. Even all the space assets are not immune for any attack. Not only the cyber attack, but we have also dependencies on technological issues, raw material, uh, takeover, a number of nightmares which we have to take into due consideration in order to increase the robustness of our systems. And then what we have to do, security framework, more than important. Standardization, we said it each and every time. We need to work seriously this time, and not only in Europe, but worldwide. And this is very important for our European industry to be the first to impose our standards worldwide. And avoid dependencies, something very important with concrete actions. I think that all our political masters, they are talking about strategic autonomy, and now it's time to make it a reality. Number two, we have to be able to respond in case that will be attacked, because this is part of our reality. No risk in space or no risk in defense doesn't exist. The one who will say it, it means that is not able to understand what is defense or what is space. So, what is important in this particular case? The information, a timely information, an accurate information, a robust information. Do we start from the scratch? My reply is no. We have already assets, we have already systems like the SST consortium, and we offer the, must, the more than we can. Do we have to stay there? The reply is also no, and definitely no. We have to run the last mile, and we have to create a, a, a domain of space awareness within the European Union, uh, with uh, dedicated sensors, with dedicated features, with monitoring, with intelligence. And once again, the intelligence is something that we need in order to attribute the risk and be in a position to protect it as much as we can. Third, and I know that I will run, the third one is increase the capability. You know me. I need only one more minute. Increase the space capabilities in research, uh, and we have a number of elements over there. And I will conclude with the fourth and last, but very important, the global partnership. Space is not limited in Europe. It's a global actor, and we have to act as a global actor. Three key words. We need a safe, a secure, and a sustainable space. So just that for the European Commission, beginning of 2023, and then plenty of time to discuss with the actors. Absolutely. Thank you, and sorry of... Uh, Thank you very much, and it were exactly three minutes. So yeah. keep it worth it. For the it first time in my life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On time. Ricardo, over to you. I hope you can hear us. Yeah, absolutely, Torsten. Good phone. morning. Good morning to everyone. Come on. So um, we would like to have your response. Uh, how does this statement resonate with you? I mean, particular in space, we talked about it. Can Europe ensure its autonomy? in medium term, reducing the external dependence on some of the elements. And I'm quite sure you can go through also a very huge list, but try to stick to 
at least Catherine's three minutes as well. Yeah. Well, let me first uh, uh, thank you for having me here first, and uh, thank you, Thorsten, for uh, you to uh, to lead this conversation. Uh, first, when we uh, we talk about security and defense in Europe, uh, at the end we are talking about the, a complete to complete an idea for Europe, right? Some somehow to close the loop. I I think this is the missing part of our discussion: how to link defense, security, safety in the same let's say, perspective of policies. And uh, we all know that the, these, uh, these discussions are on these topics are, are not easy, huh? but uh, uh, you can compare, for example, with the discussion that we, we are having with, uh, particularly with uh, 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 nuclear power. Uh, there are some kind of some taboos and also uh, some countries joined uh, 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 NATO. So they are now, I think we lose our fears and we are in different moment to put this on the table to discuss. And uh, uh, you know that uh, um, in the safety and security domains, we, uh, we already did something uh, uh, in, in Europe. And I have two examples to share with you. One is particularly, uh, you know that here in Lisbon, we have the Re uh, European Maritime Safety Agency, right? And, uh, Uh, since 2000, if I remember, 2008, 2009, uh, particularly this agency uh, started to work in the, let's say, protection, the environment protection of the North Atlantic. And this is something that uh, uh, to see uh, uh, the boats and the, the, the pollutions and particularly the vessel detections, and it was a crucial let's say, initiatives for uh, safety, uh, even uh, also migrate to security in the North Atlantic. This is a good example, but there are not another example that we are already have in Europe, which is, for example, the, the Frontex. Huh? This is the common European strategy for, uh, for our, our board control. This is uh, two examples. Uh, uh, of course, there are they, they are some, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, five, ten years. Uh, uh, we started this idea to join all this uh, safety and security efforts, but particularly in space, um, and to ensure the, the, an autonomy, it is important to identify the gaps, and we have some gaps, right? Uh, first, I think uh, the problem that uh, we have today is. Uh, Uh, we are stuck at uh, assessing to space. Uh, I think we are uh, very dependent of uh, one um, uh, uh, European uh, uh, operator. Uh, so there are these dependencies. And uh, uh, all of us, we know where we are. Uh, you, we, have, we have, you know, uh, which we see also, we, uh, we have some satellites in our brackets and some missions uh, waiting to be launched. This is one gap. And uh, uh, we need to look for um, uh, for launching opportunities uh, uh, outside of uh, Europe. And uh, you know that we are, let's say, rely on U.S. launches for, for to launch our satellites. This is one of the gaps. Huh? Uh, another gap also is uh, uh, the lack of spaceports, uh, uh, and there are some kind of temptation to concentrate everything in one place, in particular in Kourou, I think we should look this as an opportunity also, particularly with developing some components or some uh, new perspective for small launchers. This is something that we need to tackle for sure. Um, of course, uh, the problem that we face uh, now with uh, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine, with the lack of uh, propulsion system and the dependencies that we have with the uh, uh, Ukrainian and Russian Uh, technologies, uh, but uh, there are another gap, which is the lack, for example, the lack of services provided by big European constellations. Uh, you know that we don't have such big uh, constellations to provide, for example, communications, with something that, of course, we are preparing, paving the way for the security connectivity initiatives, and uh, is more than welcome. But we have this lack today. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the Americans are the players, and uh, you remember on the on the um, 2000 uh, what happened to the dot coms. The history is the same for space. Though the big players and the big constellations are Americans, and we don't have yet these capabilities in Europe. Uh, of course, there are all the gaps, the delays, for example, uh, uh, in some competencies in artificial intelligence in Europe. Also, 
uh, is already mentioned uh, by one of our colleagues before in the panels before uh, the quantum uh, technologies, uh, the huge gap that we we are uh, we have, and I think we are implementing some measures to recover this, uh, or at least to to put Europe in the in the center of the, the discussion. And the importance, uh, of course, these technologies for the the, 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 the perspective for the security connect, uh, connectivity uh, constellation. And of course, uh, one of the gap that we have is the lack uh, in Europe of the our own human space flight program. Uh, you know that uh, uh, we rely on the past on the, the on Russia. You remember that uh, uh, to put the, the our crew our astronauts. Innovate, then uh, 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 SpaceX, uh, uh, and also nowadays in, in SpaceX. So we need, again, we need to do uh, a program uh, um, for um, a human space flight. Uh, and this is a capability that we uh, really, that is and now is trying to implement for the next, uh, next years. Another uh, gap, and I conclude here, another gap is the uh, effective service for uh, the traffic, uh, uh, the space traffic and space weather services. I think there are a uh, perspective for good um, uh, uh, answers from the, the union, but uh, as Catherine already said, uh, we need to, uh, to um, talk less and uh, do more. And currently, I'm sorry to say, but I, I think the USST is not as far from what we, we can expect uh, for the, an European service. I think, uh, uh, in a nutshell, this is what, um, what we are observing as a gaps, but uh, we are giving some, some steps to cover these gaps, uh, and uh, slowly, but yet some, some good and consistent steps. Uh, for example, the idea, as I said, for the security connectivity is more than welcome. Uh, the idea also for the space traffic management initiatives uh, to reinforce with the commercial initiatives, the technology-driven uh, initiatives. And of course, the launches, the alliance uh, uh, already, um, uh, these initiatives already um, mentioned by the, the, the commissioner uh, Breton. And uh, of course, as I mentioned uh, uh, few seconds ago, the, the initiative of ESA to build in Europe a human space flight program. But we need to be more, eh? more agile, more fast in Europe. And uh, 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 we don't know, uh, probably this is the, the question, we don't know how to be uh, uh, faster than we, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we were be, uh, before. I hope my, yeah, my micro is back. Thank you for your extensive um, um, or a part here. Um, I'm not sure if we talk here about um, human spaceflight on the on the defense conference, but at least we will tackle a number of your your topics um, now. So, following um, now with with Alan Boris, um, the last geopolitical changes in, in in Europe they they cry for more security. So, secure connectivity initiative is one. Um, that we think needs to anticipate the future military needs. How do you, as an industry, may participate participate in now in the uh, secure connectivity? Is it still real, or did the project reach already a put situation? Thank you, Thorsten. Uh, first, I have to apologize for uh, the non-venue of Lutz Bertling, who was returned in a meeting with politicians in Berlin. Uh, yeah, but you don't uh, want to have two Germans on a stage. Uh, so that's, that's yes, fine. okay. <laughs> uh, I, I fully agree with, uh, with your statement uh, that the Secure Connectivity Initiative uh, needs to anticipate the, the, the future military needs. Uh, it's already partially the case because it has been uh, taken into account in two uh, the studies which were launched uh, by, uh, by the Commission uh, two years ago. Uh, however, the world has changed a little bit on February 24th, and uh, uh, with the war at uh, our doorstep, and uh, it has shown to the urgency to take into account now uh, what was supposed to be part of an evolution of uh, the constellation. And clearly now, because uh, of the long cycles, uh, in development uh, of uh, space systems. 
And uh, therefore, we have to anticipate the needs uh, which are perhaps today not completely expressed by uh, uh, the military. Uh, just as a joke, uh, uh, it's not with uh, knowing the needs uh, of the users of uh, diligence that uh, uh, people have designed the first automobile. So it's really important because, again, of the long cycles, to see what we will need in 2030 up to 2040 uh, or more in terms of uh, uh, the use of uh, space uh, and in particular not connectivity uh, for the military. So defense industry uh, here huh, uh, knows uh, what uh, the future uh, fighters, the future uh, tanks, the future uh, drones will need in terms of uh, data. And when I talk about data, it's also uh, a huge amount of data, including uh, images, uh, which will need to be uh, high resolution, which will need to be in real time, and therefore requesting uh, low latency uh, secured communication. And so we have to anticipate these needs because they will exist when the constellation will start its operations. I hope I was. You're absolutely fine. So, <laughs> and as a bonus, you get an, a, a second question. No, actually, it's a second round. Uh, so it's not Thorsten, a bonus. <laughs> before we are going to the second round, and uh, as I have one minute, not used by Alain, I would like just to add one sentence vis a vis the secure connectivity, uh, the presence of the European Parliament. According to our uh, commissioner, Commissioner Breton, the secure connectivity is not only a third flagship, it's not only a constellation, it's really the platform where we will introduce the new way of making space. And if I want to comment on the rapprochement space defense, we would like to have all the defense and security requirements from the beginning in order to flow them down in the design. We're talking about secure by design. Yeah. And only if we follow their requirements and their needs, they, the communities, defense and security, they can use it because they will trust it. And for us, it's more than important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alan, um, Ricardo mentioned that spaceports, launchers, diversity of launching capacities has to be taken into account for further autonomy to access to space a key aspect for EU security and defense policy. So with Ariane 6, Vega, the upcoming small launchers, is Europe, in your opinion, and OHB is part of one of the uh, small launcher companies, um, and I think you're working on all the mentioned before launchers with, in one way or the other. Is Europe well set in that area? Or where are our gaps? Yes, first, as you said, what is key is autonomous access uh, to space. And uh, autonomous access means uh, to be able to launch uh, any payload at any time. And of course, at a reasonable cost. Uh, and the reasonable cost is a, a, a key word for, for, for two reasons. The first one is that uh, launching um, should not be a, a burden uh, limiting the investments in the space assets. Because at the end, uh, the important target is the mission. It's not the, the launcher. Uh, and the mission, uh, it's uh, overall, uh, it's uh, of course launching, but it's a satellite, it's uh, how long it lasts, it's a ground segment, it's a large uh, part. And uh, again, uh, if we uh, limit by the cost of the launcher the rest of the investment, uh, it's not good for the mission itself. The second reason is that the, if there is too much difference between launching with a European launcher and launching with a non-European launcher, then there will be some, uh, let's say, diverging trends, <laughs> if I may say, which will fra fragilize uh, the European uh, industrial base uh, uh, on launchers. And because it will lower the number of launches by European launchers, and then 
you will not have enough launches to justify the whole industry. So that's the, that's the reason why the best uh, life insurance, and I heard the term resilience, and I think it's really appropriate, the, the best life insurance for European autonomous access to space is to have a diversity of launchers, of cost-effective cost European launchers, And I am really happy to see that there are a lot of emerging uh, uh, offers in, uh, in, uh, uh, in developments of small launchers in Europe because it brings this diversity, it brings the cost effectiveness, and then by having a, a larger market, because then we can access other markets if we are uh, cost effective, then we will have a real autonomous access to space with uh, Uh, a variety of, uh, of launchers available. So we are well set? We are in the process of being well set. Okay. <laughs> Because I'm here in the role of the moderator, so I don't have the privilege to, to, <laughs> to go deep into that. No, no, but Be I mean... Because I'm, I'm asking, why, why is SARA, um, for instance, launched by the US launchers I mean, and not from Europe to being today, ground? To, today we have a gap. Uh, clearly, okay. everybody uh, uh, knows that uh, we have a gap uh, in, in launchers. Uh, of course, uh, the fact that uh, well, there is the, the delays of Ariane 6, but there is also the fact that Soyuz is no longer, uh, we cannot uh, sure. uh, use it. Uh, this was not expected. Uh, uh, both of them, by the way, were not expected. But uh, did you consider Soyuz as a European launcher? No, but Because it, it was used Europe. because it was, uh, it was uh, uh, launched uh, from Kourou, so it, it has been for long a way to... Uh, uh, sure. Of course, Ariane 6 was supposed to replace Soyuz, but uh, with the two events, the fact that Soyuz is no longer available and that Ariane 6 is, uh, is late, we, are, we, are, we have only the three remaining... Uh, sorry, the three remaining... No, no, that's oh, I just want to say that. Here's an Ariane 6. Ah, rocket. sorry, yeah, I yeah. did not say it. <laughs> it's very small, so, but it's okay, an Ariane okay. 6. So, so we have the three uh, remaining uh, Ariane 5. Okay. Plus, of course, Vega, but Vega cannot launch everything. So, and, yeah. and so we, we, we are in a, currently in a gap. But we can expect that in 24, it will be no longer the case. We have to be sure that uh, at least this is a lesson learned for uh, the future, and that we will have, uh, again, in all the mini launchers which are uh, uh, developed in Europe, uh, not all will survive. But the, what is good is that there are a lot of development, meaning that there, uh, people are anticipating a market, not only okay. European, but at least we will have a diversity of European launchers which we'll be able, we will be able to use for European programs. Thank you. Yeah, Christoph, you've got yeah, more. Just a short word yes. about uh, launchers. Uh, I would like to remind everyone uh, the importance on, of launchers uh, and the securing of our autonomous access to space. We need to invest more uh, in our European launchers uh, to be able to launch uh, everywhere uh, uh, what we want, uh, everything we want. Uh, and from the EU territory. Uh, it's, it is crucial. But without uh, that precondition, there is no strategic autonomy in space for Europe. It's important to, to add it. Uh, and I am waiting uh, from the industrials uh, that they fully, particip fully participate at the EU launcher cooperation, now it's, it's a word we use, Airport, not yeah. alliance, <laughs> uh, initiated by the European uh, Commission. Uh, it's very important to, to be But together. There is place for different people. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not a, a problem. But uh, we are to go in the same way, uh, not to despair in the global approach of the world. But the strategic to be, to, and autonomy of Europe, it's crucial. To, to, to be clear, um, you are talking about Ariane 6 and more, and not... Yeah, of okay. course. Uh, Great. And more. Uh, But, okay, you... you As I am French, I really talk about Kourou, it's very important, it's crucial. but maybe we need some uh, polar pad yep. in, in the future. Maybe we have some different One on the Azores, for uh, instance. Yeah, but, but we, we can speak together, uh, for example, in the cooperation mm -hmm. uh, for, for launching. If I may, yeah. <laughs> of course you <laughs> So we're not here to put names. We are here in order to confirm that there is no Uh, space strategy, space policy, if we don't have an autonomous 
access to space. And for us, this is fundamental. We debated at political level with industry for many years, and finally, two years ago, under the space regulation, Article 5, if I will remember, we anchored such a policy objective in a piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, the European Commission paved the way and uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, if we want uh, to go ahead with the deployment, the replenishment, or the replacement of our own EU infrastructures, we have to rely on EU launch capacities. This is why, for many years now, we pass contracts with European providers. And uh, recently, we conclude the negotiations for the Copernicus launches with Vega. And we expect uh, to make the same uh, framework contract as far as the Galileo uh, launches are concerned. And we don't have to forget that there is also a perspective. And the perspective is the one who will come with uh, the secure connectivity. And there we will not have uh, six or 30. We might have uh, more than 200 satellites. Uh, we are talking about autonomous. But let me add two main words. The first of all is the flexibility that we have, and the number th three is the competitiveness. It's not only our domestic environment, we have really to push our companies, well-established or newcomers, to do it. Where we work, I know that you are pressed by the time, is but very important for our audience, we work from the European Commission in three layers. Anchor customer, for what I said, research and evolution, because all these developments, they have been uh, supported by an innovation funding. And last but not least, because we need diversity, the Cassini Initiative will come in order to promote. And it's not only the Commission, it's ESA, Member States and industry. Inclusiveness. Apologize if I go by the names or by the fact, as a trained engineer and a journalist by passion, I'm I need something to put my hands on. So, Ricardo, um, we know about the assets that we have in space that are worth to protect. You spoke earlier about space traffic management. So, may Europe reinforce the idea of an alliance with other countries to protect its, our assets in space, leading the agenda for a global STM? Yeah, I think um, so. Uh, in, in, in two minutes, in, if in possible, minutes. because we are running out of time and yeah, people... Yeah, will be very short, it will be very yes. short. Uh, um, of course, uh, um, there are uh, some ongoing initiatives uh, to develop some technologies, to, uh, uh, but he, he, of course this takes time. But uh, let me just uh, give you a crazy idea to the discussion. You know that uh, I really believe that you, you should, we should not be naive in the moment that we are living. Eh? It's already addressed for one of our colleagues in, in the panel. In this perspective, I do believe that we need to promote uh, space in our alliance, it's particularly to protect our assets. Uh, I believe that we need to use more or less the same concept of the old military alliance that we have. And uh, for example, this could, could seem a, a crazy idea, but uh, I really believe in the concept of the extension of NATO alliance uh, for space. This is something that uh, we need to think, because uh, as you said in the beginning, NATO declared it as an operational uh, also scenario. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, in this perspective, I really believe that uh, we can, let's say, promote our uh, alliances also in space under the umbrella of, um, uh, of NATO. That means a threat for an asset for one country should be a threat also for uh, the completely alliance. Um, and of course, uh, 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 there will be, in this perspective, uh, uh, joint monitoring capabilities. And you mentioned the space uh, traffic management. Uh, uh, but we need also uh, fast deployment of means to orbit with fast availability of launchers. Uh, I do believe that the competition will foster the, the, uh, this rapid response to put uh, some access uh, in orbit. And don't forget one thing which is important. Um, there are 
um, in the in the in the horizon, in the outlook, uh, some new concepts uh, for space stations, and. Uh, uh, this idea of the joint defense space stations for early detections, for example, of uh, threads, and also for fast reaction in orbit, uh, this is the perspective of uh, the services in orbit services that is is in the, in the near future. So we can, we should not neglect uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, use of space to the whirling, uh, early um, warning. Uh, um, uh, information uh, in the context that uh, uh, we know uh, we are in the different geopolitical uh, 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 alliance in the moment. And I think we really need to take this opportunity to think seriously this, uh, this uh, kind of alliance that we are uh, talking here today. So uh, I think the moment is to put everything on the table to discuss without any kind of taboos. Thank you and very to, much. That's it. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. So, Patrick, um, we have to speed up because we're holding back now the people from the, the, the lunch here. STM S, uh, or um, SST under, under, under NATO regime? Interesting thoughts. Um, you don't have to comment on that. Let's, <laughs> but you, you're the next in line here now. Um, but. <laughs> Talking about the growing concerns with regards to the peaceful use of outer space, what are the state of discussion in the international forum to ensure its uh, peaceful use? You mentioned the GA that, that goes on uh, right now in New York, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, what can we do here? Well, first of all, we need to, um, to understand the difference between safety and... Sorry, My yeah. Okay. We need to understand the difference between safety and security. Oh. But yeah, we can't we can't hear you. Or we can hear you, but the audience can't hear you. Okay, like that. <coughs> no. Second, we should explain what means satellite weapons in the world of space. Nobody talking about this. Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for your for your input. Uh, we we'll talk in detail about these topics. What is a weapon in space? But it's not the right panel here. So, but I'm happy to talk with you off site later on, on that. So, uh, that's... Yeah, if you can hear me now. Uh, no. no, the difference, uh, the fundamental uh, difference is... Uh, no, no, uh, wait, wait a second, so we've... Oh. <laughs> you get now the, the backup. Hand micro. <laughs> we call it redundancy. No, I... <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it okay now? Yeah. No, 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 wait. We're on the jamming or... <laughs> so... Um, no, to come, to, to come back to the discussion in United Nations, and so I think it's also behind our discussion. We establish a difference between safety and security in our space. Uh, we, we have on one hand the STM approach, which is about safety, which is about having an internal, international agreed regime on, uh, on long-term sustainability. It no, I, mean, okay. I think you have to switch it on. Censorship. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, to come back to, to the discussion in the United Nations, so as you know, there are two uh, big fora. You have the discussion in Vienna in the Committee of Peaceful Resistance of Space, and the discussion in Geneva on the disarmament. And this uh, divide is a bit historical, because if you look at space in Europe, it's a bit the same. Most of the defense programs were owned by nas were nationally done, and, and then most of the European cooperation took, pl took place on the scientific and then industrial basis. So, here, the, the, the difference is that we, we need to separate the issues that are linked to the space debris, to the accidental risks in outer space, from the intentional risk. And that's what we intend to do also in the strategy. So yes, STM contributes to the resilience of infrastructure, but we believe that we need to have a different approach to address accidental hazards and natural hazards such as STM, and on the other hand, the threats and risks. And, and, and it's always difficult to, to distinguish, but we need to, 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 to respond differently. Just to give an example, because there is an attribution, because we need to take a political decision to attribute a threat to, to someone. And the same discussion is taking place also in the, in the United Nations Forum. We, we have on the one hand the discussions that are taking place in, 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 the, in Vienna, and on the other, the discussions that are taking place in the open-ended working group to try to identify, because I do not, and to come back to what the gentleman was saying, the question of weapon in space is already tricky because anything can be a weapon in space. So the, the approach that we are promoting with the, with the EU and, and the allies and, and, and all the Western countries is instead of 
to, 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 to prevent the placement of weapons in outer space, we believe in the behavioral approach. We, we believe that there are some types of behaviors that we shall condemn. We shall condemn when the satellite goes too close to a satellite, or if you want to do an orbit servicing with someone that didn't uh, give you permission to do so, then you are having a hostile behavior, and that's something that we need to condemn. So again, behavioral approach instead of weapons. That is the, the way we look at things. I'm afraid that um, we have to close. At least I got the clear order that we have to close. So it's, it's not my choice, just to say that here, very, very clear. So, but I don't want to close without giving you, or each of you, uh, a 45 second last statement. So um, if, if that works for you. If not, just pass it and um, we are fine as well. So, Christoph, please. Thank you very much. There's so much to say about, about the file, but well, let's stop. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to conclude, to conclude I, I would like to say now it is time. Uh, it's time to, to stop being naive in space. It's time uh, to, to stop pretending that nobody will try to damage our European satellites. Uh, the time to, to build a, a real policy of security and defense in space, the time also to invest more in space because our international competitors are getting very good. And it is a time for the EU, of course, uh, to better protect its citizens and allies from, from space. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick. Uh, it was about what uh, I wanted to say. Is, is I think it's a wind of change. I, we, there is a change of paradigm that is uh, underway in the space uh, domain, in the space domain, and we hope that with the strategy and uh, and all the follow-up actions that Catherine was mentioning, we will see a, a, a different approach in the way we protect uh, these key assets, which are very very important for us. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Forty-five, 40, seconds. 45 seconds, yeah. Okay. And may, maybe you just can confirm, uh, Timo mentioned earlier, um, on the 9th of November, the EU strategy uh, for, uh, space strategy will be published. Is that correct? Is that, did I got it right? Or Which date? 9th of November? No. no? Okay, no. then it was something else. I, uh, it, it, it was a test, it okay. was a prize. So. It, it, it will stay here because I don't want to say something different than okay. my director general. However, <laughs> concluding remarks, three in 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you follow me, that's good. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, with the strategic compass, finally we have a collective strategic thinking in Europe and we have to assist the opportunity. Number two, finally, acknowledgement, collective acknowledgement, that the space is a sine qua non condition for resilience and freedom to act in Europe. Number three, we say that if there is a will, there is a way. I think that today we have a collective will and definitely we will have a collective way and uh, regarding the time frame, uh, you have to expect uh, the space strategy uh, f by the first semester of 2023, is under the 2023 program. Good. So with the hope next year, not to discuss the strategy, but the concrete actions so to implement when we, when it. When we meet in January here, so then we might be closer. <laughs> okay, just, just saying. So, Ricardo, um, 45 seconds, over to you. Well, I want to reinforce what uh, Christophe already said about the opportunity to join uh, civil and defense uh, in space. And also what Catherine already also said, uh, we need to talk less and do more. And thank you, Thorsten, thank you. Great. Alan, last words. Yes, I think we have seen that, well, space is a domain uh, where Europe is more relevant than in any or anywhere else in uh, in defense, because of course, uh, uh, space does not stop at the border of a country, and so the most relevant level is uh, Europe. And just as a positive uh, remark, I want to show that in a very specific example, which is a space-based early warning, which was in uh, the EDIDP, which is now in the European uh, Defense Fund, and clearly. Uh, missiles arriving from uh, the enemy uh, uh, is not uh, for a country alone to set up uh, its, uh, its defense, it's for all Europe to, to do it.
Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone here in the room, for your patience, uh, for your interest, and for the attention. Please join me here with a round of applause for, for the panel. <clears throat> To, yeah. uh, please uh, be back here at 2.30 for when we resume the program and with a keynote, I think, from the Commissioner Breton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm Julien Boquet, your public affairs consultant at Business Bridge Europe. And in my capacity as coordinator of the second European Defense and Security Conference, I am pleased to welcome you for the second part of this day, both online and on site. Thank you to all of you for being here with us during this day of debates on crucial issues for the European defense domain. We are honored to welcome today Commissioner for Internal Markets, Mr. Thierry Breton. Commissioner Breton, thank you very much for being here today. This morning, we have heard Minister de Nonder calling for further investment in the defense domain in view of the challenges and the threats that Europe is facing. We also heard High Representative Borrell who kindly addressed a message to the conference. He highlighted the necessary steps and the action to strengthen the European defense policy, even saying that European defense cooperation is not a luxury, but a must. Commissioner Breton, under your initiative, the European Commission has established forward-looking initiatives in the defense technological and industrial domain, which of course now resonate more than ever in light of the unprecedented geopolitical context that the EU is facing. As the architect of the European defense industry policy, spearheading the work for the European defense, I am certain that all participants gathered here today are keen in hearing your remarks. Commissioner, Monsieur le Commissaire, I invite you to take the floor. And now, okay. <coughs> thank you for the, the, the technician. Je suis pour rien, moi. Okay, so, um, dear representative of uh, the defense in the community and industry in, uh, in Europe, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is really the time to meet. Huh? You're absolutely right. Since, uh, since a year ago, the security landscape on our uh, continent has, of course, uh, drastically changed, and of course, you discussed this uh, before me uh, this morning, and of course, with the aggression of, uh, of Russia uh, in Ukraine, uh, we all know that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin um, attempted to redesign <coughs> the whole security <coughs> and architecture of defense uh, in, uh, in Europe, yeah. and also threatens our fundamental values of uh, what makes Europe. By the way, he didn't wait for the war to do this. We have been uh, used <coughs> to um, his ability to use hybrid uh, threats um, in many domains. So it's uh, unfortunately not a surprise, but of course, this is not an excuse, on the contrary. Uh, of course, peace has never been uh, for granted. We all know that. So let's not uh, be afraid of the words. The return of the war on our continent is uh, definitely a wake-up call for all of us. The return of high-intensity uh, conflict uh, obliges us to review our whole security approach. And since the 24th February, I think we need to acknowledge that Europe um, act very fast, always being uni united, but also in strong cooperation uh, with uh, our partners within NATO. And by the way, we in Europe are a strong pillar of NATO. Huh? So when we speak about NATO, we speak uh, very often of us. Huh? So um, the sanctions, but also the decoupling strategy, and I insist on the word decoupling, uh, from any dependencies that we may still have uh, with, uh, with Russia, has been uh, extremely, uh, extremely fast. Of course, we could speak about technology, but of course, uh, and of energy, uh, to uh, tell the least. We, and uh, this is a... Uh, definitely unprecedented uh, in the history of our union, 
organized a transfer of weapons to support Ukraine using, uh, of course, the European Peace Facility, and uh, it was maybe not designed for that, but we used all the tools that we had at our disposal to be able to react uh, uh, quickly. And uh, believe me, um, of course, we had discussion at the college, but we took very quickly under the leadership of uh, Ursula von der Leyen this, um, uh, this decision to propose uh, to act together here. We are also very attentive to, of course, to the hybrid dimension of the war, I already mentioned it. Um, including, of course, uh, uh, the threats on critical infrastructures, uh, of course, energy, energy grids, uh, but also in the transport sectors, uh, space asset, um, whether, by the way, they are um, uh, physical or cyber threats. We are also countering uh, the massive disinformation machine uh, accompanying the military action uh, of Russia. And all these elements are all pointing on the same conclusion. Europe must become a stronger and more credible security provider, including for uh, its own security. And from the traditional soft power, it must evolve gradually towards a hard power, with, of course, uh, all the attributes uh, this requires. This is a sense, of course, of the strategic compass. You had uh, the chance to have my friend, the HRBP, this morning. Uh, so he's, uh, of course, a strong supporter of this. You all know that. Uh, which is extremely important for the first time to have our common view in defense. But this is also the message of the leaders um, uh, at Versailles last May. You all remember that. Who, by the way, asked for a more integrated Europe when it comes to uh, defense. The reality now of um, the figures when we speak about defense investment uh, gaps uh, is, however, telling. The EU member states um, are investing collectively roughly 200 billion uh, uh, euros a year in defense, when we all know that uh, US alone invests uh, 800 uh, billion uh, dollars. And over the past 20 years, uh, our defense uh, spending have increased only by 20% when, uh, when we saw a strong increase by 66% uh, uh, in the US, almost 100% in Russia, and uh, almost 600%, we all know, in uh, China. If we had, that's what we call une Ukraine, if we had all invested 2% uh, of our GDP in defense, as requested, by the way, uh, since the start of the euro, for example, we would have invested together to enhance our defense industry and to protect Europe uh, 1.3 trillion euro. Uh, that's really uh, what we are missing today, and we all know that. Uh, all these figures, of course, hide also a very large national disparities. We know that. Um, very few invest more than 3%. Huh? I don't want to give names, but uh, they, will, they will recognize themselves, or it will recognize itself, unfortunately. So uh, not all member states made the same efforts. We all know that. Um, uh, and that's a fact. We shouldn't need to acknowledge that not all member states took their part, their burden, to defend collectively our continent, that's a fact. And this translates, of course, into capabilities and industrial gaps, as well as also uh, dependencies um, uh, that must now, of course, uh, close urgently. Several member states are now investing heavily, which is good news, uh, into defense. I think we have more than 200 billion uh, euros, which have been announced uh, in the past few months. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's, uh, of course, an extremely important message. Uh, but, of course, my message regarding this fact is simple. This investment cannot fragment Europe. They must be used to foster cooperation uh, rather than support, uh, of course, uh, exclusively national lines. The only approach is indeed a European one. 
So let me explain where I believe that uh, we should uh, collectively bring uh, the Europe uh, and the, our European uh, Defence uh, Union together. The first pillar, of course, um, of our strategy um, is um, the European Defence Fund, obviously. Before the war in Ukraine, we had already taken unprecedented steps, we all know that, at uh, European level to reinforce uh, our cooperation with, of course, the PESCO uh, and, above all, the European Defence Fund. Who would have thought, years ago, uh, that today we would have, through the EDF, uh, and I could tell you that some of you know that uh, I was part of the thinking uh, behind that in 19, in fact, uh, in, in 2016. And now I meet some of the important uh, head of state or saying, it's incredible. You came to see us with this idea, including, by the way, my friend, Jean Claude Juncker, and now it's a reality. And it's a reality. And, uh, and that's extremely important. In 2021, we invested 1.2 billion um, in a 61 uh, project involving uh, more than 700 entities, of which, which is very important also for the DF, uh, 43% uh, of SMEs, and from uh, 26 uh, countries with uh, an average of eight uh, member states per project. We supported projects in, of course, uh, uh, many aspects, uh, uh, to tell you, uh, uh, air missile defense, air ground and uh, naval combat, mobility, of course, uh, cyber space. And of course, I just remind you that uh, the calls for 2022 are now uh, open. This shows that uh, we collectively uh, built uh, with the EDF works and uh, that the governance, but also uh, security assurance we inbuilt into programs are uh, the correct one. Now, of course, we must uh, also always try to improve. That's good. So we, we learn by progressing together. And especially looking at the lesson learned uh, uh, with the first uh, iteration of the project. And we are uh, now, of course, uh, dedicated to do this. I could see at my level at this stage uh, two uh, courses of actions. The first one, uh, uh, maybe that why competition, of course, may, must remain. That's extremely important the cornerstone of uh, our intervention, unless to say, we must never uh, lose sight that defense is, of course, uh, a specific sector, and you know this better than um, uh, everyone. In the end, we want to support defense capabilities that member states need and uh, are ready to buy. Uh, we need to reflect on how to integrate a stronger uh, dose of strategic planning uh, into the European Defence Fund for, of course, uh, the general interest of the EU and being fully aligned with um, our strategic compass. <coughs> Second, uh, the principle of the European Defence Fund is co-funding. Co-funding. And I would like uh, that we are having a clear improvement of the leverage, because this is uh, the essence of the, uh, of the fund, uh, the leverage effect, uh, and this means on the, on the level of the money, that member states are ready to commit uh, next, of course, to the EU budget to develop certain capacities. These two elements are absolutely uh, uh, paramount, I should say. Um, if uh, we are to um, advocate, uh, like I do, that EDF should be allocated more money to face with uh, the current realities. Of course, Europe has uh, no time to lose in uh, scaling up uh, its defense capacity, and we discussed this with many of you, of course. Uh, this is, of course, a prerequisite to become a credible uh, security actor. The second pillar, first pillar, of course, uh, then uh, EDF, with R&D, second pillar of our strategy is about developing um, European Joint uh, uh, Acquisition Strategy. That's very new, but that's very important. Um, uh, joint procurement represents today only 8%, that's really um, very bad, of uh, the procurement in the EU, uh, very far, by the way, from uh, 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 the self-set target of 35%. You all have this figure in mind. Additionally, 60% of the procurement uh, are done on non-EU equipment. And there is a need to develop, of course, a strong European framework for joint acquisition. 
This is what uh, the Commission proposed through the EDIRPA uh, and uh, the more permanent European Defence Investment Programme, so-called EDIP. Uh, and I would like to uh, take uh, this uh, opportunity to um, uh, just to tell you uh, what are our objectives here. First, we must respond collectively, quickly, to uh, the depletion of uh, national stocks in uh, armaments and munitions, following, of course, uh, the large transfer uh, of, uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And this situation represents in itself, uh, of course, uh, we could say it, a security risk. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, we, we, we must definitely act extremely uh, quickly here. And with the DIRPA, we are proposing a European uh, vehicle to drive a part of uh, the replenishment effort. Second, I'm of course in charge of defense industry, but I'm also in charge of internal market. So you will not be surprised if I say that we must avoid fragmentation. Fragmentation is a poison of our market. And believe me, you need to fight on a daily basis. C'est comme les mauvaises herbes. Right. So uh, the risk, uh, uh, but if it's, it's worse. Huh? The risk uh, is indeed, uh, of course, to, to uh, channel the massive investment increase that I just spoke a few minutes ago into purely national lines. And this could lead to a lack of interoperability and uh, could, of course, also undermine uh, all the efforts that we do through uh, the EDF to consolidate our European uh, industrial base. So with EDIRPA, we are offering uh, uh, to the member states a European alternative to, um, to invest, but to invest together. I just remind you that you need to, to come with three member states and we'll be ready to support. Third, we must support the adaptation of our defence industry. Um, I will not, of, of course, offend anyone uh, in saying that today our European defence industrial apparatus is not exactly um, uh, adapted to the security reality we are facing. Not in uh, volume, nor in cadence. The risk is of course high. Sorry to take this analogy, but uh, like we uh, had uh, for the vaccines, uh, that member states are put into competition uh, for the same equipment. Believe me, uh, I saw this often in my life. So we have to avoid that, of course. Uh, uh, with uh, sometimes also a price hiking uh, and eviction effect for those who have uh, no, uh, uh, not the means nor the volumes. So EDIRPA is designed, again, to act in a, a truly European spirit, to structure the demand and to support a fast industrial ramp up. And of course, uh, of course also to give visibility to uh, our um, uh, industrial uh, industry, uh, uh, defense industry in Europe. So this proposal, as you know, is now in uh, negotiation um, between uh, our two co-legislators. Um, I will uh, allow myself uh, only one remark, uh, if you allow me, uh, as these negotiations are ongoing, so I'm cautious. Uh, but while uh, uh, we take uh, these uh, really um, unprecedented uh, steps, we must also be clear that our strategy and security interest as Europe is to ensure that the European industry is uh, benefiting from these efforts. We are not uh, changing the rules uh, uh, of defense procurement in the EU. Any member states can buy, of course, uh, uh, the capabilities uh, it wants uh, with its own budget. But let's be frank, nobody will understand uh, in Europe that uh, EU budget, in other words, European taxpayer money, uh, will be mobilized uh, to support non-EU uh, industry, and especially uh, these days. So I want to be extremely clear. Uh, there is no trade-off between quality, efficiency, and uh, European capabilities. So of course, um, no, this is not in, uh, in, uh, in my hands. As you know, uh, we are a democracy, as I said. Uh, we have our co-legislators. But I count now, of course, on the Council and uh, the European Parliament, our two co-legislators, to move as fast as uh, possible, um, in line with the need to give member states and the industry the visibility uh, uh, that we need as the replenishment effort is uh, definitely ongoing. 
And now, one word on the third pillar. Uh, uh, the third pillar of a true defense union is to extend the notion of security and defense uh, into new sectors. So this is especially the case, I believe, uh, on four dimension. Um, so I don't want to speak about uh, um, air or maritime and space. That's extremely important, and I don't forget maritime uh, uh, needs. But uh, but uh, in this new, let's say, um, uh, era, um, I could mention cyber, part of the, also of the strategic compass, space, same thing, critical infrastructure, absolutely important. We see the news every day. Uh, and of course, also technological superiority. So if you, uh, if you allow me, I would like to take briefly each uh, uh, one of them, uh, as they are, of course, all included uh, in uh, to our uh, strategic compass. First on cyber, uh, we will present uh, early November together with uh, um, my colleague and friend, uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, a new cyber defense policy. Uh, while the Commission has put forward a wide array of initiatives on cybersecurity, it is, we believe, now time to enhance our cooperation uh, on cyber defense to protect, detect, defend, and deter. I wish uh, especially that uh, we uh, could work toward the creation of uh, European um, uh, infrastructure of SOCs, uh, Security Operational Centers, uh, to build a true European uh, cyber shield with a clear defense dimension. Uh, we create a cyber solidarity mechanism based on a cyber emergency fund and also cyber uh, reserve corps to enhance our solidarity in case of uh, major, major uh, uh, let's say, cyber attacks. We build a joint uh, also uh, and common cyber situational awareness which would uh, be the basis uh, of uh, 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 our capacity to have a, a stronger cooperation uh, also at the operational level. Second, on space. Space, of course, is, uh, we all know that, a newly contested area uh, where our competitors can have uh, hostile behavior and uh, threaten vital interest. I don't want to, uh, to give you the, all the examples we have in mind not too far from us. And this is why we need to develop a true space dimension in our defense strategy. We will present uh, also here uh, this strategy uh, early next year. I want that uh, by design, all the EU space infrastructure develop a defense dimension. And the model, by the way, that uh, we are, have done successfully, for example, with uh, uh, Galileo Perez. And this will, of course, be true for uh, Copernicus, for also the upcoming uh, connectivity constellation and the space traffic management system. This is definitely a major change uh, of paradigm, breaking taboos, uh, but, uh, but absolutely mandatory. Third, on critical infrastructure. Unfortunately, of course, uh, the news of, uh, of the past days are showing now um, uh, how in an hybrid warfare, critical infrastructure in energy, but also in uh, digital, uh, uh, cables, uh, satellites, uh, telecom, uh, transport, uh, and, uh, and many others uh, can uh, uh, be targeted to disrupt uh, our strategic interest. While the legislative framework uh, exists to enhance the security, what we lack is uh, definitely concrete operational capacity to ensure collective protection of uh, all this infrastructure. And this is what uh, we will try to fix very soon. Uh, when I say very soon, is uh, in the following days, hopefully. Uh, on, uh, on the model of what uh, we have uh, in case of uh, cyber attacks. First, uh, first on technological superiority. Europe definitely must remain at the end of technologies while closing, of course, existing dependencies that we may have uh, uh, and avoid uh, creating new ones. So whether uh, it is in cyber, uh, in quantum, uh, uh, space, uh, chips, of course, uh, HPCs, uh, edge computers, uh, Europe cannot lag behind. 
And synergies with uh, the advanced civilian technologies is, of course, here also absolutely paramount. So, uh, however, uh, for, uh, for this, we must be uh, definitely better organized at uh, European level. And in uh, this vein, we are working uh, on the three following elements. First, uh, we will uh, map out our strategic technological dependencies and act upon them to reduce them by uh, mobilizing uh, all our EU instruments. Second, we will also create an EU sovereignty fund to have the means to reduce our dependencies and uh, protect EU strategic interest, whether for a technology or a given company in a strategic value chain. And third, we will work towards an uh, ambitious uh, European Defence Innovation Scheme designed uh, to bridge all the EU instruments supporting disruptive innovation and uh, create a, a Cassini-like for defence fund of uh, 1 billion euro. So uh, NATO is doing uh, Diana, uh, uh, EU will do uh, EDIS. So to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, I think that we have made unprecedented uh, progresses uh, over the past uh, years about defense cooperation. We have initiated new capacities and new capabilities uh, and industrial projects. We have built uh, trust, I believe. And we have also uh, set up, which is extremely important uh, for all of us in our sector, uh, the right to governance structure. But of course, the situation and, uh, and the war in Ukraine called on us, member states, EU institution, industry, to definitely speed up uh, and to bring European defense to the next level. We will not be able to do it alone we will do it and we will succeed because we will need the three key words, solidarity, unity, and leadership. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Commissioner Breton, thank you very much. I hope uh, your call for a strong and credible European defense uh, will be heard. And thank you very much for being here today. Stay tuned for our next uh, keynote addresses of the afternoon. We will have the pleasure of welcoming Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Chris Peters, Chief Executive of the European Defense Agency, Giri Shedivi, and Ambassador Jitka Znamenakova, Ambassador to the PSC. Uh, thank you. Ambassador okay. Znamenakova, Vice President Peters, Chief Executive Chedivi, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the European Defense and Security Conference. Vice President Peters, uh, we had the honor, of course, of welcoming you last year for the first edition of the conference, and we are absolutely pleased to welcome you again today, especially in the lights of the initiative put forward by the IB this year, uh, named notably the Strategic European uh, security initiative. So I'm certain that the participant will be keen in knowing more about the EIB's activities supporting defense industry and uh, the EIB support brought to the development of uh, dual-use technologies. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Speaking after lunch and after the commission is not easy, and certainly when you are a banker. Uh, I shall do my utmost to, uh, to give you some more information and like uh, the moderator said, uh, November last year I was also invited. Uh, thank you for that. And congratulations with this uh, second uh, conference about a very important issue, security and defense. And um, did you know that uh, 34 years ago, on this day, Gorbachev and Re uh, Regan were uh, discussing in Reykjavik about the possibility of eliminating all nuclear weapons, ladies and gentlemen, this day, 34 years ago. Last year in November, we have had a discussion about defense and security, and now again. And these two examples uh, underline that everything is going very quick. Everything is going and changing very fast. And I think and I believe that the defense and security and space have now a window of opportunity 
to change something. Uh, in Europe, we need crisis to go faster than uh, normally. And I hope that we can use this crisis to change and to make a difference. And that is also what we are trying. The European Investment Bank and the European Investment Group, because also Roger is here, they will take uh, the floor later uh, to speak about the European Investment Fund. And last year I said we shall try to initiate a new program, a new policy in the bank. And I can say today that we accomplished, that we have delivered what we have set in November last year. We have now SACI, Strategic European Security Initiative. And I must say, I'm in the bank responsible for security, defense and space. It was not, not easy to convince the people in the bank to, uh, to have this policy. Because you know very well, when you talk about defense industry, they say, okay, oh, that's, uh, that's a little bit uh, sensitive. That we must be very careful. And I think that there are not a lot of bankers in the room, because in, in the financial sector, um, it's not obvious to speak about defense industry. But we have tried, and we have discussed, and we have launched the security, uh, the SACI initiative, with an amount of 6 billion euros for a period until 2027. That means each year 1 billion euro loans, because we are a banker, we don't give grants, that was the part of the commissioner, we give loans, that you must pay back, of course, at certain, certain moments. And um, then suddenly there was a war in Ukraine, and some members of the board said to me, uh, is your plan ambitious enough? I said, we will see, but we shall try to invest each year 1 billion euro in security, defense and space industry. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that today we have already reached that goal for this year, more than 1 billion euro. That means something is going in the right direction. The, the, the main question is, of course, is the, 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 pace, is, is the pace good? And it was uh, said this, this morning, Speed and money, that is what we need. And I convinced, I'm, I'm convinced that we uh, can and must do that, not alone, because also NATO is a, a very important partner for us, and we must uh, take this um, endeavor, ambition together. Now, there is, of course, uh, a lot to, uh, to speak about, but for me, first element, that's very important for you also, is innovation. Innovation because uh, we shall overcome this crisis and make the industry, defense industry and security industry bigger than ever before in Europe when we innovate. Innovate or die, more or less, as company. And we, um, we have uh, already supported a lot of, of uh, projects, cybersecurity, um, also in uh, AI and so on. Because for us, we need uh, dual use. And dual use is that military and, um, and civil must be in one project. And I know that some of you are asking us, can you not go further? Because, okay, civil and, 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 and defense, and then what is dual use and so on? I can understand that. But um, I try to be practical, to, to make things possible. We have invested already a lot with this definition of double use. And I am a little bit afraid to open this debate, uh, to have discussions in the bank, in the European Parliament and so on, and at the end of the day we have nothing. This, for me, and that's a, a, a question to you, give me the projects. Give me the projects and we will see that it's bankable and also eligible, of course. Now, time is running. Uh, another example is uh, cybersecurity. It was mentioned several times. Now, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that we shall uh, launch a study, study from the bank, about cybersecurity. What is the situation of cybersecurity in Europe? And well, you must wait, of course, for the, for the study when it's published, but I can tell you that when you Uh, read this study in the 
after the 20th of, of October, you will find some conclusions, and I can already uh, say something about this uh, conclusion of conclusions of the study. There are fewer in numbers than when you, when you compare with other parts in the world. We have not enough companies that are active in cybersecurity. They raise less funding. Public spending, uh, when you uh, look to that, is very low when you compare with the United States. There is fragmentation. There, there is no holistic strategy, uh, strategy for uh, cybersecurity. And that are examples that you can also uh, make the same conclusions when you talk about other um, elements of defense and security. Do you, this, we must do something about, about that. And of course, there is a lot, and the Commission have already underlined what he have done. And I have here a list. Defense financing landscape. I must say, it's impressive. Uh, you, you have the European Defense Fund, you have the European Defense Innovation Scheme, you have Innovation Fund NATO, you have CESI, of course, from the National Bank, you have military, uh, military mobility, you have uh, space, you have defense innovation NATO, Diana, you have accelerator for the North uh, Atlantic, Diana, you have uh, hub for EU defense innovation, you have the European Innovation Council. Ten initiatives recently taken. This, the question is, ladies and gentlemen, when we have a third conference about space, security, and defense. Next year, I hope. What will be the result? And I hope that it's for you clear that Europe is ready. That there are still some things that we must tackle. But I can assure you that you have, when you have projects, when you need finance, European Investment Bank, that is the combination of European institution and bank for the European Union, will examine your project. We will take care of you and see what we can do. This I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Peters. I hope, uh, well, the work you are undertaking at the IB will uh, bear fruit and well hopefully indeed we'll see you next year and uh, see where we are in the European defense landscape. Um, well, no Ambassador Znamenakova, it is an honor to welcome you to the second European Defense and Security Conference. Of course as a pres representative of the Czech Republic but also as the Czech EU Council Presidency. Uh, it is even more so uh, since Czech Republic is a key member state in the European defense landscape. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, let me state from the very beginning, I'm really glad I'm here and uh, can address this uh, distinguished uh, audience and even after uh, Commissioner uh, Breton and uh, European Investment Bank, that's uh, really um, a pleasure. Uh, why I'm here today uh, and standing in front of you, that's uh, uh, because uh, the Czech Republic uh, has, uh, has got uh, uh, its um, uh, six months uh, presidency right now. Uh, we are uh, in the middle right now, so um, fingers crossed for next uh, three months. Uh, I wanted uh, to flag and um, to underline some of uh, our priorities uh, for you to know uh, what uh, is already behind us, but uh, what is uh, in front of us. But uh, uh, let me first uh, state uh, one uh, overarching principle uh, and uh, overarching priority as I heard uh, the, the uh, interventions before, and that's uh, the cooperation and synergies. Uh, cooperation and synergies um, among uh, the EU institutions, member states uh, and industry. Because uh, uh, this is really uh, uh, inevitable and of course we all cannot uh, uh, make it uh, without uh, you, that's obvious. 
So um, let me just uh, tell you what happened uh, with our priorities after 24th uh, February, because uh, it was uh, a big bang, big bank uh, for us. We were preparing uh, for the presidency uh, two years, and uh, suddenly after Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine, uh, we had to, uh, let's say, reflect and uh, uh, rewrite and changed uh, almost uh, everything, but uh, some um, elements uh, stayed there. And uh, let me flag that it was uh, uh, the stress on uh, uh, resilience, uh, of course, uh, cooperation and uh, uh, EU capabilities, and of course, um, uh, hybrid, uh, countering hybrid uh, threats. Uh, if I uh, uh, go uh, through, um, uh, let's say, implementation of a strategic compass uh, for us, uh, it, it's a it's very uh, obvious task. And um, after the French presidency, we are trying our best uh, to reach um, uh, the objectives uh, that uh, were set uh, uh, in the compass. And uh, let me say that uh, the compass was finished um, uh, one month uh, after uh, the Russian invasion invasion and uh, it was uh, another, uh, let's say, uh, effort uh, and uh, uh, show off that uh, we can do it together and that we can uh, agree to, uh, on uh, our uh, joint and common uh, approach. And as uh, Commissioner said, uh, uh, after uh, what, uh, what happened, um, we cannot take our peace and security in Europe uh, for granted. And uh, I, I would uh, think that uh, this is another overarching uh, priority or logo of uh, our presidency. So, uh, um, uh, well, uh, beside the compass, um, uh, I would spare uh, a few sentences on uh, EU capabilities because uh, uh, there were mentioned uh, um, uh, some initiatives, of course, uh, from our side, huge support uh, to uh, European uh, Defence Fund. Um, what uh, is uh, on our shoulders right now is uh, Ederpa, be, um, because uh, I mean, again, from very obvious reason, uh, we are all trying to help Ukraine and uh, we are running out of stocks. This is instrument that uh, uh, should uh, replenish uh, our stocks um, uh, and uh, hopefully, I really hope that uh, the Czech presidency can uh, finish uh, Adirpa in, uh, let's say, general uh, uh, approach. Then uh, research and development uh, was mentioned. Again, uh, one of um, uh, uh, the things we uh, uh, as Czechs uh, wanted to uh, underline. Um, and uh, here I'm coming to very important uh, uh, two keywords for us. Uh, that's resilience and uh, countering uh, hybrid threat. Uh, let me just... Um, uh, flag that um, uh, coincidentally, uh, right now in Prague, uh, in parallel, there is a, a big um, uh, Czech presidency conference uh, on uh, uh, countering uh, hybrid uh, malign activities and uh, uh, let's say also uh, kind of brainstorming how to boost uh, the European uh, uh, resilience. Uh, on uh, uh, hybrid threats, um, uh, let's say uh, I would uh, uh, take one particular thing, uh, and that's uh, the countering uh, against uh, um, uh, foreign uh, uh, interference, manipulation, information, let's say disinformation. And uh, this is uh, something we uh, want to really uh, uh, focus on uh, VR. Uh, there are two council conclusions um, already done, and uh, uh, we are um, uh, having some, some more detailed uh, work going on. Uh, let's say one uh, of uh, uh, the last uh, priorities I got um, uh, on, the, on the list, uh, and I should have started actually with, with this one, is EU-NATO cooperation. 
let's say uh, oh, we are working and we have been working very hard uh, to get um, uh, the third uh, EU NATO declaration signed. Um, uh, it uh, uh, could have happened in Prague uh, last uh, week, but hopefully uh, in uh, weeks uh, to come uh, it will uh, happen in Brussels. So we are uh, on track uh, on this one and uh, uh, this is uh, probably again one of uh, the highlights. Uh, my colleagues also put into my notes uh, one uh, uh, very important uh, of IRA or, or, or field, um, uh, and that's uh, uh, a space. Uh, and uh, again, uh, our full support uh, to work uh, on the EU space uh, strategy and uh, security uh, and uh, uh, defense, uh, which was already uh, discussed. Um, uh, and uh, in uh, this area, uh, we are really emphasizing uh, the use of uh, existing uh, capacities and especially the cooperation between uh, the European Commission uh, member states and our agencies, um, uh, European Space Agency, and uh, EUSPA, uh, which uh, uh, has its uh, headquarters uh, uh, in, in Prague. And uh, uh, probably my uh, final remark um, uh, is uh, uh, on uh, uh, the military support to Ukraine. Uh, this is a huge one and uh, very important. Uh, you know that uh, uh, so far, we use uh, for that uh, European um, uh, peace facility, uh, and uh, uh, there will be hopefully uh, another another tranche um, uh, agreed uh, uh, by Foreign Affairs Council next Monday. Uh, but uh, uh, as always, uh, everything's uh, about money. So uh, EPF uh, and uh, at, at the end um, uh, is facing, um, uh, let's say, debate and discussion uh, on its uh, financial uh, sustain sustainability. But uh, help uh, to uh, Ukraine is um, uh, on the top uh, for our Czech efforts uh, in the council and uh, it goes uh, hand in ha uh, hand in hand uh, with uh, the effort to to boost our uh, EU uh, capabilities and uh, investments to uh, um, our uh, or replenishing uh, our uh, military stocks so thank you very much uh, I stop here and uh, will uh, follow the discussion Ambassador Znamenakova, thank you very much for being here with us today. I know I have the great pleasure of welcoming on stage uh, Chief Executive of the European Defense Agency, Mr. Shirivi. Uh, well, of course, sir, this morning we've heard about the implementation of the strategic compass and the future of joint pro programming and procurement, which, of course, uh, in which the European Defense Agency plays a key role. Uh, so, sir, I'm certain that uh, the, all the participants gathered here are keen in hearing your views on the future of European defense and how you see the role of the European Defense Agency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, thank you for uh, the invitation. It's good to be here again. Last year, uh, this uh, conference was virtual. Now uh, you have a full house, which is an excellent sign of uh, at least some uh, positive uh, developments around us. Now, I, uh, I will put aside my speaking points and will focus on what you mentioned and above all uh, the role of the European Defence Agency in our joint effort uh, to mitigate or to bridge uh, uh, defence investment gaps. But first, just a few remarks on who we are. Uh, we are intergovernmental organisation established by the member states, four member states, with three uh, major roles. The first one is that we serve as the uh, principal uh, platform for prioritization of capabilities for the member states. And to that end, the main framework instrument is Capability Development Plan, which formulates uh, the last review of that plan, uh, 2018, uh, formulates 11 uh, priority 
uh, capability priority areas that then orient all uh, projects from uh, permanent structured cooperation, PESCO, through European Defence Industrial Development Programme, precursor to European Defence Fund and European Defence Fund as such, uh, in order to keep coherence and the right directions uh, of uh, European uh, defence planning capability development. Second uh, role, uh, is indeed project management uh, of various kinds. I'm not going to uh, more details, but one thing that I would like to mention is that uh, also what we have in our legal base is uh, that we can serve as acquisition or procurement agency. And now we have already done uh, several successful projects such as uh, procurement of uh, uh, the entire tank ammunition for Carl, Carl Gustav uh, a weapon uh, for uh, on behalf of uh, several member states, or uh, we are, as we speak, actually uh, 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 procuring agency for services such as uh, Air Medevac uh, in uh, uh, operations, EU operations missions in Africa, or satellite com communication for member states and several EU agencies, or satellite imagery. So. We are actually, uh, on behalf of the member states, upon their uh, request, we are ready uh, to serve also as a joint procurement agency. And the third role, uh, we, we serve as a facilitator uh, between member states, ministries of defense, but also industries vis-a-vis -vis or towards, as a bridge towards wider EU policies. And here perhaps I would mention one uh, very important, uh, which is uh, single European sky. Now. Defence investment gaps, and it is uh, quite known that there was a uh, tasking, uh, uh, and it was in March, uh, heads of states and government meeting at Versailles, um, uh, um, tasking the Commission in coordination with the European Defence Agency to uh, uh, provide analysis of defence investment gaps and to propose solutions uh, how to uh, uh, mitigate uh, those uh, gaps in view of, at the same time, indeed strengthening the European uh, defence uh, industrial and technological base. Now, to that end, uh, we uh, uh, wrote, we developed in the agency a scoping paper, which is attached to the joint, uh, to the joint communication uh, issued by the Commission and other actors on the 18th of May, and in that, paper, we proposed uh, some sort of, I would say, soft methodology how to measure those uh, gaps. And, and indeed, those gaps are coming from the deep past. And the first, I would say, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, um, uh, parameter in that respect, or the first source of that, indeed, are uh, or were uh, the uh, peace dividends expected after the end of the Cold War. But then, indeed, uh, we have seen a quite a sharp and deep uh, uh, drop down uh, as, a con as, as the consequence, uh, a consequence of the 2008-09 uh, global uh, financial and economic crisis. And here I would like to emphasize that actually the EU member states got back onto the level of the uh, 2007 spending means right the year before uh, before the uh, before the uh, crisis started only around 2020 2021 uh, so you can imagine actually how deep uh, and uh, uh, that gap uh, in investment defense investments uh, and and uh, quite long term actually uh, was, which means that a lot of uh, projects, a lot of capabilities, a lot of uh, programs were either cancelled or, or some, uh, somehow modified or postponed. And we are still coping uh, with, uh, with this. Now, good news is that uh, while uh, last year EU member states altogether were spending something like 220 a billion euro for defense, and this makes us actually the third, uh, 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 the third uh, big, oh, uh, the, 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 the third uh, biggest uh, uh, spender in the world. Uh, we expect from what we are receiving uh, as uh, member states indications, we expect that actually within the next th two, three years, we may see almost 50% increase uh, in uh, defense spending. And, and this is also a big challenge, actually, uh, because indeed how to spend better, how to spend more together, how to also deal with the capacities of, 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 of defense industry, uh, etc. Now, 
to the defense investment gaps. So uh, I said that uh, 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 that uh, there is that uh, past source uh, uh, peace dividends, uh, global crisis, but there is another gap in making uh, mentioned many times as we are delivering uh, arms and the military uh, military uh, material to uh, to uh, to uh, Ukraine essentially uh, depleting our stocks and and one thing which is uh, which is a uh, uh, of a surprise even to most seasoned military experts is the high velocity of consumption of uh, military material, especially ammunition in this kind of high intensity, high intensity war. This is something actually for what we were not, not prepared. Uh? And therefore now we are really uh, coping with, with, the, with the challenge, you know, of uh, uh, really getting and in some uh, member states, allies, even to the critical line of uh, below which simply uh, the essential uh, force readiness would be endangered. And here comes uh, the, uh, the, uh, the proposal that we uh, formulated in our paper. First, uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should have a look at that, uh, those immediate needs uh, of member states uh, in terms of replenishing or refilling, uh, refilling uh, stocks. At the same time, we should be looking at the uh, short to mid uh, term in order to strengthen and sharpen uh, capabilities that we already have. But uh, by all this, we are not going actually to, uh, I would say, what we say by um, um, repairing the past, we are not going to be uh, rightly prepared for the future. Therefore, there is a, a, sh a third a time horizon proposed in our paper, which is mid to longer term, uh, which look uh, 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 aim, uh, which should aim at, uh, let's say, beyond 2030, and uh, which should aim at uh, the European Union having a full spectrum, high end capabilities, that would enable uh, autonomous action in a higher end, uh, higher intensity operations. At the same time, indeed, uh, supporting collective defence uh, in NATO. Now, uh, we are consumed with that short term. To that end, uh, we established together with the Commission and the External Action Service and European military staff a joint task force, which issued a request for information to the member states to, uh, to identify, asking them to identify, um, let's say, um, um, categories of uh, equipment, military material, where they would see the most promising, most needed, uh, 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 most needed opportunities uh, for joint procurement. We have received them through our channels, uh, EDA, because we have uh, a trust and communication channels with the member states. We have analyzed them into seven categories, uh, such as uh, uh, ammunition, anti-tank weapons, anti-air uh, weapons, soldiers equipment, including radio or CBR, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, uh, 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 nuclear uh, uh, protection, uh, uh, protection uh, material, or small arms. And now we are uh, identifying uh, potential clusters of member states in uh, certain categories. Once we've got this actually, and once we have uh, member states actually willing uh, to get together and to seek opportunities for the uh, joint procurement, then it is upon the member states uh, where they were, uh, or how they were decide uh, to procure. Whether they would create some sort of a consortium of, uh, with the lead nation, or whether they would go through OCAR, or indeed uh, we are also ready to open a project for that, uh, for that purpose uh, as, as, as well. Now, at the same time, and this I think it will be a reality check, uh, we will be approaching industry. And we all know actually uh, how uh, many challenges now uh, industry uh, faces uh, in terms of the expectations of ramping up. And those are not only indeed supply chain and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the shortages of material components, uh, uh, precious metals, etc., workforce, uh, uh, but, and this we understand pretty well, but should be very, uh, very much also, uh, I would say, taken in the capitals before any uh, mid to long term robust uh, investments. Indeed, industry needs to have uh, assured robust, predictable, 
uh, 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 guarantee from the governments actually of a mid to longer term, uh, uh, longer term uh, demand. And this is extremely Im important. It's not only about coordinating, organizing the industry, but it's, uh, it's at the same time, and perhaps even more important, about coordinating and organizing the demand. And this is something that we are trying to uh, endeavor, as Commissioner Breton uh, put it, and he uh, focused about above all on the mid to longer term pro prospect, but we should start now, and I believe that we should actually uh, be able to deliver um, as soon as possible, but what, what does it mean as soon as possible, actually? But we speak about urgent, uh, urgent uh, requirements, but if we look at the timelines, even of a quite simple uh, procurement, it's a it's matter of, of many months. If we look at the timelines concerning the new instruments, we are speaking about one year, at least one and a half year, if we take into the account uh, the example of the establishment of the European Defence Fund. Nevertheless, in view of the urgent situation, in view of uh, the uh, really growing demand on all sides, and in view of uh, the funds that are here and there, and incentives that the European uh, Union can offer, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's now or never. Uh, it's now or never. And I believe that uh, through uh, this situation, which uh, initially actually led to more fragmentation, because indeed member states instinctively started to seek individual ways how to replenish their stocks. But I believe that over time, and especially in the mid to long term perspective, especially with the uh, employment of the incentives and instruments that that European Union can uh, and is unique in actually uh, the ability uh, to, to, to generate, I believe that we will manage together with industry uh, work uh, towards, uh, towards more cooperation, more uh, collaborative uh, 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 multinational uh, projects and therefore indeed uh, mitigating not only uh, defense investment gaps and capability gaps as such, but also one of the uh, uh, most uh, I would say, uh, critical weakness uh, of Europe in terms of competitiveness, which is the uh, defense industrial fragmentation. And with these remarks, thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Shedivy, Mr. Shedivy thank you very much uh, for your overview of the role of the European Defense Agency in joint procurement, and uh, especially how to spend more and better. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. The next session on key technologies and the role of R&D in strengthening armed forces will start right away. Thank you very much.
to the second European Defence and Security Conference. I'm sure many of you have been here from the start of the day. And welcome, of course, to those of you joining us online as well. It's great to have you with us. And to this session, which is going to be on the role of key technologies and R&D in strengthening European armed forces. My name is Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I specialize in EU issues, and I'll be moderating this afternoon afternoon's sessions. Just one or two housekeeping issues before we start. So for those of you watching us online, if you would like to submit a question when we get to, I'd say, quite limited time for your questions, can you please put them um, through the Slido platform? And in order to do that, if you go on to slido.com and then input the event code you've been sent, it is hashtag EU Defence Security Conf. For those of you who want to tweet, then the hashtag tag is EU Defence Security Conf. Um, just before we start this session, I'll just give a very brief context to it. As we know, of course, new technologies are developing at an unprecedented pace, and some emerging and disruptive technologies are proving to be critical when it comes to supporting the European Armed Forces. So this session will focus on how key technologies can strengthen and support European armed forces. And when we talk about key technologies, we really mean the likes of artificial intelligence, big data, quantum computing, cyber security, and so on. So we'll also look at the possible development of greater cooperation and collaboration between civil and defense industries to bolster European armed forces, and also be asking what support can be given to further research and development in emerging and disruptive technologies through existing and upcoming EU initiatives. The format of this session will be similar to the ones earlier. We're going to have a conversation with our panelists. It would be great to try and get some questions from you in the room. We will have a roving mic. And of course, again, for those of you watching us online, you can fire them through the Slido app. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, Jean-Francois Ripoche is the Director of Research, Technology and Innovation with the European Defence Agency. Ninka Tijelar is the Head of Unit of the European Defence Fund, the EDF, Implementation Defence Technologies with the European Commission's DG DEFIS. Gregoire de Saint-Contin is a Senior Vice President of Advanced Projects with Prelegence, and Prelegence develops artificial intelligence solutions for analyzing geospatial intelligence data. Mr. de Saint-Contin uses his military operational experience to develop high-tech intelligence and defense capabilities. And finally, Farah Van Wilder is the Business Development Officer with OCAR, the organization, and this is the English translation of the French acronym, the Organization for Joint Armament Cooperation. It's an international organization whose core business is the through life management of cooperative defense equipment programs. And the current OCAR member states are Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom. You're all very welcome, and I should point out that our MEP on the program, unfortunately, couldn't join us today. But we have a very, very good panel. Jean-Francois, if I can start off with you. Do you view key technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data, and quantum, as game changers, or do you think they're more supplements to existing military capabilities? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thanks for, the, for this question. Um, I would say both, um, actually. Um, of course, those, those technologies you just mentioned are often referenced, and you, you did that as uh, emerging disruptive technologies, but their disruptive nature is a potential. They all have it, and then it's all a matter of um, uh, tapping into it, and the key point then is the, the time horizon. Um, in the short term, the military should be uh, enabled to make the best use of the av available technology. 
and possibly using civilian-led uh, developments with military adaptation. And we have already, I think, a good example, and the company we are represented at the, uh, the panel is also a good example, that AI is already a reality. So use it for your military operation. It can help you solve a lot of, of the issue. And AI, I mean, also uh, encompass big data. The, the challenge for the military is to use all the data that is already available, not to let it sleep uh, or rest in uh, hard drives in, in uh, cupboards. When you take the example of quantum, then it's more a mixed thing because quantum sensing is probably very near. Quantum key distribution is also, we've seen a lot of demonstration, there are challenges. Uh, but then when you look at quantum computing, I would say um, it's um, all a different bet. Uh, the experts say on when it will come to really be a reality uh, can range from uh, a few years to a lot of years. So uh, that's also um, the Steinem horizon you have to look at it. So um, how, to, how to navigate through this uh, in, inside uh, the, uh, our domain, I think that well, EDA tries to play a role and um, we perform act foresight activities to detect, because you have to detect those technologies, how, what potential they have to change the military operations, to monitor them, how, how, um, how do they evolve, how the civilian world is taking hold of them, for example, or not. Because some of the EDTs are also um, non-civilian at all, like uh, hypersonic weapons. And then we try to use uh, this work um, to fit this into the capability develop, development plan priorities process to make sure that uh, military people are informed about what technology can bring to them. And then, of course, uh, to do collaborative research because that's um, an high risk, high reward activity. So risk sharing and uh, sharing the benefits when it's successful is also a benefit of the cooperation. And let's just talk further about that cooperation. Maybe one question first. To what extent is there cooperation between the civil and the defence sectors at the moment? And the follow-up on that is, how could that be enhanced to allow the EU and, a member, and member states to be leaders in the development of disruptive technologies? Well, I think well, together with the colleagues of Commission, that's, that's clear that um, we see the, the huge effort that is done at EU level to invest in technologies and, uh, and there's a vibrant landscape of academia, research and technology organization, industry, um, that has a lot of good ideas and technology. Uh, but some of them are not um, part of the defense landscape there. We usually refer to them as the non-traditional player. And the key thing is to develop those synergies so that, that they can be attracted uh, to the defense domain. Um, they have to understand the, 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 the challenge. Uh, so I think the, the key words here are awareness, shared awareness. The so-called non-traditional uh, players, they, they should understand the military environment and the challenges. The military world, defense world, should be aware of what um, uh, the civilian world can bring. Uh, I'm personally convinced that there's always an adaptation uh, to make. There's, uh, Rarely, very rarely a turnkey solution coming from the civilian world. Um, and then in, in, the key word, um, I, I would put this under the, the umbrella of innovation. So use a, a more innovation framework, complementing traditional uh, research and technology work. So you can think about innovation prizes. We already run one uh, at EDA. You can think about experimentation, um, where you can really assess the gap between um, the state of play of technology and what is needed to field it and put uh, some equipment in the, in the hands of the soldiers. Okay, and, and maybe uh, Ninka Tidele, if I can move on to you in terms of that innovation and, 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 and looking at what can be developed. What is the EU doing to include small companies and innovators in European defence fund projects or indeed related EU technology initiatives? Yes, thank you very much for that question. 
Uh, you heard our commissioner just say about uh, how many entities already participate in the European Defence Fund, uh, and that's only the first year. We just started with this fund, and we have over 700 entities that we will select for uh, that we have selected for funding. We just have to sign the contract still, and we have over uh, on average 18 entities from eight member states participating in each project. And I must say, I find this personally quite overwhelming because when we were designing the funds, I don't think we had expected uh, this take up so quickly and the interest and the need. And I think the European Defence Fund also set a new path of cooperation and intensity of cooperation because after all, it's when you work on the ground in projects when things really become intense. No, it's one thing to speak about uh, strategies on a table, but really to work in project makes the, uh, makes the intensity much bigger. So as from the beginning in the European Defence Fund, it has been set up to make it attractive for SMEs and to ensure also there's a place in the fund for all member states and all types of companies and organisations. And so uh, uh, the fund already has uh, several options and mechanisms to attract small companies. No, there is a bonus if you involve uh, cross-border SMEs. It's positively evaluated when we are selecting the project. And also we have special calls for uh, SMEs on top of the regular thematic calls, where of course also already a lot of SMEs participate. Um, you've also heard our commissioner speak about uh, the European Defence Innovation Scheme. And this is what I would highlight. It's the commission, it's our endeavour in DG Diff is also to attract uh, new companies, uh, non-traditional players, as had been referred to, but also te new technologies and technologies that have been developed in the civil, uh, for civil applications also to the defence. And that's why we have tried to uh, integrate in the European Defence Fund actually a lot of mechanisms that already exist for many years in programmes such as Horizon Europe. So we try to develop a tailored set, a tailored two set to, to attract innovators also to the uh, European Defence Fund. So we started with, with coaching services for SMEs, for example, to help them, also guide them through uh, running a, a, a cooperative research project and also how to bring then the outcome to the market. We already uh, have an open, have a call running for technological challenges where, where different teams know, are, are working on different solutions for the fence challenge. And we also have put money aside from the EDF to allow uh, 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 the EIF um, to make a product also uh, to attract private equity funds to invest in European SMEs that, have, that work in the defence area. And I think uh, personally that this is very important to create also such an EU ecosystem on investors you know, for these uh, high-tech companies that also participate in the area of defence. And then uh, uh, two other measures that we intend to, to introduce very soon in the fund is a so-called uh, spin-in calls where we try to, to develop dedicated calls and to bring in technologies that have been developed under, for example, the Horizon Euro programs that are particularly interesting also for the fans and users. And so basically with that, we also address a little bit of what you can call an information gap no? of the fans and users, which technologies may be potentially interesting to integrate uh, in the fans R&D projects. And then, as, as Jean-Francois pointed out, to do additional research no? to cover the, the fans delta. And, uh, and, and we also intend to do uh, uh, calls to give access to testing facilities for SMEs and run hackathon and hackathon. So basically, the whole set of, of tools that is developed in the, uh, in the civil domain, we want to try also to integrate them in the European Defence Fund. And uh, to conclude with this, that to say that uh, we think this is very important, especially to bring also technologies like cyber, artificial intelligence, when, where developments have been much quicker no, uh, for civil applications, to make it easier and more attractive and also find ways to quicker show the potential of these type of applications for, for the fence. So I would like to leave it with this. 
and uh, and happy to respond to to any follow up questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ninka. And just speaking about artificial intelligence and quantum computing and and cybersecurity, we're hearing they're so strategic technological domains which will impact both on civil and military areas. But do the existing EU programs, such as now the European Defence Fund, which you've been talking about, do they really provide enough support um, to research and development to address the shortfalls in these sectors? Well, of course, um, we always say <laughs> here on this forum that we should do more now, we should invest more. But I think we also uh, already, um, when it comes to specifically the defense applications, can do a lot to, uh, to, to, to look for what's already out there and to try to, to better integrate them in the defense and to have more... Um, to have more modular systems in defense so that it's easier to integrate new technologies no, uh, um, uh, and to uh, keep them uh, up to date no, and, uh, and, and keep the momentum there. Okay, maybe we'll come back to you too to talk a little bit more about the collaborations between those working in the civil area who may be working on programs and how they're integrating with maybe those working in the defence sectors. We'll come back to you on that. But if I may go to you, uh, Grégoire de saint Conta, can you tell me how can key technologies help when it comes to adapting to now, as we know, uh, an ever-changing landscape when it comes to the threats we face in Europe? Thank, thank you for your question. Uh, in his uh, pending remarks, uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Peters said uh, everything is going very fast. Mm. And uh, actually, we, we need now uh, to understand this ever-changing and complex threat landscape uh, to fight and win out. Uh, we must, for that, we must acquire uh, informational superiority. And uh, this informational superiority is a matter, uh, first, of might. Uh, superior strengths, and, uh, and secondly, of agility. Uh, to cope with might, uh, thanks to decades of investments in sensors, our armed forces have access to millions of data uh, daily. Uh, the right information is not obvious to find. Intelligence services don't have the human resources nor the time to analyze it all. They constantly have to make choices and leave aside most of the data they gathered. In the highly uncertain context we are evolving in, such uh, shortcomings put us at risk and are unacceptable, especially when the solution does exist. Artificial intelligence delivers computing power, fusion, and data processing capabilities. AI hardens our armored forces thanks to a thorough understanding of the uh, threat landscape with no need of added human resources. I can give you an example. If you have seen on the slides in the opening uh, video, uh, some slide of, of our product, uh, Robin. Robin uh, is an AI solution powered by Preligence that analyzes 100% of the geosatellite imagery in near real time. It automatically detects, identifies, and classifies observable of <coughs> military interest and notifies analysts of change in strategic sites. Among other features, such as aircraft, vessels, armored vehicles, it can, for example, count thousands of tents uh, on uh, uh, refugee camps if you consider a conflict zone. And you, you need that count, counting tents is, is important to know exactly the number of refugees you have. If it's increasing or decreasing, it's very important for, to support uh, uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, action of NGOs or uh, international organizations. Uh, but counting tents, this is renewed to be a highly tedious task for analysts. Uh, it can take hours every day uh, and AI ensures uh, them a uh, huge time saving. It's a matter of minutes with our product, uh, and it guarantees a high degree of accuracy. It's uh, a good example of what the might of uh, AI can, can bring to uh, understand and to informational uh, superiority. 
My second point is about agility. Uh, the geostrategic landscape requires operational solutions that evolve together with the threats. AI put our armed forces in a position of strength because it keeps them one step ahead of the adversary of the threat. Thanks to AI, new data is continuously uh, integrated by gathering uh, multi-domain inputs from multiple sensors in a comprehensive output. This gives warfighters real-time situational awareness, and this advantage must be seized now. At Pregents, uh, we provide AI solutions that are directly operational on the battlefield and in the, the headquarters, giving immediate values to the, uh, its users. And we work uh, according to an agile process, meaning that agility is uh, on, the, on, on, on the battlefield, it's for operational uh, staff, but also agility is uh, in ac this agility is in accordance with the ag agility or agile uh, process model that is an interactive development approach based on co-development. So our technology change at the same pace uh, of the strides and gives armed forces state-of-the-art advantage on the ground. And to see it more broadly and to conclude, um, you know, um, we see uh, that we are facing hybrid, hybrid threat and, uh, with the uh, ever-changing uh, environment. And uh, we need also to have the good information about our vulnerability, but because we have to, uh, to think that our adversary are studying our vulnerabilities for a while now. And um, our uh, systems are very complex and very integrated. So if you, if you cannot rely on uh, computing, on AI capability to uh, detect your own vulnerability, you know, you are not able to, uh, to protect yourself. And if you want to protect Europe tomorrow, uh, we need also to have this uh, power of new technology uh, to, uh, to identify where uh, our vulnerability are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting, the power of new technology. That was really fascinating what you talked about this. Was it Robin? Is that what you uh, call your system of scanning this information, being able to yeah. tell how many refugees might yeah. be somewhere? But that's made by Prélégeant, I presume. Yeah. And you're selling directly to the defence industry, or you are working directly with the defence industry. Because I'm wondering... How, what are the challenges when it comes to a company that has developed this type of amazing technology? How does it work with the defence industries then, the defence sectors, to ensure they get the benefit of those technologies? I think that all the key technologies we are discussing now are, have the same quality to uh, probably uh, be able to re-engineer uh, our defence. You know, AI is a baseline capability, and probably tomorrow quantum will be a baseline, you know, uh, added value. So um, I think that we are at a moment where uh, new technologies can, and this key technology can re-engineer our defense. And uh, the first consequences will be more interoperability, uh, integration versus fragmentation. It's not only our market in Europe that is fragmented. As far as you, uh, as you uh, speak of uh, operational issues, you know, the first um, problems that the commander has to uh, deal with is uh, uh, siloting of, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, uh, for example, the, uh, the war between services, between different domains that the US called domain, you mean tomorrow uh, AI could be a strong, you know, uh, integrator uh, throughout or uh, across all, all the domain, you know, because the data is a domain uh, agnostic, you know, the data uh, don't understand if it's a Navy or Air Force or land, uh, uh, land data. So it will probably be a strong game changer tomorrow. And we are seeing about it now. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ferry Van Wilder, if, or Wilder, if I can go to you, you're a business development officer with 
Ocar, can the EU reach technological sovereignty and autonomy? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, the short answer is yes. The correct answer is yes, but. But <laughs> because there is always a condition. And the condition in this case is a word you probably have heard tens of times today, and that word is cooperation. If we continue as Europeans to rely on our strategic partner across the ocean and rely on foreign military sales, for instance, we will not achieve that sovereignty or autonomy. Because the word sales, it says itself what it means. You get what you buy, you have no say in the development of requirements, uh, and basically it is take it or leave it. So what we as international organization are claiming is that the only way to get towards this sovereignty is by increased cooperation on three different levels. First of all, cooperation with nations. Second, cooperation between industries. Third, which is most forgotten of all, is cooperation between international organizations. Let me give you some examples. Cooperation between nations is the only way with the necessary political will to get rid of protectionism in order to get capabilities delivered to the nations in the defense arena. Currently, we have, if we, take a little, if we make a little comparison, in the States about 30 plus major weapon systems, while in Europe we have 170 plus major weapon systems. So that doesn't make any sense at all. Because, again, those words have uh, fallen on multiple occasions today. Uh, duplication of effort, fragmentation, less interoperability, etc. Now, besides those numbers, we still see, for instance, discussions between nations on Tempest versus FCAS. Does that make sense? We don't believe so. Second, we have a need for increased cooperation between industry. And we are fully aware of the fact that this is not easy to achieve. But it is possible. Let me give you another example. Eurodrone. Eurodrone is a program managed by OCAR, co-funded by the European Union through the European Commission in EDIDP, where big industries such as Airbus, Dassault and Leonardo found a compromise, signed contracts in order to develop one weapon system. So that cooperation between industries is possible. It is hard to achieve, but it is still possible. And then finally, there is a need for increased cooperation between international organizations, and that is an aspect which is often forgotten. First of all, OCAR, and thanks for introducing the organization, uh, OCAR is managing about 100 billion euros of programs. But the organization is unknown. So, to put it bluntly, nobody knows OCAR, but most people know the programs which are managed by OCAR. For instance, A400M. Everybody has seen during the evacuation of Kabul not so long ago that A400Ms were used in order to evacuate people from Afghanistan outside of the country. Nobody knows that the program, the A400M, is managed by OCAR. What we mean is that what we do as an organization, we can do it in cooperation with other international organizations such as EDA, NSPA and the Commission. OCAR is an independent international organization. In the acronym you don't find the letters E, P or N, which means we are not linked to the European Union, we are not linked to NATO, and we are not a procurement agency because we are a program management agency, which covers a lot more than just pure, pure procurement. What we're saying is that as an independent organization, we have the flexibility to cooperate with our possible partners in the world, and especially in Europe, which are EDA, NSPA and the Commission. Just to give you one final example before I close uh, is MMF. EDA, a couple of years ago, has defined a capability gap in air-to-air -air refueling. 
EDA said we need to do something about it. Well, the nations decided to buy a number of airframes, air to air refueling and also transport, air for, uh, transport airframes, the MRTT based on the Airbus A330, which will be owned by NATO, but bought by OCAR on behalf of NATO. So in the end, the cooperation is possible, but it is not used often enough. Can I just ask you one quick question? I mean, you talked about cooperation, national industry and international as well. Um, we know how sensitive it is in terms of defence capabilities of individual EU member states. They want to be able to control that area themselves. Hence, no doubt, you have all these different projects in different EU member states. How do you break through that? I mean, how do you get 27 member states, some of which, like my own country, are neutral, to pull together to say, we will build one defence system for all of the bloc, and we won't be duplicating, and we won't put our national interests ahead of, we'll say, the interests of the bloc? Well, fortunately for us, we don't have to work with 27 different nations. That's one thing. <laughs> we have six member states, and we currently have eight participating states. So program by program, we need to check with all the nations which are participating in a certain program what they want to do. The bottom line is that it's always the nations who instruct OCAR on what they want to achieve, what the end objective is and how they want to achieve it. So it's not OCAR as an independent organization that independently decides and defines its approach towards a capability. It's always the nations who do that. So it's up to, unfortunately, the nations who have to agree amongst themselves in order to tell OCAR, this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. Okay, challenging. Um, does anybody have a question at this stage? Or indeed, for those of you watching online, please put them through the slido.com platform. But anybody in the room, first of all, just raise your hand if any one of you want to ask any of our panelists a question. I don't want to be monopolizing everything if there are questions. Okay, I don't see any hands up. There's one more. Oh, is there? Okay. Oh, the light is right on. Yeah, great. Can we get a microphone over to the gentleman? Thank you. Yeah, I'm Frederick Moreau. I'm a lawyer and a researcher. And my question goes to General Saint-Quentin. Have you integrated some uh, ethical reflections in uh, artificial intelligence development? Very good question. Thank you uh, for your uh, for this question. Yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. So we have we have uh, integrated this ethical issue. Uh, this has been discussed uh, among the employees of, of the company. We have a, a kind of manifesto, which is online, so you can uh, you can see it. And uh, it's a it's a very interesting question. And this question is ever coming first. Uh, uh, when it comes to AI uh, issues for, for defense or, or intelligence. Um, you know, I am a former operational officer, so uh, I have quite a good um, example to know how it, how it uh, occurs in an in operational center. You know, we have process. Uh, for example, you have a, an intelligence process, and at each step, of the process, you have uh, a step of validation, you know, a moment of validation. So uh, at each step, the, the man is in the loop. And our AI product are just providing not uh, a kind of bypass of this step of vali validation, but an assistance to uh, the guys that are collecting, orienting the, the sensors, and so and so. Uh, but not uh, a, a bypass. So that our first, you know, um, responsibility is to help uh, the intelligence or analyst uh, to uh, do their job uh, current, correctly, and, but not to bypass the validation uh, process first. The second thing is to uh, have uh, a kind of uh, technology ethic by design. Uh, meaning that to think about how our algorithms are working uh, from scratch. And um, 
I can say you that our uh, data scientists are very, very careful about that and uh, very concerned about that. Uh, and um, that's why we have this, uh, this manifesto, you know, and they want to be able to, uh, um, to show to the analyst how the algorithm has processed the data and um, to explain or to be accountable of uh, the result of, of the artificial intelligence. And it's uh, integrated from scratch in the design of, of our algorithm. Uh, for example, they keep uh, the training data and test data for, uh, uh, that allow us to, uh, you know, to raise the level of performance of our, of our algorithm. They keep it for themselves if there are any problem, you know, to, to uh, be able to uh, re-engineer uh, or uh, retro-engineer, sorry, uh, the, the way the algorithm is working. So it's not only, you know, a purely uh, kind of, uh, of uh, only words in a manifesto, but it's a, it's a way to work uh, day, by day to day. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, maybe if I can come back to you, Jean-Francois. Uh, How can the European Defence Agency help reinforce innovation in disruptive technologies that either are being used in the military domain or could be used in the military domain. Yes, thank you. And then I will also um, take the opportunity to repeat a, yes. a bit back to your question about how, how, how to foster cooperation. I think also that that's what we do in EDA, and that's linked to your last question. Um, our so-called priority framework, for me, it's really... Um, to um, build what is the field of possible uh, in the cooperation domain. We are not aware of all the national priorities because some of them are nationalized only. But when people come at EDA, for example, in our CAPTEX, Capability uh, Technology Development Group, they say where they are willing to cooperate. So in the end, you've got this picture at 27, or the ones that participate, I say, look, in this technological domain, I'm, re I'm ready and willing to participate. And then you can move to the project phase, and, and that's uh, what we do. And um, linking this to innovation and the link to the civilian world, then that's really what we uh, want to augment with the initiative of uh, having um, a hub for European defense innovation uh, that was agreed in, in last May, is that it's to make this link, use those communities that are the member states' uh, ministries of defense, link with the user so that um, also the ones who bring solutions from, uh, or technologies from the civilian domain, they will be in contact with the military user, but that, because that's also uh, really the, the, um, the thing. And um, some of the solution can be standalone, some of the solutions, they have to be integrated in a wide, wider defense EU system. So what we bring in, in, in our user community, I encompass uh, the, the more traditional defense suppliers. But sometimes that's, uh, you can use our forum, our IDA framework, to build partnerships with the ones that will incorporate your solution in a bigger solution. That's also how we, we really, I think, we can help. And, and really our goal with the HEDI, the, this hub is really to accelerate, to um, take less time to go from the detection of a good idea, of a good a promising solution, from the time uh, to, for it to be in the hands of the soldier once again. Because that's really, I think it was said, and um, um, I was in Sweden recently, and what was quoted to us from uh, the, the Sweden, uh, Swedish uh, chart is that before we had no budget, but all the time, and now we have more budget and no time. So really, time is, <laughs> time is of the essence. So, and uh, this innovation culture uh, spirit is also all about it. Um, where it's available, let's be more pragmatic and get closer to the, to the field and faster to the field. Okay, faster to the field. That, that is a key message so far, isn't it? And I suppose if I can go back to you, Ninka, if we talk about disruptive technologies, particularly uh, for those that could be used in the military domain, how is the EU funding helping in that sense to reinforce innovation in disruptive technologies that could be used for defence and security? Yeah, well, in, in, in the European Defence Fund, for example, we have allocated uh, up to 8% of the budget now for this type of, uh, of, uh, of, of technologies. 
and uh, where we also have, have open calls no, to make sure that uh, we, we reach the right uh, wide um, area. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a focus of the EDF. So, so as was said before, uh, uh, yes, we need to ask the question, what are the big systems no, that the member states want to develop together? And uh, of course, uh, uh, we also want to use the EDF as a possibility you know, to also fund these uh, bits and pieces you know, of these bigger systems. But also we want to use it as a fund exactly to, to, uh, you know, to accelerate you know, uh, uh, um, the use of disruptive technologies in defense. And, uh, and, and there also, and I want to, to add to, to what was said to my neighbor on, on, on ethics, you know, uh, it's of course also very important to uh, to um, the, the the ethics assessment of the projects that we fund and and uh, for the European Defence Fund it was also very important for the European Parliament now that we pay proper attention to that. So there uh, we also uh, uh, promote uh, uh, an ethics by design. It was mentioned and and already from the the start of the project proposals asked consortia to, to, to do a self-assessment and then we do a separate evaluation uh, by ethical experts uh, and, and we screen proposals and, uh, and we also, um, uh, when we assign the grant agreements, uh, uh, consortia also have to comply with uh, measures that the ethical experts uh, recommend you know, to, to, to put in those projects. So I think all these elements are, are extremely important, especially when you speak about you know, uh, disruptive technologies and, and, uh, and technologies like uh, artificial intelligence. I could imagine that's challenging when you have to look at the ethics of something that could be used in a, in a defense military environment, especially if you're talking about approval from you know, MEPs, some of them who may be very against uh, defense and spending money on defense issues. Yeah, well, the first thing was, of course, to, to be very clear, no, but uh, that goes without saying, no, that everything we do uh, complies with, uh, with the relevant, no, uh, union and international law, but also with the, the uh, ethical principles reflected in these uh, laws. And, uh, and we made very clear that we won't find any uh, lethal autonomous weapons, no, without the uh, human intervention in, in engagement. So the, with that, we already frame no, what we can and, and, and cannot finance. And then the ethical assessment uh, also looks at, at testing, no, uh, uh, animal testing, uh, no, uh, things like that. So it's an, uh, it's an aspect which is, of course, also in the civil domain assessed uh, by our colleagues on Horizon, but it's particularly important also in the defense domain. Okay. Farah, I'll just go back to you because Gregor had a, a question to him, but just maybe again in terms of EU funding, how do you think EU funding um, can help to reinforce innovation in disruptive technologies that are being used or could be used in a military domain? Well, first of all, we believe that EDF is an incredible initiative, without any doubt. What we should not, uh, what we should focus on is the end result. Mm -hmm. EDF is a tool that allows us to cooperate, us being nations, industry, everybody. But the end result for defense should be capabilities. So EDF should not be used just for the sake of cooperation, but to cooperate for the sake of development of new capabilities for defense. And that is sometimes forgotten. So although the tool is there, we believe that the focus should be kept on the capabilities themselves. Now let me just give a simple example. We have worked with uh, the predecessor of EDF, EDIDP, where the nations have asked us uh, with co-funding from EDIDP to develop a Eurodrone, same uh, uh, same uh, project again. The difference with EDF now is that this was an existing program, so the end objective was clear. We know what we need. Now with EDF, to give another example, one of them, and it was uh, touched upon this morning, uh, the European Patrol Corvette. It doesn't exist yet, as far as we know, so it needs to be developed. And everybody needs to be in line with the end objective, which is a patrol vessel. So 
the first start of that big initiative, which combines different nations from the Mediterranean uh, with Norway and Denmark, with industries from those nations and with different international organizations, that again proves that there is a possibility for EDF to create big things and to initiate big things, but the focus should be kept on the development of the capabilities themselves and not just cooperation for the sake of cooperation. The development and the capabilities themselves? Yes. And do you think that is happening, will happen? Well, um, without being negative, uh, as an organization, OCAR has more than two decades of um, experience in development programs, in production, and in service support. What I'm saying is that we should use each other's strengths, not as competitors, but again as partners. And by using each other's strengths, we will get a better result. If EDA tries to harmonize the nation's requirements, and OCAR, for instance, does procurement on behalf of NATO through whatever agency, it doesn't matter, that is a flow that we are looking for, and that's a cooperation that we are looking for. Now, if all of that is co-funded by the European Commission, then we have the ideal world. Now, is it simple? Obviously not, because otherwise we wouldn't be discussing all of this. But it is something that we have in mind, and that's why, for us, there is only one thing that counts, and that is, again, the same word, cooperation. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. We only have about five minutes left. I want to go back uh, to you, uh, Gregor de saint Conta. Maybe you may want to comment on what is some of the points already made, but, but also we've talked about artificial intelligence, big data and quantum. Do you see them as game changers or are they more just supplements to existing military capabilities? On a broad, on a broad view, it's a game changer, but uh, it uh, augments every, um, not every, but probably, yes, every capability that will be involved in the, in the battlefield uh, tomorrow. So um, that's really a game changer. And if you consider and uh, you, uh, you see all the, um, uh, you know, uh, meetings, uh, papers and, uh, uh, in, the, in the US about AI, uh, there is no paper about different issues without AI inside the paper, you know. It's incredible, the discussion about uh, the game, um, the, this game changer. It's in relation with uh, competition with China, certainly, but when you see the investment of China and, uh, and, uh, and the US for AI in defense, you, know, see, we, you see that probably uh, in France, and probably more broadly in Europe, we are a bit uh, a, step, uh, a step behind. So, uh, and uh, I think that we, we must now um, speed up to, to quote uh, Mr. Or Mr. Breton in his opening remarks. Is Europe way behind China and the United States in that respect? They are a step ahead. Europe is a step. No, they are. My a perception step. is about AI. Yes, China and, and the US are a step ahead in uh, implementing AI in their different system, because they see it as a baseline capability and not only a supplement for uh, intelligence or for operation or for uh, navy or force or whatever. And can Europe? gain ground in this? And what are the implications if yes, it can? Yes, certainly, because we have talented uh, data scientists and engineers. The only thing that we have to, to do, except funding, but funding is it's, uh, the, the core uh, you know, uh, features or the core parameter, but uh, uh, it's also to have an, um, a framework where we deal with this ethic uh, legitimate concern but that um, make our uh, startup and young companies mm. able to develop, um, to develop products that will be real, really helpful for the war fighters. And so that we will be able to defend Europe tomorrow. 
Okay, we'll look on that point because we're running way behind. We will leave it, but I want to say a very big thanks to our four panellists. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could show your appreciation to our four panellists, Jean-Francois Repoche, Minka Tegeler, Gregoire and Ferry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all much. very much. Thank you. Now, um, in the programme, but everything is changing rapidly um, because you're free to go, so you can... Um, Take and, and if you can give back your microphones, we're going to go straight on. We're not going to have the um, uh, break. If you want a cup of coffee, then please, by all means, you can take your coffee and you can just bring it back in um, now. Because what we're going to do is go straight on with the next segment. So everybody is fleeing. Are we? Oh, well, will you give me? Will you? Oh, my mic is still on. Can you turn my mic off? Microphone off. Um, how do you pronounce yeah, Robert? Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah, okay. And you tell me when we're ready to go. You tell me when we're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. What do we have? Ah, General. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. How do I pronounce your name?
So, ladies and gentlemen, if I can ask you to please take your seats, and can you please, can we have silence in the room? So can you please take your seats, and can you please finish your conversations and take your seats, because we have a special guest with us. Uh, let's give this interview its full attention. Thank you for that. So now it's time for our first fireside chat of the afternoon, without the fire in general. Um, and its theme is a view of the European strategic autonomy in defence and security. And I'd like to welcome our guest now for this session. General Robert Brieger is the chairman of the European Union Military Committee, a position he has held since last May. And the EUMC provides the Political and Security Committee, the PSC, with advice and recommendations on all relevant military matters. It oversees military missions and operations under the EU's common security and defence policy, as well as the development of military military capabilities. General, you are very welcome. I know you must be considerably busy given the challenges we are facing at the moment. Let's go straight to that, the war in Ukraine, the implications for the EU. How do you think the war in Ukraine and the threats made by Russia and Vladimir Putin to European countries how could that change the approach, the functioning, and the work of the European Military Committee? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, first of all, for the kind invitation. Uh, I think uh, this unprovoked uh, aggression of Russia to Ukraine is, uh, is often um, addressed as a wake-up call, and, and that's the truth. It, it changes uh, a lot. Um, the mindset, uh, of the European decision makers, uh, they are part of a project of peace, economy, human rights, uh, and all uh, values we, we stand for. But now there, there is a challenge uh, which forces us uh, to reinforce our security and uh, to strengthen our ability to react. So I think it's, it's a game changer. Uh, and. Uh, <sighs> On the other hand, uh, we cannot from, from one minute to the other uh, adopt the whole system. So we, we have a starting point, and this is also depicted in this strategic compass. Uh, essential document um, adopted in uh, March this year, briefly after the outbreak of the war, but it was uh, uh, prepared for more than two years and uh, nevertheless tried uh, to, to implement the last uh, lessons learned uh, from, from this new uh, security situation in Europe. And uh, I do hope there are many disadvantages of this situation, but one advantage should be that we learn the lesson and strengthen our security and our common ability to react. Do you think we'll be involved, that the EU will, will ultimately get involved in this war directly? Um, I, I do not expect uh, this, this kind of escalation. Uh, the European is not a, a warring faction, uh, nor is uh, NATO. Um, what we not can completely exclude is that uh, the Russian aggression uh, will also uh, gain appetite uh, for uh, European soil. Uh, there are some uh, ideas uh, uh, of, of President Putin uh, referring to old uh, historic uh, ties uh, to the Baltic and so on. So uh, we, we have to be on alert uh, and we have to prepare our measures uh, when it comes to another escalation. Um, we uh, cannot exclude this, uh, this sort of, of development and uh, therefore it's one, one more uh, reminder uh, to, to strengthen our abilities uh, to also militarily react if, if necessary. And if that was to happen, and you know, if you look at the events in Ukraine 
just over even the last week or so, it is incredibly so dangerous right now. And it, it's been so bad, but it seems to have got a lot worse. If the EU, Europe finds itself engaged in a war, do you think, though, then, that the, the solidarity and the collective defence within NATO would just automatically come into play? And then, in other words, of course, the range and the powerful military capabilities, for example, of the United States would effectively defend the EU. Is that an automatic assumption that we could make? Yeah, we have still the Article 5 in, in force, and therefore uh, an attack on one uh, NATO nation uh, is... Uh, uh, to be um, taken as an attack on the whole alliance. And uh, the, the vast majority of the EU member states are also a uh, member of the alliance. Not, not all of them, uh, four are, are still missing. And I think that uh, the US support is also uh, still uh, uh, severe uh, and, and crucial uh, means of, of European defense and reaction. Uh, for the future, uh, I would say that uh, the obligation to strengthen uh, European uh, defense uh, capabilities uh, is, uh, is key, is key. Then, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. are, are shifting their interests uh, to the Indo-Pacific for good reasons, and uh, strengthening European abilities, be it EU or NATO, in any case, is strengthening the ability to defend this continent. We cannot, in, in all foreseeable future, relay on external support. It, it was a good solution for, for decades, but for the future, and uh, this is also a lesson from the Ukraine, Europe, Europe must take over more responsibility for its own security. And that is a message that we are hearing a lot now about the need for the EU absolutely to strengthen its defence um, capabilities and security capabilities. But how, what kind of effort would need to be taken to get to that level where Europe could defend itself? There is a, a big array of, of needs uh, we have to keep in mind and, and we have to follow. And uh, I would like uh, to start uh, with our decision-making process. Uh, the decision uh, made to, um, to build in the sanction uh, on, on, the, on the Russian Federation was, was very swift. On the other hand, uh, decisions uh, to launch uh, operations and missions are bound to uh, a clear procedure and, and we have to speed up with this procedure. So uh, we have to strengthen unity and we have uh, to build up uh, within the European Union an uh, own uh, C2 structure, command and control, uh, in order uh, to have the military uh, control uh, of our organization and to, to bring in the capabilities uh, in the right dimension and in the right way. The other uh, aspect is the technique. Uh, uh, we, we have a, a very reliable European defense industry. Uh, we should build up on these abilities also in a cooperative way um, in order not to duplicate our efforts uh, but uh, to have a coordinated system of, of building up the necessary technologies and capabilities for a functioning uh, military system. But, General, how do you get that kind of unity? It was something that came up uh, during the previous discussion as well. You have a block of 27 member states, some, you know, difficult members, as we know, um, and then you have neutral countries as well. You have some um, political groups that do not want greater spending on defense. We know it's a very emotive issue and can be. How do you cut through all of that then? How do you get the kind of unity that you say mm -hmm. is required to really create a robust defense system for, the, for mm -hmm. Europe? Well, as you know, uh, I, I have uh, a twofold function. I have to advise the, the political uh, level in the European Union, um, uh, the, the high rep and also the PSC, on the other hand, uh, I am the primus inter pares uh, within the 27 uh, chiefs of defense. So uh, my, my 
task is to strive for unity in efforts, uh, to, to have uh, the same threat perception, the same ideas, and that's, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, it's not easy. Because you can imagine that, for instance, uh, in, in Lisbon there is another threat uh, perception uh, than in the Baltics. But we, what we have to strengthen is this idea of a common defense culture. We are all living under one roof. And living under one roof uh, means that in a spirit of solidarity we have to help each other and we have to support each other. And uh, this, this is my message uh, to the decision makers. So in my limited capacity I, I try to foster the idea of, of common uh, defense and security. And uh, in, in, this, in this context, the, the war of the Ukraine is, is real again, is, is a reminder and uh, a lesson to, we have to learn and to identify uh, what, what to do, what to, in, in how far we, we should speed up with our efforts. So a, a, lot, a lot to do. And in that creating that culture of defense, of course, you're not just talking presumably about military capabilities. You're Absolutely. talking about cybersecurity and, and other areas as well. Can you give us an idea of you know, what would be required to create that European culture of defense? This culture, uh, well, it, it, it starts uh, in the brain uh, of the decision makers and also in the, in the brain of the public. So the first need is to have the, uh, the best way of strategic communication why uh, are we doing what we, we are t what we intend to do? And then uh, we, we have to make clear there is a broad range of, of threats in this uh, hybrid scenario. It's not only conventional, but we learn from the Ukraine that uh, the tanks and, and airplanes are, are not the, the platforms of the past. We, we still need it in the future, but we need it in a more uh, technological environment. Uh, we need it in a more developed uh, uh, function uh, with all the enablers uh, from, from cyber um, to, to CRS to, um, yes, quantum technology, whatever. And this is also a chance again for the European defense industry uh, to, to step up with these new fields of activities. Uh, the, the first uh, um, and, and foremost uh, task at the moment is to replenish the, uh, the stocks uh, we, we emptied for the support of the Ukraine. But the next step uh, must be to look at the, at the, the war uh, and the threat of the future and how can we cope with it. And do you think the implementation of the strategic compass, does that require adaptation in the light of the war in Ukraine? Well, strategic compass is a, a, very, a, a very flexible and future-oriented document. So I, I don't think there is a, a crucial need for adopting. But uh, we, will, uh, we will repeat with our uh, threat assumptions uh, every, every about two years, and then maybe there, there will be uh, steps of uh, completion and, and also adoption, but in general, it's, it's a good document with a lot of tasks we have, we have to fulfill. And if we are so, so lucky to, to meet all these uh, requirements, then uh, we are in a, in, a quite, in a quite good position. Just one final question to you, General. Of course, we're talking always about defense capabilities, but what about changing cultures so that, you know, democracies flourish in places where you don't have people like Putin dominating and cre creating such havoc? How does that complement a defense culture? Well, uh, I, I think um, we, we learned that... Uh, Yes, uh, the, the world is an unsecure place and uh, we, we have to defend our values and uh, uh, we, we can complain uh, about the fact that uh, uh, autocratic systems and uh, the, the abuse of, of, uh, of rights and, and human rights and so on is, is, still, uh, is still in force. But, uh, we should, we should use it in the other way around via our um, strategic communication telling the public uh, we, we live 
in a system worse to be defended. And this should be, this should be I think, the, I, I don't, I'm not pretty sure that's the answer to your question, but I, I think it, it should be the message. Thank you so much, uh, General. It is such a, a, a difficult time right now. Thank you so much for giving us your time uh, and coming in to talk to us. Thank you very much. Absolutely welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we're just going to go straight on, Julian, will we? Yes. Okay. So, General, I will say goodbye to you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. And Thank you. we will um, move on to our next session. So if I can ask our panelists who are taking part, we'll just do a quick change of chairs. And um, will I just keep rolling, Julian, and, and just keep explaining what's going on now? We're still... We're still going out on the web, will I? Yeah, okay, great, okay. So we're coming now to our second fireside chat. That is on boosting defense, security, and space entrepreneurship. And if you can take your seats, I'm going to, you can sit here. I'll sit here, okay. Now, so we have everybody, Shilom, Benoit, Ingrid? Yes. And yes, that's, we have the three of you. Okay, very good. So this, um, as I said, this fireside chat is on boosting defense, security, and space entrepreneurship. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our three guests for this uh, session. So Gilom de la Brosse is head of unit innovation, startups and economics with the European Commission's DG Defis. Benoit Depper, and excuse me if I am <laughs> mauling your names, um, but <laughs> Benoit is the chief Executive Officer of Aerospace Lab. And I'll just explain what Aerospace Lab is if you're not familiar with it. It specializes in satellite platforms and geospatial intelligence. And Aerospace Lab manufactures and operates constellations of remote sensing satellites, empowering intelligence and insights by its proprietary satellite data. And Aerospace Lab's goal is to be a European leader in geospatial intelligence and small satellite platforms. And finally, our second entrepreneurial representative is Ingrid Solner, the Chief Marketing Officer of Tetris. Tetris? Yes. Tetris, okay. And I'll just give you a tiny little background, bit of background on Tetris. It was established in 2010 by a duo of cyber experts who left their military uh, careers from the French Secret Service. And after raising 20 million euro in Series A funding, this French scale-up aims to become the first cyber security unicorn in Europe. Now, so the focus of this discussion will be new entrepreneurial perspectives offered by players like our guests in the defense sector and in particular in the areas of cyber and space. We're going to find out more about the potential in Europe for emerging startups or mutations of existing companies around the innovative technological and industrial developments imposed by hybrid military strategies. We're also going to get the perspective, of course, from the European Commission, specifically in charge of supporting innovation and startups. And on that point, uh, Gilom de la Brosse, am I, uh, uh, Gilom, I, am I getting the correction? Uh, Guillaume. Guillaume, sure okay, Guillaume. Okay. Guillaume, the European Commission has established the Cassini Initiative in the space domain, which seems to be bearing fruit. It's helping startups and SMEs to grow. How could this initiative be a blueprint for defense startups? Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, with you today. <clears throat> Indeed, we have uh, this Cassini Initiative. I mean, the objective is very simple, is to uh, encourage entrepreneurship in space. Um, and actually, for, uh, for good reasons, uh, one is that uh, new, I mean, entrepreneurship in space and, and new space players can, can bring forward innovation, competitiveness, new solutions, new industrial processes as well. And that's why we, we stand uh, behind the emergence of this new space uh, ecosystem in, in providing a set of, of, um, of supportive measures 
like access to finance, uh, soft policies, matchmaking, etc., etc. Um, what I like to say that we will always need large corporates. That's clear. Uh, but on top of that, what we need is uh, those new space entrepreneurs. Um, and actually, uh, we, what we see is uh, the, the, big, the big added value is that it brings a bit of a change of mindset, uh, a change of mindset when it comes to the big organizations like the Commission, uh, where we need to be like, more service-driven, uh, we need to be more um, faster, faster in the way we do procurement, um, and actually, uh, what we see as well is bringing connection between different industries. You mentioned space, you mentioned cyber, you mentioned defense. What we see is that we can bring connections between different industries, and that's the beauty as well of, of um, Cassini and uh, new space entrepreneurship. Um, yesterday, there was a panel on, or earlier today, there was a panel on space strategy for security and defense. The need to break silos between space and defense was mentioned. We've heard that in other contexts as well about greater collaboration and cooperation. In, in very practical terms then in your area, how can initiatives like yours foster and cross-fertilization and, and break down those silos? Well, uh, I think we have in the European Commission, DFIS, we have two large programs. On one side, we have the EU, EU space program. On the other side, we have the European Defence Funds. So what we are trying to do is really to bring, uh, to, to build connections between the two programs. In very concrete terms, it means in terms of programming. For instance, in the European Defence Fund, you have more and more a space window. So you have space-related topics as part of the uh, European Defence Fund. Now, when it comes to Space, what we see is we can develop Pathfinder missions uh, in the field of quantum, in the field of in-orbit servicing through Horizon Europe. But when it comes to the defense layer, to the defense technologies, this is where we can build those defense technologies with the European Defense Fund. So this is a very concrete way to build synergies between uh, space and defense. Another area beyond the technological and, and, and capability aspect is the services. What we want to develop is the use of space uh, for security and defense, more and more. Much more than we used to have in the past in breaking silos, you know, that we used to say that space was civilian programs under civilian control, that's true, but it does not exclude the fact that we can develop security-related services for defense use. So that's what we are. I mean, we are building on Galileo, of course. We have the Galileo PRS that will be used by the military. And actually, this is something that we can replicate for secure connectivity, for space domain awareness, uh, for Earth observation. So this is where we are trying to build those connections. Okay, thank you for that. It will go to you, Benoit Depper, founder and CEO of Aerospace Lab. Can you tell us a little bit more about Aerospace Lab and particularly its activities, and especially when it comes to links with the defense and security applications? All right, so thank you for the invitation, and, and I'm delighted to be able to explain a bit what we have been doing the last couple of years. So Aerospace Lab was founded uh, four and a half, half years ago. Now we are uh, 200 staff. We raised 65 million euros of investors' money uh, in the past, um, European 100%. So we are kind of proud of that. So we, man we, we managed to raise venture capital funds uh, that are exclusively within the EU. Um, and we are building satellites, um, mostly focusing on, on remote sensing right now, uh, different types of remote sensing. So we go with classical optic pass electro optical sensors, but also um, we look at into the RF spectrum to do a bit of signal intelligence. And, um, and we are vertically integrated, so we build the satellites, but we are also building the geospatial stack, the algorithms, and the um, secure computing capabilities that would allow us to perform the data fusion and to provide insights, because this is what we really want to do. Um, I mean, making satellites and selling satellites is just a mean to the end that is delivering the information to key decision makers. And, and what are the, can you give us a sense of the challenges that emerging disruptive companies face when it comes to accessing the defense market needs? And, and, and how do you deal with those challenges? 
Um, yeah, it, it, it looks to me that um, the EU uh, defense market is not really mature of to, to handle a relationship with smaller companies like us. So what we are doing now is that we are approaching MODs and intelligence agencies and to showcase what we've been doing, keeping them in the loop of the product development that is ongoing with us. And um, basically to ask them for cashless transaction in terms of um, exchange of their needs so they can shape a bit the products that we are building for ourselves, but for them ultimately. Um, and we hope that this um, evangelization and education of this uh, public customer will come soon enough so we can switch into this, uh, uh, RN, from this R&D phase to this uh, commercial service-based procurement phase in the coming years. But if I heard you correctly, you said it, it, it is challenging as a small company, is it to access the, the defense market? Uh, I believe that when you look at the raw numbers uh, compared to the US, um, the market is, is way smaller. And uh, we have heard earlier today that um, uh, it, one of the reasons might be that we, we are living in, in the false pretense of safety and security up to now, and that the Ukraine war is a kind of a wake-up call. So we'd expect that more resources would be put into that. But the market is indeed way smaller, and, and there is a bit more um, of an old-fashioned way of dealing with primes and large defense groups that are strictly necessary for this because they have the long-term vision, stability, and um, they can be the architects of, of a system of systems that last for decades. But on top of that, we have seen also in the US that there is a synergy with smaller players that are more agile. And uh, the combination of both seems to be quite uh, giving good returns of investment. So we are um, hopefully uh, waiting for, for the EU scene to transition into that mode as well. Okay, thank you. Ingrid, if I can go to you, very similar question um, to the first question for Benoit. Can you tell us a little bit about Tetris um, and particularly your activities and your links with the defense, security and space domains? Okay, yes. Um, glad to meet everyone and thanks for the invitation. Um, Tetris develops software that detects and blocks cyber attacks onto computers, servers, mobile phones, uh, networks or cloud. Um, so basically what we do is actually a defense activity in the way that we defend our clients against cyber attacks. Um, we are present in uh, about 120 countries in the world uh, thanks to the um, software that we have implemented at, at our clients. Um, we are uh, yeah, 260 people now and uh, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> and uh, you defend your clients against um, cyber attacks? Exactly, yeah. Uh, is it within the, the, the defense domain or are these principally outside the defense domain? It's across all domains. Uh, it can be the defense se sector, but it's not a, a criteria. Actually, um, basically, all companies in the world have Microsoft or Windows or, uh, or Apple or, you know, all this... Uh, uh, OSs that we cover, uh, so we can cover all domains of activities and we do uh, act into the defense, but not only. I, I can imagine that you're, I would have thought, a very popular um, company offering this because now we know that cyber attacks are a very real issue. In my own country, in Ireland, we had a, a very severe cyber attack in the health system about two years ago and it created tremendous problems. And you want to become, Tetris wants to become a European leader in cyber security and cyber defense. Fantastic ambition. <laughs> um, but what kind of hurdles do you think you'll face in achieving those goals and particularly competition from outside mm -hmm. Europe and, and foreign entities? Yeah, well, they are, we are actually facing these hurdles. Uh, the main point is that on our market, which is detection and response platforms, so uh, software to detect and block cyber attacks, uh, all our competitors are American or Israeli, or Americano-Israeli, uh, so all of them. So when we go to a call for tender, there is usually us and six or seven American companies. So the hurdles we are facing, obviously, is that well, they have much more financing that we do, so they can actually um, place very low prices because they do not search profitability. They have other marketing means than I do. They have sometimes also other, let's say, ethical practices that we do uh, than what we do uh, apply um, 
that could be, for example, inviting the bus for the weekend at a golf party, and then you know the result of the call for tender would change over, overnight. Um, things that we do not do. So yeah, we are facing, let's say, um, non-European hurdles. And, uh, and I very much rely to what uh, Commissar Botton said when he said that the market was so fragmented. We are expanding to Europe, we're French, but we've opened uh, businesses and offices in Germany and Spain. And, well, you can feel, and we all feel here today that we're all sharing English as a common language, but then, you know, when it comes to actually buying from the company of, of another country, it's another business. So, yeah. Because market. it's coming from another country, is it? Because we've... God, we are cousins. I always say that, you know, I'm, uh, my husband is German. I always say that uh, we are cousins in Europe. We are not exactly the same culture. And that's, that feels in the way that we do business. It's not exactly the same way to do business. So it's hard to scale. Uh, we are all set to do it, but it's uh, lots of challenges, yeah. And it's getting the business. It's really trying to get the business in that exactly. would then help yeah. you to grow. Yeah, and that relates to what uh, Commissar Botton said in the fact that we, uh, the procurement usually is not done uh, at European companies. Same thing. It's so much easier to buy at large multinational American companies than buying at uh, growing up European companies. Um, that's a very... Uh, I suppose, depressing point, Guillaume, <laughs> isn't it? That we're not supporting our own uh, people, our own cultures. Well, I think, I mean, uh, we've had to change that. Uh, I mean, when it comes to defense, you know, we are, we are trying to build up a European defense market and trying to facilitate uh, the, uh, the procurement within, uh, within the member states. We're trying to simplify the uh, export rules. Within the uh, the, uh, the European Union, we are trying to, uh, with the European Defence Fund, uh, to go for more EU-wide uh, cooperation. So it takes time, of course, especially when it comes to defence, uh, because I mean it used to be strategic, uh, strategic, uh, anchored in national policies with different ways uh, of using your assets. So, I mean, you have history behind, so you can't change history in two days. That's clear. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that we should be depressed. I mean, it's, it's a matter of changing your mindset. Uh, we have now the tools to do it. It will, it will take time. It will take a decade, I mean, to change that mindset. But if we see where we used to be in uh, 10 years and where we are today, uh, I think there is a complete change of mindsets. Uh, having uh, in the European Defence Fund uh, the possibility to uh, support the development of very large programmes, nobody would have believed that, I mean, a few, few years ago. So there is a change. I mean, we need to continue, of course, but there is a big change um, happening. And crises like uh, the, the one that we face in Ukraine uh, or the fact that we see, uh, uh, you know, more and more sabotage activities against uh, national or EU infrastructures, uh, that, that will accelerate the change of mindset, that's clear. Okay, at this stage, I'll just jump in and see if there are any questions from the people in the room here in Brussels. Um, just put your hand up because we've lights on stage, so sometimes it can be difficult to see if there are any hands up. I don't see any at the moment. And of course, for those of you watching online, you can still put your question through Slido. I'll just maybe spend just a few more minutes uh, with you. Um, if I can go back to you um, then, Benoit, uh, do you see now when you see the landscape in, in Europe with the war in Ukraine, and we heard you know, from the words from the general uh, just a little bit earlier, do you think there is going to be more collaboration now in terms of security and defense for businesses like yours? I mean, we, we, have, we have to. If we want to be relevant on the international scene, there is no choice. So um, the war in Ukraine is uh, has a bit of an opportunity in a wake-up call to maybe simplify a bit the um, political shenanigans uh, because uh, driving a boat with 27 captains is, is sometimes difficult. Um, and in time of crisis, um, simplification of the uh, decision-making process um, is, is maybe more um, doable than in, in simpler times. So I believe that agility and, and moving forward, because it's not really a matter of, of absolute amount of money or budget because... Uh, I believe that we are the richest and the largest population group in the world, so money can be found. Um, it's a matter of um, yeah, breaking down the cultural silos, as you were mentioning, but also um, having a bit more agility and speeding up the whole process. 
Okay, Ingrid, maybe some final words uh, from you in, in that sense. Yeah, sure. Well, we are going in the right direction. Obviously, I didn't want to sound too negative. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good things happening, and uh, we can really feel that uh, the European spirit is building up, and um, that, uh, let's say, the, the way uh, the business is doing uh, cross borders is evolving as well. So um, the fact that these kind of meetings also happen and that uh, we are invited to, to witness at scale up means that you know, we would not have been invited 10 years ago, obviously. So, uh, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. Okay, on that uh, positive note, yes. we will leave it. But a big thank you to our three guests. Thank you so much thank for you. coming in and for sharing your views. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can say. So we're going to do a quick change. I think, Julian, we're just going to go straight on, are we? We're going to... Yeah, we'll just have a short break, and then we'll be back to you with the final session. Ladies and gentlemen, um, so now we come to our fifth 
and actually final uh, session. And this is on securing value chains and financing the European defence and security ecosystem. Welcome again to those of you watching online. You're very welcome. Don't forget to put your questions in through the Slido app as well if you would like uh, to pose a question to our panellists, and if I can ask those of you in the room here in Brussels to please take your seats. Now, so, um, as I said, this session is on securing value chains and financing the European defence and security ecosystem. And just to give you some context to this discussion, in these very challenging geopolitical times, this session is going to examine ways that would allow the securing of value chains to ensure a strong and autonomous European defence and security ecosystem. We heard earlier, of course, with the General's conversation and other conversations about the need to have strong defence in Europe. So we're going to look at what supports are available to ensure that ecosystem through financing and other tools such as the announced Cassini for Defence initiative, which will be key to bolstering the EU's defence technological and industrial base, the EDTIB. So it is my great pleasure now to introduce our panellists for this session. Lucas Mandel is the Vice Chair of the European Parliament's Security and Defence Subcommittee. He is an Austrian politician of the Austrian People's Party. Roger Haveneth is the Deputy Chief Executive of the European Investment Fund. Sylvia Kynes Huber is the Head of Unit of the European Defence Fund, EDF, Implementation Programming and SME Support with the European Commission's DG DEFIS. And finally, Francois Dupont is the Senior Vice President for European Affairs with the Naval Group. You're all very welcome. It's the end of the day, so thank you in <laughs> advance for your participation and to our audience for staying with us uh, as well. Lucas Mandel, I am going to go straight to you because we've heard a lot about uh, the European Defence Fund and, and the need to fund initiatives and everything else. You're, you're working at the heart of the European political system as an MEP. How do you think the European Defence Fund Fund can work in terms of financing European defence and security ecosystems? Thanks for having me, first of all, and uh, thanks for organising this European Defence and Security Conference. Uh, it's not that long ago that uh, people who dealt with security and defence were seen as some kind of nerds, maybe, as also here in this uh, Brussels political sphere, and uh, now we live in times when uh, nearly everybody understands uh, how important security is. Security is... Uh, also a question of sustainability in our uh, living conditions, in uh, proper dwelling for Europeans for now and for the future. And I'm telling this because European Defence Fund is a very positive swift of paradigm. Uh, for the first time in history, Europe's put, uh, Europe, uh, European countries put together money uh, in the sense of uh, defence when it comes to innovation and research. And um, there are a lot of positive aspects about it, but... Uh, whether it will work or not will depend a lot on taxonomy and on the question whether we can include security and defense in uh, our understanding, our EU's understanding of sustainability within the taxonomy system. And this is not yet done. And this is still something we have to, to work for and to run for uh, uh, in order to, to keep on emphasizing the importance of security. And it's not theoretical what I'm telling here. It's my practical experience that even the finance sector is reluctant to invest in that field, uh, even for companies who want to apply or who would be ready to apply for European Defence Fund money. Uh, they are reluctant uh, because uh, still uh, in the title we have something like defence or something like security or even military. And this is something we have to overcome because it's clear uh, that when it comes to sustainable conditions for European security must be part of taxonomy. You work in a chamber of over 700 different politicians from different political groups, left, right, centre. Do you see a change in terms of the thinking about military defence and security since the war in Ukraine started? Because there are many MEPs who would be anti-putting money, as you've just been saying there, in terms of a wider culture, into anything to do with defence and security. I would say there is some change. 
Uh, it's not the big change, and it's by far not yet a, a sustainable change, but uh, at least the ones who are more or less uh, against defense or who are, let's say, critical on military, I also don't want a militarized society. But what we defend here is a, a civil society via military means, which are obviously needed to defend civil society, free society, our democratic rule of law based societies. Uh, but uh, who, who would be against this kind of defense is maybe not that present at the moment in the political sphere generally, not only in the European Parliament, everywhere. Uh, this is one part, and the other part is, I would say, that uh, let's say there's more focus, more attention now, uh, more listening in when it comes to security and defense, and we should use uh, this uh, time positively for the security of the Europeans to Uh, to take some political decisions, which are some of them long overdue, and which should be taken not only at European level, but also in some member states. Okay, thank you for that. Ro Roger Havaneth, if I can go to you, Deputy Chief Executive of the European Investment Fund. Maybe first of all, can you tell us a little bit more about what role the EIF could play in financing the European defence and military security and defence ecosystem? Sure. Well, we are part of the EIB group, so our mother is the EIB, but also the EU. EU represents the Commission, which means that we are looking at political priorities. Our mission is to finance political priority areas. And certainly, if you look at them, we started out with competitiveness, innovation, social, sustainable finance, and climate action, but more and more we see now important topics emerging on which there is a lot of uh, support and also a request to us to come in. And uh, we heard before AI, disruptive technologies, blockchain, but certainly it's a space and defense amongst these top priorities. And so we see it as our role to see how we can contribute together with our partners, it's important to stress partners um, in this um, build up of ecosystems. And we have done it before in other areas of innovation, And we feel, and I've heard Cassini before, what we are doing currently in the area of space has a lot of connectivity also with defense. And we are now discussing precisely DG DFIS and also other DGs at the Commission, how we can bring together finance, blend finance from different pots of money. There is InvestEU, there is the money possibly from sectoral program of EDF, There's EIB Group Finance as well. And what's very important, I think, is not to stay only public, to crowd in private. And private investors, if they um, wish to be attracted, you need to offer them something which really makes sense. And makes sense from a financial perspective, but also in terms of due diligence and things. You, you, you really give them comfort, a signal. And that's what we, we see as a possibility uh, that we would thanks to this additional finance, bring it together, leverage the finance, I'm taking up here also what the Commission referred to, bring in also private money and make this available. So that's our role. Now let me say also that um, when I look at this particular area, it's not that it's totally new to us, we have been investing in venture capital funds, we don't do it directly, we are not the experts in all these defense matters, but we are experts in selecting those funds which can make the difference and uh, pick the win of tomorrow. Now, in Europe, unfortunately, we are not in the same situation yet as in the US. In the US, we have 15 or more funds which are purely targeting defense. They are scaled and they have network. So they have the whole ecosystem. What we have is funds currently which have in their investment program some part dealing with defense, but not necessarily focused on it. And we have been in the past investing in some 70 funds, particularly those who had dual use. But what we need to build up, I think, is this professionalization of fund managers targeting specifically defense. And that's where we see a role together with our partners to build up this ecosystem through the early stages, but also through the growth stages. And which comes first? It's an apple and cart situation. Does you know, the entrepreneur, the initiative, does that have to start off first and then you find a way to fund it? Or do you create or find a way to create a fund and then it develops upon that? Yeah. 
I think what we have typically experienced in the past, you have, of course, very good entrepreneurs or you have very good research results, but there needs to be a signal that somebody is interested in providing the support and longer term support and that this is a matter of political priority also, particularly in such sensitive areas. And that's what we have now, the combination. That's the new element where we can bring finance to the table, but also the political signal, the ecosystem, but also possibly technical assistance, the whole, uh, let's say, uh, framework that you need in order to develop it, including also regulatory uh, measures and other support measures. So um, my answer would be, we expect that there is quite a lot already of very good technology, very good companies there. But if you want to grow them over time and build them into the next generation of future big industrialists, and we have very good companies, corporates, but if you want to have the next uh, unicorn in this field, then we need to have this clear signal and come to, to the table with the finance. Okay. Um, very good. If I can go to you, uh, Sylvia, then. How can the EU support um, these kind of startup uh, companies that might want to grow their businesses in the defence initiatives? I mean, you know, they're part of the value chain. What can be done to help them? Well, what we're trying now to do also um, with the fund, but also beyond the fund is, is I think, has also been subject to a discussion earlier today, is, is uh, the European... Uh, um, uh, defense Innovation Initiative, uh, which, uh, as we call it, UDIS. So it's it's the Cassini for defense, but it's uh, also a lot more and going beyond that. So what we're trying to do here, and, and again, one part of that system was now just already described, which is to set up this equity funding instrument, which we're trying to do for access to finance. But we're also trying to use the fund to really implement uh, this, this new innovation scheme as much as we can by things we have already done, uh, uh, having a specific and particular calls that should attract uh, SMEs in particular, but now we're also trying to be using more innovative schemes within the fund. So to really bring in uh, not only more innovative and attract more innovative uh, um, um, actors that have not been potentially active in the, in the, in the, space de uh, in the defense domain so far, but uh, more from the civilian domain uh, by organizing also um, and doing things in a bit of a different way yeah? through hackathons, challenges, so all these uh, typical instruments that are used to bring out and give the time also to bring out a more innovative uh, solutions here. We're also uh, thinking and also start very soon to implement a, a business coaching scheme. So we're notably the smaller partners that have to uh, now found their way uh, in, in uh, cooperative uh, uh, R&D <coughs> projects, uh, research and develop capability development projects uh, under the EDF can have uh, a really experienced business coaches to help them finding their place in this consortium, get the best out of it and really develop also their role and their scale and their, their experience and their their capacities. So this is what we do uh, uh, under this under this scheme, and and uh, and uh, also beyond uh, beyond the EDF. And can you give us an idea of what kind of initiatives are coming to you? What what you know? What is it that you're likely to support? Are they in what kind of technologies, or you know, are they in disruptive technologies, or what are they? What. Well, it's a bit what we're asking for, uh, which then determines what we will what we'll also get. So what we want to do, you can, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the challenges uh, when you have certain um, uh, technologies which already or technological approaches that have been a bit matured, huh, where you know there are different ways of doing things, and you would like to test them against each other. So here, you are really going for uh, something very specific, thematical, which you, which you then we would typically describe in a, in a call that we launch, and then uh, uh, consortia that uh, would like to have their technologies tested against each other, against a certain challenge set. 
uh, can then apply. Uh, but we're also having really specifically calls, very so-called open calls under the EDF, where we then just would like to have, uh, uh, no matter what it is, but um, uh, consortia that apply, uh, notably SME-led consortia, ideally, uh, that respond and want to present a technological approach or a new technology or a way of using technology in a military environment and in a military um, operational setting, if you so wish, and respond to a military need in a, in a totally different way. So outside uh, the, 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 the usual, very prescriptive way we're doing calls under the EDF normally, which is also the way things are, have been done normally, uh, also on the procurement side, uh, uh, when uh, 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 normally our MODs uh, really uh, put out procurements uh, for the development of uh, of uh, uh, capabilities, so really opening a bit and allowing also smaller actors to really come up with uh, with uh, uh, so-called uh, disruptive new ideas that can be applied in the defense domain. And these would be different to, we'll say, things that might be run under Horizon Europe or some of the other programs, or is there overlap, do you think, in some of those programs with, with the EDF, or could be? Well, not overlap, but these instruments are then also surely used uh, uh, in, in, I'm sure, in Horizon Europe as well. And the supply chains and also the technologies which you see in the defense domain will be in the future more and more also involve actors from the civil side and civil technologies that you will see that will become uh, 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 more and more important in the defense domain. Now, when you look at the cyber domain and where you also see that on the civilian side they have uh, massively more investments done in that domain. It's really about more getting these actors more from the civil domain, getting the technologies that also where a lot more uh, advances may have already been made in the civil domain simply because there is a much broader market. Seeing how you can implement that or how you can apply these uh, and, and um, uh, adapt this for, for, for also uh, use in the military domain. So that's a bit the challenge, I would say. Okay, Sylvia, thank you for that. Francois Dupont, finally to you. Thank you for your patience. You're from the Naval Group. I suppose a similar question, which is what key initiatives and measures do you think are really urgent at this stage uh, that are needed to ensure securing the whole of the value chain in defense from start to finish? More than urgent, I think there are two essential principles that need, needs to, be kept, need to be kept in mind uh, if, if we really want to do, make FED and, and EDF and, and, and the future projects the full successes. Um, the, the first one is, is that the financing that the Commission gives to the companies uh, must be multipliers of efforts we already have in countries. If, if the Commission finances a, a Corvette project that I would have in France uh, and does that in lieu of the French government, there's no impact. Uh, I have my supply chain made of a thousand subcontractors, 900 of them are French, and I'll work with them. Uh, if we manage to make, like we are working at with my friends from Fincantieri and Navencia, on the MMPC project, which we also call EPC, uh, and, and generate a new class of ship, uh, then obviously we learn to work with subcontractors. An example of the 30 companies working on the EPC project, 27 are non-French, and there are companies I've never worked with before. So obviously I will learn to work with them and they'll be part of my supply chain. So the first aspect, as I said, is uh, multi multipliers vis-à-vis -vis the national budget. The second element we really need um, is continu continuity in the program. If I take any given project, um, I have a small chart here so I, I need to be precise. Um, let's say the call comes in your Y in June. The, the submission will be in December of your why. Uh, we will be awarded, or not, uh, the project in June of Y plus one. Mm -hmm. We will be contracted in December of Y plus one, year one plus one. We will, let's say, take two years to submit the papers and, 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 and be paid and finalize the project. The following call can only come in Y plus five which means that between Y plus three, the third year, and the fifth year of the project, 
we have to demobilize our team, stop the subcontracting to the supply chain, whether it's in Estonia or Hungary. Hungary, in our case, is unlikely. Uh, it's a landlocked country, so, so it's, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then we need continuity, especially since we have long-term projects. A jet fighter would be 50 years in service in an Air Force. A surface ship is from 30 to 45 years in service in a Navy. Uh, clearly, short-term research development project like the EDF is today does not quite match our timeline. So if we have those two principles, and I think it's valid for all the industry present here today, it will be a success. Interesting. Okay, so what do you think then will be necessary to support the security and defense ecosystem in the framework of Cassini for Defense? Uh, Cassini, I don't know. It's a space project. I, 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 I'm just in defense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Navy. I'm in Navy matters. Okay, so let's, let's, well then, let's specifically stay with the Navy then. Tell me about um, the insuring raw materials, for example. This is no doubt a huge issue for your, your area, your sector. Um, I think there are two, two main domains where we're going to look at and where clearly Europe can help. Uh, the first one would be the, would be the batteries, the energy field. Uh, not a single country will be able to invest in the ability uh, to do batteries. Europe can. Uh, for us, batteries on submarines will be critical. Uh, it's first domain. Second domain, it's not technically savvy, but it's the steel industry. Yeah. We consume steel like hell. A, a submarine is 3,000 tons. In the submarines, you've got 2,500 tons of steel, roughly speaking. A surface ship can be up to 50,000 tons, 40,000 tons of steel. Uh, in France, for example, the steel industry only manufactures some very specific steel. If we want the steel we use for ships, we need to go to Ukraine or Russia. Uh, so we need Europe to rebuild a heavy industry. To repeal the heavy industry, bring it back. To, to rebuild. Yeah, rebuild it, bring it back. Bring yeah. it back, yes. Plus it brings a lot of jobs. Can I put that to uh, you, Lucas Mandel? Because, I mean, it's part of uh, President von der Leyen's whole issue as well is about, you know, ensuring we have supply chains, particularly, of course, when it comes to technologies and software as well, and, and, and chips, we're going to have the Chips Act as well. Do you think that makes sense that you bring back old industries to ensure that all that critical supply of raw materials is within the EU and we're not going to China or, in this case, Ukraine for critical stuff such as steel? This is it, actually. We have to rebuild industry that will create jobs and it will mean something. It uh, will mean competitiveness for the future, for Europe, for the European Union and Europe in its entirety. Because we are running into a direction uh, with the threat of becoming more or less the continent of consumption. Consuming, uh, you know this old joke, it's only a joke, but there's uh, some truth in every joke that if there is something new on the planet, the Americans would have invented it and the Asians are the ones who build it and the Europeans are the ones who regulate it. Consumers. So uh, I don't want to go into that direction anymore. I want a Europe that is capable of its own innovation based on research and development, its own production, uh, creating jobs and being what? Competitive. And this is also to be seen under the framework and under the umbrella of the so-called strategic autonomy which, uh, as far as I have heard, is supposed not to be called strategic autonomy anymore due to some misunderstandings. And this is not some euphemistic political language. It were really misunderstandings, in my view, because strategic autonomy was always meant and has to mean uh, strategic autonomies uh, under the NATO umbrella and the common defense system of the free world. But now it should be called uh, open strategic resilience due to the new strategic compass. But it's always the same. It's not only a military issue. Uh, strategic autonomy or open strategic resilience is meant to be uh, a complex that means Europe to be less dependent uh, on supply chains from wherever. And when we say wherever, you have just mentioned China, and uh, China already was before you have mentioned it, uh, the elephant in the room, I would say, because this is it. We have to 
understand how to achieve reciprocity with China. Uh, we all know China would be, due to the strategic compass of EU, a, a strategic partner, uh, an economic competitor, and a systemic rival. All the three things are true, I would say, so we have to keep on mind all the three things all the time. Uh, achieve reciprocity when it comes to exchange with China, and when we will ever uh, agree on an investment agreement with China, we have to cancel 16 plus 1, this uh, initiative that's meant to divide Europe, as everybody from outside who wants to weaken Europe tries to divide us, as we know, due to disinformation, hybrid warfare, uh, and so on. So, uh, first of all, our own research, development, innovation, our own production, creating jobs, uh, in investment in security, as we have talked about before, uh, and then also getting less dependent. Uh, I guess it's more serious to call it less dependent, but because we will never be zero dependent, but less dependent and more diversification of, of risk. This is also, let's say, what let's say our today's but, generation in but, politics but should just, have learned from the generation before when it comes to... Yeah, but can I just ask you about the practicality of becoming completely, we'll say, autonomous in terms of our ability to be able to produce so many of these necessary goods? Because it was one of the big lessons, I think, during COVID was the fact that we didn't have medicines or the, the supply of, of, of very essential medicines at times, you know, was fractured and, and that was a wake-up call for Europe as well. But, you know, if, if you take uh, Francois's point, a uh, suggestion, you rebuild the steel industry, um, doesn't the price of everything then go through the roof? Because the reason why these things have been outsourced is because we can get them in cheaper. This is a problem of regulation. We have discussed it also before, the energy crisis and inflation crisis we have uh, today. If... Uh, let's say the raw material industry faces uh, double, three times as much as high prices as uh, the same raw materials would cost in other parts of the world, we have a problem of competitiveness uh, in Europe and we will also not meet the challenges of climate change if we provide the rest of the world with such a bad example of, of dealing with climate change because nobody will follow our example in dealing with climate change if we destroy our own industry via our way to deal with climate change. So. Uh, we have to find different regulation in order to strengthen, uh, not only to stop weakening raw material industry and, and uh, industries okay. alike in Europe, but also to strengthen it. Okay. Roger Havaneth, I want you to come in. Whether you want to comment on what has been said so far. Yeah, I think um, I shared a point about strategic autonomy. I would even see it well beyond defense. I mean, it's in general being able um, to have basically all the ingredients in the supply chain so that you can produce uh, high-value uh, products. Now, I think we have this dimension of consumption, but I would say Europe has become the incubator for other continents in that we have a good RTD base and very often very good re research results. The problem is that um, we put a lot of money in the highest risk phases. Grant money, very early stage money, ERC money, our money. But the problem is we don't have the tickets and the support to maintain these industries here and to help them to grow. And of course, it's not only a matter of, of regulation. You can't oblige um, a company to stay in Europe. You need to offer alternatives. And so what we see, and we have a lot of, of very good high growth companies. I have 9,000 in my portfolio. 40% of the exits are going to China and the US. That's not normal because we simply don't have the firepower here because it's fragmented. It's the other point that the commissioner said this morning. So we need to have the critical mass also here in terms of finance and funds being mobilized and probably not at a regional or national level, but to pull it together in order to provide a credible alternative. So I think that this strategic um, uh, autonomy is in all the fields, by the way. <laughs> We're talking about defense, we before was space, AI is the same, blockchain is the same. So we can multiply. There are a few areas where we are leading, also in the more advanced stages. But we have the research base. We do have tools like now for the early stage EIC. But what we need is, as the commissioner said, to pool the resources and at all levels. 
And therefore, it's important to have the partnerships, and we are looking indeed at ESA, ADA, EDF, all of them, a commission, but also private, because all the public will never be sufficient. And then to have the political willingness, indeed, to have not just national approaches, but to go for wider approaches. And the same is true in the delivery. If you have the, the, the funds raised, you need to make sure that they are not just channeled to one country, but that we are looking at the best actors Europe-wide. Of course, there needs to be a kind of retour. It's clear if money comes from a certain country, you want to also make sure that investments end up there. But uh, I think what we need is a broader um, um, element in making sure that we are choosing the best European-wide. And many of these companies, by the way, are, they are truly European. I mean, once they are in a certain growth stage, I mean, it's not only the Airbus, uh, it's, it's many which are really European from the start, we see it. And this brings me to the last point. The problem in Europe is if you look at uh, the, the leading companies, in, 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 um, <laughs> if you look in America, the top 100, more than 50 of the top uh, have been created in the last 20 years. If you look in Europe, there is almost none in the last 20 years. <laughs> it's all older companies. We need to renew the industrial tissue in Europe. SMEs can be the start, but we need to grow them. So that is uh, where I think is the challenge in Europe not only in defense, in all the various technological areas. Of course, disruptive technologies are key, but so is the, the ability to have not only the value chains, but the funding chain also integrated, so that we don't disrupt the funding chain. Okay, and let's uh, talk about maybe bring it back to defense and Cassini. And I'm going to ask you to just explain what Cassini is, if you can, in a minute or two. But and then my question to you is, what's envisaged or what's planned when it comes to supporting the security and defense ecosystem in, in the framework of Cassini? Okay. <laughs> well, what is Cassini? Well, we, we, we're talking actually more about uh, what we say, UDIS, uh, so, which is really the European Defense Innovation Scheme. But it's, it is, of course, we took inspiration from a very good scheme which we have, which is Cassini in, in space, which then really served also as a model and to get inspiration and to see what good it is, what we can take from it. So um, it's basically what I explained in my earlier uh, reply already. Yeah? So what it is we're trying to do here, and that goes beyond what we have already done and what is enshrined also in the EDF regulation, uh, which is about trying also using the EDF to breaking up uh, supply chains, bringing in um, uh, new actors uh, uh, to work with uh, the large integrators or also incentivizing uh, groupings of the, I would say, the usual actors in the defense industry to work and reach out uh, to um, SMEs uh, beyond their usual supply chain, as we have heard them. Uh, you have hundreds of them, but they're all well controlled and well known and uh, and, and usually also very reliable partners, but they're also to reach out beyond uh, these uh, existing supply chains, collaborate with others across uh, country uh, and across uh, uh, also um, the, 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 the usual supply channels you have. And for that, uh, you get a bonus in the EDF if you do that and so um, beyond all this, which is enshrined now in the EDF regulation already foreseen, this is what we're, uh, UDIS is how now to really get in and what we can do to incentivize and also bring in, as I said, more actors going beyond the, 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 the I would say, the usual defense club and industrial club, which we know how to um, attract also actors more from the civilian domain, which have no clue uh, how uh, actually to work with, uh, uh, or in many cases, uh, notably smaller companies who are not used to work at all in this closed circle of, uh, of, of defense industry and defense companies who are not familiar with the security requirements, who don't know how to go about it and how to um, uh, find partners in the defense domain. And this is what we're trying to do with, with UDIS now. I'm not going to repeat what I said earlier, yeah. uh, so I already described a bit the yeah. different measures taken. 
Um, but beyond that, I would say when talking about uh, now supply chains, what we're trying to do, going also a little bit beyond EDF for us, it's not only now the validity and, 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 and uh, securing uh, supply chains in the defense domain in Europe, but we're also, for us, it's more really also what we see since February, uh, how to make sure that we have actually a, the production capacity which we now need, uh, which is a real problem which we see Skills, people in the face. And, yeah. Amongst others, for example, there is yeah. Cassini, yes, but what becomes then more important is a, a bit on the supply side, it's, it's skills, yes, it's access to raw materials, it's access to finance. Um, we can, since the supply chains are not necessarily only uh, defense, only in the defense, uh, 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 but also stretching out to the civil domain, make use of many of the uh, of the uh, uh, civilian programs, I would say, and initiatives in the in the EU, huh? whether this is in the skills domain or whether this is a FDI uh, uh, screening. But that all that is a supply side initiatives. We're also trying now to um, to go more into into the um, demand side and see what we can do there. We heard before the industry uh, ecosystem is, is scattered. It's it's fragmented, and we always recognize that. And this is something we're trying to overcome also with the EDF by really. Uh, uh, trying to 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 um, uh, bring not only uh, more cooperation amongst the industrial actors across a border, uh, but also amongst member states behind okay. them. And what we're trying to do now is is really with uh, IDIRPA to go further and say, here is the demand side. Um, here again, we would try to overcome fragmentation, see that these uh, uh, increased uh, uh, um, budgets that member states now put on the table and want to invest in the defense domain are now spent in a, in a coordinated manner. And this will then also give a good signal, by the way, to industry. Yeah? So this okay. gives transparency and they know uh, uh, what they can expect and where the demands are and also not very short term, but midterm and hopefully then also react in, in terms of uh, uh, orienting their production capacities around that. So that's the idea uh, now which we're pursuing going beyond, beyond uh, really looking on and ensuring supply chains. Okay, thank you for that. I want to go back to you, Francois Dupont from the Naval Group. I'm going to throw a curveball at you um, because when you, you know, uh, with defense um, sometimes we can forget about the Navy. I'm saying that as a, as a journalist. We, you know, defense, you'll think about missiles, you'll think about other security systems. You forget about the importance as well of the Navy in all of this. Is the war in Ukraine, is it changing the workings of the Navy and your operations and the way you are doing things? Um, it's, it's not really a naval war. Uh, it's been at the beginning. I'm not a naval expert, by the way. So, uh, 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 unfortunately, the Austrian general is not either, and neither, um, for good reasons. Uh, <laughs> it, the war is a, is a land battle. Uh, but we've seen uh, at the beginning of the war uh, the, the, the necessity, uh, the importance of, of modern navies. Uh, the way the Moskva was sunk, uh, the way the Russians failed in the initial operations to take Odessa. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the, the modern war, the future war, will be comprehensive air, land, sea battle with comprehensive system. And, and if you are lacking one of them, you go nowhere. Mm. Well, so do you think then, we'll say a bi-European act, <clears throat> European Defense Act should be set up? Yes without string attached. Without any strings attached? No. And what yes, would be strings attached to it? Limitation on exports, for example. But clearly, uh, for Europeans, if we want to take into our own hands our security, which does not preclude from alliances and, and partners, uh, we need to buy our own equipment ourselves. Okay. I just want to go to the floor again and see if there are any other questions. We'll just take some final closing uh, comments maybe from our panelists before we go then. Uh, Lucas Mandel, what do you think about uh, by European uh, and European Defence Act? 
Of course, I can only agree with uh, my predecessor now because uh, we have to we have to develop it ourselves, we have to produce it ourselves, uh, we have to buy it ourselves, and we have to keep European taxpayers' money as much as possible within Europe. So that's maybe the third pillar we have not yet focused that much on in this discussion today. The first pillar was security, the second pillar was economy, and the third pillar is obviously the European taxpayers' money, and it's a huge amount of money we're always talking about, So, and we all talk about the people who earn it, the taxpayers, and it should be spent in, uh, on behalf of the taxpayers for their security, and of course it should be spent as much as we can uh, within Europe, and that's the whole purpose, and it is not uh, excluding Europe from the rest of the world, isolating Europe. No, it's a part of uh, what the Europe, com, European um, Commission calls a geopolitical Europe, a global gateway uh, that we get stronger ourselves in order also to be more capable to spread our policies when it comes again to democracy, rule of law, human dignity, individual freedom and so on uh, around the world. And uh, so things are connected and this is why uh, this act, uh, like, like, the, like, like the development via the EDF and uh, and other activities are of utmost importance. You're Austrian. I am. And Austria is neutral. Austria is uh, neutral since 1955, and uh, neutrality is, I would say, part of our security toolbox. Uh, we try to contribute uh, to not our own security alone, but uh, to Europe's security with our toolbox. One part of this toolbox is neutrality, and as you may know, we are strongly committed to uh, the first unbloody, the first bloodless defense against the bloody war attack in history, which are the sanctions. And uh, I wouldn't call it, uh, or I tend not to call it Ukraine war, I tend to call it the war of Putin Russia. Uh, conventionally against Ukraine, it's true, but uh, in hybrid means and measures against all of us, against the free world, against of the values Europe tries to represent on this planet. And uh, you, just can, on, you on can count Austria in very much committed into that. But it's very interesting because I'm from Ireland and we're new, neutral too. And when there is talk about increased spending on defence, and now, you know, when you mention Europe, European Defence Act, immediately that sparks a very emotive, emotional reaction. Um, and so how do you marry, you know, support for European Defence Act with neutrality or with people in, in non-neutral countries who still feel, you know, defense means fighting, it means wars, it, you know, and it doesn't mean peace. That's actually the very best day you can ask me that, because tomorrow the Austrian parliament will pass uh, an increase of our defense budget, uh, because uh, like uh, all member states of the European Union and other European countries, also Austria is keen uh, to follow the line that's given by the new geopolitical uh, environment we have by the swift of paradigms uh, due to the war waged by Putin Russia. So uh, we feel committed, we are committed, we act uh, committed uh, at least since our accession to EU in 1995. We had a referendum on that and we also voted uh, for EU membership, uh, including the kind of solidarity also EU membership uh, means and uh, we, we remain neutral as part of our toolbox. Uh, of many different tools uh, in order to contribute to freedom and peace. Okay, Roger Havaneth, some final views from you on that, whether you want to comment on the European Defence Act or another aspect of the conversation. I think that this is politically well covered. I see ourselves rather as a help in the implementation of the policies, not in the policy shaping. Um, I would say that um, our intention is clearly to um, make sure that we reach out to the market as quickly as possible now with the new uh, instruments, financial instruments that we're developing together with the European Commission so that we, we um, create awareness in the market, we find good funds, we help to support the companies um, at a moment where they, they, they need it most and that um, we see this as a pilot hoping that indeed if it is successful we can scale it up and we can indeed work on the synergies that we see also in other areas. Space was mentioned before, but also many other areas where defense can benefit from. 
there are many um, critical technologies um, which um, are being developed in various contexts. I think therefore it's important to, to blend, bring together the resources. I referred already to the fact that um, in my view we need to make sure also that we can follow through. So in terms of funding, um, and um, my view is uh, it's the beginning of a journey here where we are using, uh, let's say, a different, slightly different tool set. In the past, um, this was procurement. It's very important. We have heard about the challenges here. And there were grants, but I think more and more will enter now the world of financial instruments as well, not to replace but to complement it. We have heard this morning or early afternoon about lending, EIB Group, they have also venture debt. It's another set of tools. And we are more on the um, private equity venture capital side. But also, I think, um, some guarantees uh, in due time um, can play a significant role in cushioning off and sharing risks uh, where, where they are. So we are looking at, um, therefore, let's say, innovative instruments that can leverage the taxpayers' money in that respect. Okay, and Sylvia, I won't ask you about the European Defence Act. From <laughs> you may not want to uh, comment on that uh, question, but maybe just in general, what Roger has been saying and the support, you know, to ensure the development and supply of skills, workers, all the people that we will need in the future. Uh, uh, no, as I said, we have put forward a package, uh, which is always a, a bit on, on how you can, uh, it's, it's not always just one measure, it always will be a bundle of measure that have to be addressed. Uh, we didn't talk about skills and we didn't yes. talk about, we touched on raw materials. So it's, it's, it's a whole package of measures which you have to take into account when you say supporting the supply chain, which, which we have in mind. Uh, the EDF is one tool in, the, in, the, in this, in this, in this I would say, uh, the basket of, uh, of, of, of instruments which we can use. Uh, we will make use of many of our, of our generic commission programs now also to look on the skills side. We have the Raw Materials Act that will come that covers cross-border or cross-sector uh, uh, and, and addresses the gaps, the needs, and, uh, and we will make sure that uh, uh, here also defense industries Maybe even more strategic uh, 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 dependencies will be will be taken into account, um, and then also push ahead, notably uh, more now on the procurement side. Uh, so the fund is not done; it's it's a lot of work also now to implement it, make sure that it delivers um, uh, results. And uh, when you say follow-up programs can only be done in five years, I do not agree. They come much faster, and, but it's a real issue under the fund <laughs> to ensure that uh, the, how to, uh, uh, how do you say, ensure continuity of funding of what we have started under the EDF. And here you're absolutely right, this is an issue that needs to be discussed. How do we make sure that the investments which we have made in, 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 a, in an EDF project can really be carried on over the seven years time frame so that to really yield concrete results where then the fund can also say, I have done my share and I've participated in the development, the capabilities uh, of capabilities that the army is at the end really need and how can we pursue that uh, uh, with the fund uh, over its term and potentially then, yes, even beyond. So that's one thing, and the other one is then also really looking uh, at uh, the, the situation in which we are now, where uh, many member states increase uh, and, uh, or announced or will decide very soon about increasing investment now in the defense domain on really urgent, urgent uh, procurement needs which they have, whether this is ammunition, whether this is manpads, whatever is on the list where we see now in the current situation since February that MODs do have uh, urgent needs, how to make sure that we can now also go beyond but build on what we have done in the fund and, and then see how we can also uh, um, uh, stimulate uh, and, and have a change of behavior also on the procurement side of uh, amongst member states, incentivize that they really also on that and cooperate more and, and then uh, also uh, yield more efficient uh, uh, investments in equipment which we now urgently need, 
but also maybe with a bit more solidarity uh, to ensure that uh, uh, notably the smaller member states that whose pockets may be less deep than the larger member states will not be completely crowded out in their needs and will also find their way uh, quickly to the equipment they need. Okay, Francois Dupont, final remarks from you. No, Sylvia, said. Sylvia has the final word. Not are, are you, would you be optimistic that Europe can properly defend itself in the future? Yes. <laughs> my, my, my right hand on the side, friend says yes. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I trust we can, but I, I know we need. Yeah. We need to. Sort of possibly optimistic, but... No, it's optimistic, know. but, but it's, it's not wishful thinking. It's, it's a need. It's a must. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that point, I will close the discussion. A big thanks to our four panelists. Thank you so much for your time and your input and all the work in preparing for this. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Julian, who will now formally close the conference. Thank you, Karen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the European Defence and Security Conference and Business Bridge Europe, I would like to thank you warmly for being here with us today. Uh, big thanks also to our partners, of course, without whom uh, this conference could not happen. Uh, thank you to our great speakers throughout the day. Uh, and well, see you next year. Thank you. <laughs>